Section 1 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1F, Section 1, Chapter 63, Part 1. Chapter 63, Charles II, 1660. Charles II, when he ascended the throne of his ancestors, was thirty years of age. He possessed a vigorous constitution, a fine shape, a manly figure, a graceful air, and though his features were harsh, yet was his countenance in the main lively and engaging. He was in that period of life when there remains enough of youth to render the person amiable, without preventing that authority and regard which attend the years of experience and maturity. Tenderness was excited by the memory of his recent adversities. His present prosperity was the object rather of admiration than of envy. And as the sudden and surprising revolution which restored him to his regal rights had also restored the nation to peace, law, order, and liberty, no prince ever obtained a crown in more favorable circumstances, or was more blessed with the cordial affection and attachment of his subjects. This popularity the king, by his whole demeanor and behavior, was well qualified to support and to increase. To a lively wit and quick comprehension, he united a just understanding and a general observation both of men and things. The easiest manners, the most unaffected politeness, the most engaging gaiety accompanied his conversation and address. Accustomed during his exile to live among his courtiers rather like a companion than a monarch, he retained even while on the throne that open affability which was capable of reconciling the most determined republicans to his royal dignity. Totally devoid of resentment, as well as from the natural lenity as carelessness of his temper, he ensured pardon to the most guilty of his enemies, and left hopes of favor to his most violent opponents. From the whole tenor of his actions and discourse, he seemed desirous of losing the memory of past animosities, and of uniting every party in an affection for their prince and their native country. Into his council were admitted the most eminent men of the nation, without regard to former distinctions. The Presbyterians, equally with the Royalists, shared this honor. Ansley was also created Earl of Anglesey, Ashley Cooper, Lord Ashley, Denzil Hollis, Lord Hollis. The Earl of Manchester was appointed Lord Chamberlain, and Lord Say, Privy Seal. Calamy and Baxter, Presbyterian clergymen, were even made chaplains to the king. Admiral Montague, created Earl of Sandwich, was entitled from his recent services to great favor, and he obtained it. Monk, created Duke of Albemarle, had performed such signal services that, according to a vulgar and malignant observation, he ought rather to have expected hatred and ingratitude, yet he was ever treated by the king with great marks of distinction. Charles's disposition, free from jealousy, and the prudent behavior of the general, who never overrated his merits, prevented all those disgusts which naturally arise in so delicate a situation. The capacity, too, of Albemarle was not extensive, and his parts were more solid than shining. Though he had distinguished himself in inferior stations, he was imagined, upon familiar acquaintance, not to be wholly equal to those great achievements which fortune, united to prudence, had enabled him to perform, and he appeared unfit for the court, a scene of life to which he had never been accustomed. Morris, his friend, was created Secretary of State, and was supported more by his patron's credit than by his own abilities or experience. But the choice which the king at first made of his principal ministers and favorites was the circumstance which chiefly gave contentment to the nation and prognosticated future happiness and tranquillity. Sir Edward Hyde, created Earl of Clarendon, was Chancellor and Prime Minister. The Marquis, created Duke of Ormond, was Steward of the House. The Earl of Southampton, High Treasurer. Sir Edward Nicholas, Secretary of State. These men, united together in friendship and combining in the same laudable inclinations, supported each other's credit and pursued the interest of the public. Agreeable to the present prosperity of public affairs was the universal joy and festivity diffused throughout the nation. The melancholy austerity of the fanatics fell into discredit together with their principles. The royalists, who had ever affected a contrary disposition, 
found in their recent success new motives for mirth and gaiety, and it now belonged to them to give repute and fashion to their manners. From past experience it had sufficiently appeared that gravity was very distinct from wisdom, formality from virtue, and hypocrisy from religion. The king himself, who bore a strong propensity to pleasure, served, by his powerful and engaging example, to banish those sour and malignant humors which had hitherto engendered such confusion. And though the just bounds were undoubtedly passed, when men returned to their former extreme, yet was the public happy in exchanging vices pernicious to society, for disorders hurtful chiefly to the individuals themselves who were guilty of them. It required some time before the several parts of the state, disfigured by war and faction, could recover their former arrangement. But the Parliament immediately fell into good correspondence with the King, and they treated him with the same dutiful regard which had usually been paid to his predecessors. Being summoned without the King's consent, they received at first only the title of a convention, and it was not till he passed an act for that purpose that they were called by the appellation of Parliament. All judicial proceedings, transacted in the name of the Commonwealth or Protector, were ratified by a new law, and both houses, acknowledging the guilt of the former rebellion, gratefully received, in their own name and in that of all the subjects, His Majesty's gracious pardon and indemnity. The King, before his restoration, being afraid of reducing any of his enemies to despair, and at the same time unwilling that such enormous crimes as had been committed should receive a total impunity, had expressed himself very cautiously in his declaration of Breda, and had promised an indemnity to all criminals, but such as should be accepted by Parliament. He now issued a proclamation declaring that such of the late King's judges as did not yield themselves prisoners within fourteen days should receive no pardon. Nineteen surrendered themselves. Some were taken in their flight, others escaped beyond sea. The commons seemed to have been more inclined to lenity than the lords. The upper house, inflamed by the ill usage which they had received, were resolved, besides the late king's judges, to accept every one who had sitten in any high court of justice. Nay, the Earl of Bristol moved that no pardon might be granted to those who had anywise contributed to the king's death. So wide an exception, in which every one who had served the Parliament might be comprehended, gave a general alarm, and men began to apprehend that this motion was the effect of some court artifice or intrigue. But the king soon dissipated these fears. He came to the House of Peers, and in the most earnest terms passed the act of general indemnity. He urged both the necessity of the thing and the obligation of his former promise, a promise, he said, which he would ever regard as sacred, since to it he probably owed the satisfaction which at present he enjoyed of meeting his people in Parliament. This measure of the king's was received with great applause and satisfaction. After repeated solicitations, the act of indemnity passed both houses, and soon received the royal assent. Those who had an immediate hand in the late king's death were there accepted. Even Cromwell, Ireton, Bradshaw, and others now dead were attainted, and their estates forfeited. Vane and Lambert, though none of the regicides, were also accepted. St. John and seventeen persons more were deprived of all benefit from this act, if they ever accepted any public employment. All who had sitten in any illegal high court of justice were disabled from bearing offices. These were all the severities which followed such furious civil wars and convulsions. The next business was the settlement of the king's revenue. In this work the Parliament had regard to public freedom, as well as to the support of the crown. The tenures of wards and liveries had long been regarded as a grievous burden by the nobility and gentry. Several attempts had been made during the reign of James to purchase this prerogative, together with that of purveyance, and two hundred thousand pounds a year had been offered that prince in lieu of them. Wardships and purveyance had been utterly abolished by the Republican Parliament, and even in the present Parliament before the king arrived in England, a bill had been introduced offering him a compensation for the emolument of these prerogatives. A hundred thousand pounds a year was the sum agreed to, and half of the excise was settled in perpetuity upon the crown as the fund whence this revenue should be levied. Though that impost yielded more profit, 
the bargain might be esteemed hard and it was chiefly the necessity of, of the king's situation which induced him to consent to it no request of the parliament during the present joy could be refused them tonnage and poundage and the other half of the excise were granted to the king during life parliament even proceeded so far as to vote that the settled revenue of the crown for all charges should be one million two hundred thousand pounds a year a sum greater than any english monarch had ever before enjoyed but as all the princes of europe were perpetually augmenting their military force and consequently their expense it became requisite that england from motives both of honor and security should bear some proportion to them and adapt its revenue to the new system of politics which prevailed according to the chancellor's computation a charge of eight hundred thousand pounds a year was at present requisite for the fleet and other articles which formerly cost the crown but eighty thousand had the parliament before restoring the king insisted on any further limitations than those which the constitution already imposed besides the danger of reviving former quarrels among parties it would seem that their precaution had been entirely superfluous by reason of its slender and precarious revenue the crown in effect was still totally dependent not a fourth of this sum which seemed requisite for public expenses could be levied without consent of parliament and any concessions had they been thought necessary might even after the restoration be extorted by the commons from their necessitous prince this parliament showed no intention of employing at present that engine to any such purposes but they seemed still determined not to part with it entirely or to render the revenues of the crown fixed and independent though they voted in general that one million two hundred thousand pounds a year should be settled on the king they scarcely assigned any funds which could yield two-thirds of that sum and they left the care of fulfilling their engagements to the future consideration of parliament in all the temporary supplies which they voted they discovered the same cautious frugality to disband the army so formidable in itself and so much accustomed to rebellion and changes in government was necessary for the security both of king and parliament yet the commons showed great jealousy in granting the sums requisite for that end an assessment of seventy thousand pounds a month was imposed but it was at first voted to continue only three months and all the other sums which they levied for that purpose by a poll bill and new assessments were still granted by parcels as if they were not as yet well assured of the fidelity of the hand to which the money was entrusted having proceeded so far in the settlement of the nation the parliament adjourned itself for some time during the recess of parliament the object which chiefly interested the public was the trial and condemnation of the regicides the general indignation attending the enormous crime of which these men had been guilty made their sufferings the subject of joy to the people but in the peculiar circumstances of that action in the prejudices of the times as well as in the behavior of the criminals a mind seasoned with humanity will find a plentiful source of compassion and indulgence can any one without concern for human blindness and ignorance consider the demeanor of general harrison who was first brought to this trial with great courage and elevation of sentiment he told the court that the pretended crime of which he stood accused was not a deed performed in a corner the sound of it had gone forth to most nations and in the singular and marvellous conduct of it had chiefly appeared the sovereign power of heaven that he himself agitated by doubts had often with passionate tears offered up his addresses to the divine majesty and earnestly sought for light and conviction he had still received assurance of a heavenly sanction and returned from these devout supplications with more serene tranquillity and satisfaction that all the nations of the earth were in the eyes of their creator less than a drop of water in the bucket nor were their erroneous judgments aught but darkness compared with divine illuminations that these frequent relapses of the divine spirit he could not suspect to be interested illusions since he was conscious that for no temporal advantage would he offer injury to the poorest man or woman that trod upon the earth that all the allurements of ambition all the terrors of imprisonment had not been able during the usurpation of cromwell to shake his steady resolution or bend him to a compliance with that deceitful tyrant and that when invited by him to sit on the right hand of the throne when offered riches and splendor and dominion 
he had disdainfully rejected all temptations, and neglecting the tears of his friends and family, had still, through every danger, held fast his principles and his integrity. Scott, who was more a Republican than a fanatic, had said in the House of Commons, a little before the Restoration, that he desired no other epitaph to be inscribed on his tombstone than this, Here lies Thomas Scott, who adjudged the king to death. He supported the same spirit upon his trial. Carew, a millenarian, submitted to his trial, saving to our Lord Jesus Christ his right to the government of these kingdoms. Some scrupled to say, according to form, that they would be tried by God and their country, because God was not visibly present to judge them. Others said that they would be tried by the word of God. No more than six of the late king's judges, Harrison, Scott, Carew, Clements, Jones, and Scroop, were executed. Scroop alone, of all those who came in upon the king's proclamation, he was a gentleman of good family and of a decent character, but it was proved that he had a little before, in conversation, expressed himself as if he were nowise convinced of any guilt in condemning the king. Axtell, who had guarded the high court of justice, Hacker, who commanded on the day of the king's execution, Coke, the solicitor for the people of England, and Hugh Peters, the fanatical preacher, who inflamed the army and impelled them to regicide. All these were tried and condemned and suffered with the king's judges. No saint or confessor ever went to martyrdom with more assured confidence of heaven than was expressed by those criminals, even when the terrors of immediate death, joined to many indignities, were set before them. The rest of the king's judges, by an unexampled lenity, were reprieved, and they were dispersed into several prisons. This punishment of declared enemies interrupted not the rejoicings of the court, but the death of the Duke of Gloucester, a young prince of promising hopes, threw a great cloud upon them. The king, by no incident in his life, was ever so deeply affected. Gloucester was observed to possess united the good qualities of both his brothers, the clear judgment and penetration of the king, the industry and application of the Duke of York. He was also believed to be affectionate to the religion and constitution of his country. He was but twenty years of age when the smallpox put an end to his life. The Princess of Orange, having come to England in order to partake of the joy attending the restoration of her family, with whom she lived in great friendship, soon after sickened and died. The Queen Mother paid a visit to her son, and obtained his consent to the marriage of the Princess Henrietta with the Duke of Orleans, brother to the French King. After a recess of near two months, the Parliament met and proceeded in the great work of the national settlement. They established the post office, wine licenses, and some articles of the revenue. They granted more assessments and some arrears for paying and disbanding the army, business being carried on with great unanimity was soon dispatched and after they had sitten near two months the king in a speech full of the most gracious expressions thought proper to dissolve them this house of commons had been chosen during the reign of the old parliamentary party and though many royalists had crept in amongst them yet did it chiefly consist of presbyterians who had not yet entirely laid aside their old jealousies and principles Lenthal, a member, having said that those who first took arms against the king were as guilty as those who afterwards brought him to the scaffold, was severely reprimanded by order of the House, and the most violent efforts of the long Parliament to secure the Constitution and bring delinquents to justice were in effect vindicated and applauded. The claim of the two houses to the militia, the first ground of the quarrel, however exorbitant a usurpation, was never expressly resigned by this Parliament. They made all grants of money with a very sparing hand, great arrears being due, by the protectors, to the fleet, the army, the navy office, and every branch of service. This whole debt they threw upon the crown, without establishing funds sufficient for its payment. Yet notwithstanding this jealous care expressed by the Parliament, there prevails a story that Pompum, having sounded the disposition of the members, undertook to the Earl of Southampton to procure, during the king's life, a grant of two millions a year, land tax, a sum which, added to the customs and excise, would forever have rendered this prince independent of his people. Southampton, it is said, merely from his affection to the king, had unwarily embraced the offer, 
and it was not till he communicated the matter to the chancellor that he was made sensible of its pernicious tendency it is nor improbable that such an offer might have been made and been hearkened to but it was nowise probable that all the interest of the court would ever with this house of commons have been able to make it effectual clarendon showed his prudence no less than his integrity in entirely rejecting it the chancellor from the same principles of conduct hastened to disband the army when the king reviewed these veteran troops he was struck with their beauty order discipline and martial appearance and being sensible that regular forces are most necessary implements of royalty he expressed a desire of finding expedients still to retain them but his wise ministers set before him the dangerous spirit by which these troops were actuated their enthusiastic genius their habits of rebellion and mutiny and he convinced the king that till they were disbanded he never could esteem himself securely established on his throne no more troops were retained than a few guards and garrisons about one thousand horse and four thousand foot this was the first appearance under the monarchy of a regular standing army in this island lord mordaunt said that the king being possessed of that force might now look upon himself as the most considerable gentleman in england the fortifications of gloucester taunton and other towns which had made resistance to the king during the civil wars were demolished end of section one chapter sixty three part one recording by jim dennison j i m d e n i s o n dot i can voice dot com section two of volume one f of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim dennison history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one f section two chapter sixty three part two clarendon not only behaved with wisdom and justice in the office of chancellor all the counsels which he gave the king tended equally to promote the interest of prince and people charles accustomed in his exile to pay entire deference to the judgment of this faithful servant continued still to submit to his direction and for some time no minister was ever possessed of more absolute authority he moderated the forward zeal of the royalists and tempered their appetite for revenge with the opposite party he endeavored to preserve inviolate all the king's engagements he kept an exact register of the promises which had been made for any service he employed all his industry to fulfill them this good minister was now nearly allied to the royal family his daughter anne hyde a woman of spirit and fine accomplishments had hearkened while abroad to the addresses of the duke of york and under promise of marriage had secretly admitted him to her bed her pregnancy appeared soon after the restoration, and though many endeavoured to dissuade the king from consenting to so unequal an alliance, Charles, in pity to his friend and minister, who had been ignorant of these engagements, permitted his brother to marry her. Clarington expressed great uneasiness at the honour which he had obtained, and said that, by being elevated so much above his rank, he thence dreaded a more sudden downfall most circumstances of clarendon's administration have been met with applause his maxims alone in the conduct of ecclesiastical politics have by many been deemed the effect of prejudices narrow and bigoted had the jealousy of royal power prevailed so far with the convention parliament as to make them restore the king with strict limitations there is no question but the establishment of presbyterian discipline had been one of the conditions most rigidly insisted on not only that form of ecclesiastical government is more favorable to liberty than to royal power it was likewise on its own account agreeable to the majority of the house of commons and suited their religious principles but as the impatience of the people the danger of delay the general disgust towards faction and the authority of monk had prevailed over that jealous project of limitations the full settlement of the hierarchy together with the monarchy was a necessary and infallible consequence all the royalists were zealous for that mode of religion 
the merits of the Episcopal clergy towards the king, as well as their sufferings on that account, had been great. The laws which established bishops and liturgy were as yet unrepealed by legal authority, and any attempt of the Parliament by new acts to give the superiority to Presbyterianism had been sufficient to involve the nation again in blood and confusion. Moved by these views, the Commons had wisely postponed the examination of all religious controversy, and had left the settlement of the Church to the King and to the ancient laws. The King at first used great moderation in the execution of the laws. Nine bishops still remained alive, and these were immediately restored to their sees. All rejected clergy recovered their livings. The liturgy, a form of worship decent, and not without beauty, was again admitted into the churches. But at the same time a declaration was issued, in order to give contentment to the Presbyterians, and preserve an air of moderation and neutrality. In this declaration the king promised that he would provide suffragan bishops for the larger dioceses, that the prelates should, all of them, be regular and constant preachers, that they should not confer ordination or exercise any jurisdiction without the advice and assistance of presbyters chosen by the dioceses, that such alterations should be made in the liturgy as would render it totally unexceptionable, that, in the meantime, the use of that mode of worship should not be imposed on such as were unwilling to receive it, and that the surplusy, the cross in baptism, and bowing at the name of Jesus, should not be rigidly insisted on. This declaration was issued by the king as head of the church, and he plainly assumed in many parts of it a legislative authority in ecclesiastical matters. But the English government, though more exactly defined by late contests, was not as yet reduced in every particular to the strict limits of law. And if ever prerogative was justifiably employed, it seemed to be on the present occasion, when all parts of the state were torn with past convulsions, and required the moderating hand of the chief magistrate to reduce them to their ancient order. But though these appearances of neutrality were maintained, and a mitigated episcopacy only seemed to be insisted on, it was far from the intention of the ministry always to preserve like regard to the Presbyterians. The madness of the fifth monarchy men afforded them a pretense for departing from it. Venner, a desperate enthusiast, who had often conspired against Cromwell, having by his zealous lectures inflamed his own imagination and that of his followers, issued forth at their head into the streets of London. They were, to the number of sixty, completely armed, believed themselves invulnerable and invincible, and firmly expected the same success which had attended Gideon and other heroes of the Old Testament. Every one at first fled before them. One unhappy man, who, being questioned, said, He was for God and King Charles, was instantly murdered by them. They went triumphantly from street to street, everywhere proclaiming King Jesus, who they said was their invisible leader. At length the magistrates, having assembled some train bands, made an attack upon them. They defended themselves with order as well as valor, and after killing many of the assailants, they made a regular retreat into Cane Wood near Hampstead. Next morning they were chased thence by a detachment of the guards, but they ventured again to invade the city, which was not prepared to receive them. After committing great disorder and traversing almost every street of that immense capital, they retired into a house, which they were resolute to defend to the last extremity. Being surrounded, and the house untiled, they were fired upon from every side, and they still refused quarter. The people rushed in upon them, and seized the few who were alive. These were tried, condemned, and executed, and to the last they persisted in affirming that, if they were deceived, it was the Lord that had deceived them." Clarendon and the ministry took occasion from this insurrection to infer the dangerous spirit of the Presbyterians, and of all the sectaries, but the madness of the attempt sufficiently proved that it had been undertaken by no concert, and never could have proved dangerous. The well-known hatred, too, which prevailed between the Presbyterians and the other sects, should have removed the former from all suspicion of any concurrence in the enterprise, but as a pretense was wanted, besides their old demerits, for justifying the intended rigors against all of them. This reason, however slight, was greedily laid hold of. Affairs in Scotland hastened with still quicker steps than those in England towards a settlement and a compliance with the king. 
It was deliberated in the English council whether that nation should be restored to its liberty, or whether the forts erected by Cromwell should not still be upheld, in order to curb the mutinous spirit by which the Scots in all ages had been so much governed. Lauderdale, who from the Battle of Worcester to the Restoration had been detained prisoner in the Tower, had considerable influence with the king, and he strenuously opposed this violent measure. He represented that it was the loyalty of the Scottish nation which had engaged them in an opposition to the English rebels, and to take advantage of the calamities into which, on that account, they had fallen, would be regarded as the highest injustice and ingratitude, that the spirit of that people was now fully subdued by the servitude under which the usurpers had so long held them, and would of itself yield to any reasonable compliance with their legal sovereign if, by this means, they recovered their liberty and independence, that the attachment of the Scots towards their king, whom they regarded as their native prince, was naturally much stronger than that of the English, and would afford him a sure resource in case of any rebellion among the latter that republican principles had long been and still were very prevalent within his southern subjects and might again menace the throne with new tumults and resistance that the time would probably come when the king instead of desiring to see english garrisons in scotland would be better pleased to have scottish garrisons in england who supported by english pay would be fond to curb the seditious genius of that opulent nation and that a people such as the Scots, governed by a few nobility, would more easily be reduced to submission under monarchy than one like the English, who breathed nothing but the spirit of democratical equality. These views induced the king to disband all the forces in Scotland, and to raise all the forts which had been erected. General Middleton, created earl of that name, was sent commissioner to the Parliament, which was summoned. A very compliant spirit was there discovered in all orders of men. The commissioner had even sufficient influence to obtain an act, annulling at once all laws which had passed since the year 1633, on pretext of the violence which, during that time, had been employed against the king and his father, in order to procure their assent to these statutes. This was a very large, if not an unexampled, concession, and, together with many dangerous limitations, overthrew some useful barriers which had been erected to the constitution but the tide was now running strongly towards monarchy and the scottish nation plainly discovered that their past resistance had proceeded more from the turbulence of their aristocracy and the bigotry of their ecclesiastics than from any fixed passion towards civil liberty the lords of articles were restored with some other branches of prerogative and royal authority fortified with more plausible claims and pretenses was, in its full extent, re-established in that kingdom. The prelacy, likewise, by abrogating of every statute enacted in favor of presbytery, was thereby tacitly restored, and the king deliberated what use he should make of this concession. Lauderdale, who at bottom was a passionate zealot against episcopacy, endeavored to persuade him that the Scots, if gratified in this favorite point of ecclesiastical government, would, in every other demand, be entirely compliant with the king. Charles, though he had not so much attachment to prelacy as had influenced his father and grandfather, had suffered such indignities from the Scottish Presbyterians that he ever bore them a hearty aversion. He said to Lauderdale that Presbyterianism, he thought, was not a religion for a gentleman, and he could not consent to its further continuance in Scotland. Middleton, too, and his other ministers persuaded him that the nation in general was so disgusted with the violence and tyranny of the ecclesiastics that any alteration of church government would be universally grateful and Clarendon, as well as Ormond, dreading that the Presbyterian sect, if legally established in Scotland, would acquire authority in England and Ireland, seconded the application of these ministers. The resolution was therefore taken to restore prelacy, a measure afterwards attended with many and great inconveniences. But whether in this resolution Charles chose not the lesser evil, it is very difficult to determine." Sharp, who had been commissioned by the Presbyterians in Scotland to manage their interest with the king, was persuaded to abandon that party, and, as a reward for his compliance, was created Archbishop of St. Andrews. The conduct of ecclesiastical affairs was chiefly entrusted to him, and as he was esteemed a traitor and a renegade by his old friends, 
he became on that account, as well as from the violence of his conduct, extremely obnoxious to them. Charles had not promised to Scotland any such indemnity as he had insured to England by the declaration of Brada, and was deemed more political for him to hold over men's heads for some time the terror of punishment till they should have made the requisite compliances with the new government. Though neither the king's temper nor plan of administration led him to severity, some examples, after such a bloody and triumphant rebellion, seem necessary, and the Marquis of Argyle and one Guthrie were pitched on as the victims. Two acts of indemnity, one passed by the late king in 1641, another by the present in 1651, formed, it was thought, invincible obstacles to the punishment of Argyle, and barred all inquiry into that part of his conduct which might justly be regarded as most exceptionable. Nothing remained but to try him for his compliance with the usurpation, a crime common to him with the whole nation, and such a one as the most loyal and affectionate subject might frequently, by violence, be obliged to commit. To make this compliance appear the more voluntary and hearty, there were produced in court letters which he had written to Albemarle, while that general commanded in Scotland, and which contained expressions of the most cordial attachment to the established government. But besides the general indignation excited by Albemarle's discovery of this private correspondence, men thought that even the highest demonstrations of affection might, during jealous times, be exacted as a necessary mark of compliance from a person of such distinction as Argyle, and could not by any equitable construction imply the crime of treason. The Parliament, however, scrupled not to pass sentence upon him, and he died with great constancy and courage. As he was universally known to have been the chief instrument of the past disorders and civil wars, the irregularity of his sentence, and several iniquitous circumstances in the method of conducting his trial, seemed on that account to admit of some apology. Lord Lorne, son of Argyle, having ever preserved his loyalty, obtained a gift of the forfeiture. Guthrie was a seditious preacher, and had personally affronted the king. His punishment gave surprise to nobody. Sir Archibald Johnstone of Warriston was attainted and fled, but was seized in France about two years after, brought over, and executed. He had been very active during all the late disorders, and was even suspected of a secret correspondence with the English regicides. Besides these instances of compliance in the Scottish Parliament, they voted an additional revenue to the king of forty thousand pounds a year to be levied by way of excise. A small force was purposed to be maintained by this revenue, in order to prevent like confusions with those to which the kingdom had been hitherto exposed. An act was also passed declaring the covenant unlawful, and its obligation void and null. In England the civil distinction seemed to be abolished by the lenity and equality of Charles's administration. Cavalier and Roundhead were heard of no more. All men seemed to concur in submitting to the king's lawful prerogatives, and in cherishing the just privileges of the people and of Parliament. Theological controversy alone still subsisted, and kept alive some sparks of that flame which had thrown the nation into combustion, while Catholics, Independents, and other sectaries were content with entertaining some prospect of toleration, prelacy and presbyteries struggled for the superiority, and the hopes and fears of both parties kept them in agitation. A conference was held in the Savoy between twelve bishops and twelve leaders among the Presbyterian ministers, with an intention, at least on pretense, of bringing about an accommodation between the parties. The surplicy, the cross in baptism, the kneeling at the sacrament, the bowing at the name of Jesus, were anew canvassed, and the ignorant multitude were in hopes that so many men of gravity and learning could not fail, after deliberate argumentation, to agree in all points of controversy. They were surprised to see them separate more inflamed than ever, and more confirmed in their several prejudices. To enter into particulars would be superfluous. Disputes concerning religious forms are, in themselves, the most frivolous of any, and merit attention only so far as they have influence on the peace and order of civil society. The King's declaration had promised that some endeavors should be used to effect a comprehension of both parties, and Charles's own indifference with regard to all such questions seemed a favorable circumstance for the execution of that project. 
the partisans of a comprehension said that the Presbyterians as well as the Prelatists, having felt by experience the fatal effects of obstinacy and violence, were now well disposed towards an amicable agreement, that the bishops, by relinquishing some part of their authority and dispensing with the most exceptionable ceremonies, would so gratify their adversaries as to obtain their cordial and affectionate compliance, and unite the whole nation in one faith and one worship, that by obstinately insisting on forms in themselves insignificant, an air of importance was bestowed on them, and men were taught to continue equally obstinate in rejecting them, that the Presbyterian clergy would go every reasonable length, rather than by parting with their livings, expose themselves to a state of beggary, at best of dependence, and that if their pride were flattered by some seeming alterations, and a pretense given them for affirming that they had not abandoned their former principles, nothing further was wanting to produce a thorough union between those two parties which comprehended the bulk of the nation it was alleged on the other hand that the difference between religious sects was founded not on principle but on passion and till the irregular affections of men could be corrected it was in vain to expect by compliances to obtain a perfect unanimity and comprehension that the more insignificant the objects of dispute appeared with the more certainty it might be inferred, that the real ground of dissension was different from that which was universally pretended, that the love of novelty, the pride of augmentation, the pleasure of making proselytes, and the obstinacy of contradiction, would forever give rise to sects and disputes, nor was it possible that such a source of dissension could ever, by any concessions, be entirely exhausted that the church by departing from ancient practices and principles would tacitly acknowledge herself guilty of error and lose that reverence so requisite for preserving the attachment of the multitude and that if the present concessions which was more than probable should prove ineffectual greater must still be made and in the issue discipline would be despoiled of all its authority and worship of all its decency without obtaining that end which had been so fondly sought for by these dangerous indulgences. The ministry were inclined to give the preference to the latter arguments, and were more confirmed in that intention by the disposition which appeared in the Parliament lately assembled. The royalist and zealous churchmen were at present the popular party in the nation, and seconded by the efforts of the court, had prevailed in most elections not more than fifty-six members of the presbyterian party had obtained seats in the lower house and these were not able either to oppose or retard the measures of the majority monarchy therefore and episcopacy were now exalted to as great power and splendor as they had lately suffered misery and depression sir edward turner was chosen speaker an act was passed for the security of the king's person and government to intend or devise the king's imprisonment, or bodily harm, or deposition, or levying war against him, was declared during the lifetime of his present majesty to be high treason, to affirm him to be a papist or heretic, or to endeavor by speech or writing to alienate his subjects' affections from him, these offenses were made sufficient to incapacitate the person guilty from holding any employment in church or state to maintain that the long parliament is not dissolved or that either or both houses without the king are possessed of legislative authority or that the covenant is binding was made punishable by the penalty of primaneri end of section two chapter sixty three part two recording by jim dennison j i m d e n i s o n dot i can voice dot com Section 3 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1F Section 3, Chapter 63, Part 3 The covenant itself, together with the act for erecting the High Court of Justice, that for subscribing the engagement, 
and that for declaring England a commonwealth, were ordered to be burnt by the hands of the hangman. The people assisted with great alacrity on this occasion. The abuses of petitioning in the preceding reign had been attended with the worst consequences, and to prevent such irregular practices for the future, it was enacted that no more than twenty hands should be fixed to any petition, unless with the sanction of three justices, or the major part of the grand jury, and that no petition should be presented to the king or either house by above ten persons. The penalty annexed to the transgression of this law was a fine of one hundred pounds and three months' imprisonment. The bishops, though restored to their spiritual authority, were still excluded from Parliament by the law which the late king had passed immediately before the commencement of the civil disorders. Great violence, both against the king and the House of Peers, had been employed in passing this law, and on that account alone the partisans of the Church were provided with a plausible pretense for repealing it. Charles expressed much satisfaction when he gave his assent to the act for that purpose. It is certain that the authority of the crown, as well as that of the church, was interested in restoring the prelates to their former dignity, but those who deemed every acquisition of the prince a detriment to the people were apt to complain of this instance of complaisance in the Parliament. After an adjournment of some months, the Parliament was again assembled, and proceeded in the same spirit as before. They discovered no design of restoring, in its full extent, the ancient prerogative of the crown. They were only anxious to repair all those breaches which had been made, not by the love of liberty, but by the fury of faction and civil war. The power of the sword had in all ages been allowed to be vested in the crown, and though no law confirmed this prerogative, every parliament till the last of the preceding reign had willingly submitted to an authority more ancient and therefore more sacred than that of any positive statute. It was now thought proper solemnly to relinquish the violent pretensions of that parliament and to acknowledge that neither one house nor both houses, independent of the king, were possessed of any military authority. The preamble to this statute went so far as to renounce all right even of defensive arms against the king, and much observation has been made with regard to a concession esteemed so singular. Were these terms taken in their full, literal sense? They imply a total renunciation of limitations to monarchy, and of all privileges in the subject, independent of the will of the sovereign for as no rights can subsist without some remedy still less rights exposed to so much invasion from tyranny or even from ambition if subjects must never resist it follows that every prince without any effort policy or violence is at once rendered absolute and uncontrollable the sovereign needs only issue an edict abolishing every authority but his own and all liberty from that moment is in effect annihilated. But this meaning it were absurd to impute to the present Parliament, who, though zealous royalists, showed in their measures that they had not cast off all regard to national privileges. They were probably sensible that to suppose in the sovereign any such invasion of public liberty is entirely unconstitutional, and that therefore expressly to reserve upon that event any right of resistance in the subject must be liable to the same objection. They had seen that the long Parliament, under color of defense, had begun a violent attack upon kingly power, and after involving the kingdom in blood, had finally lost that liberty for which they had so imprudently contended. They thought, perhaps erroneously, that it was no longer possible, after such public and such exorbitant pretensions, to persevere in that prudent silence hitherto maintained by the laws and that it was necessary, by some positive declaration, to bar the return of like inconveniences. When they excluded, therefore, the right of defense, they supposed that the Constitution, remaining firm upon its basis, there never really could be an attack made by the sovereign. If such an attack was at any time made, the necessity was then extreme, and the case of extreme and violent necessity no laws they thought could comprehend because to such a necessity no laws could beforehand point out a proper remedy the other measures of this parliament still discovered a more anxious care to guard against rebellion in the subject than encroachments in the crown the recent evils of civil war and usurpation had naturally increased the spirit of submission to the monarch and had thrown the nation into that dangerous extreme during the violent and jealous government of the Parliament and of the Protectors, all magistrates liable to suspicion had been expelled the corporations, 
and none had been admitted who gave not proofs of affection to the ruling powers or who refused to subscribe the covenant to leave all authority in such hands seemed dangerous and the parliament therefore empowered the king to appoint commissioners for regulating the corporations and expelling such magistrates as either intruded themselves by violence or professed principles dangerous to the constitution civil and ecclesiastical it was also enacted that all magistrates should disclaim the obligation of the covenant and should declare both their belief that it was not lawful upon any pretense whatsoever to resist the king and their abhorrence of the traitorous position of taking arms by the king's authority against his person or against those who were commissioned by him the care of the church was no less attended to by this parliament than that of monarchy and the bill of uniformity was a pledge of their sincere attachment to the episcopal hierarchy and of their antipathy to presbyterianism different parties however concurred in promoting this bill which contained many severe clauses the independents and other sectaries enraged to find all their schemes subverted by the presbyterians who had once been their associates exerted themselves to disappoint that party of the favor and indulgence to which from their recent merits in promoting the restoration they thought themselves justly entitled by the presbyterians said they the war was raised by them was the populace first incited to tumults by their zeal interest and riches were the armies supported by their force was the king subdued and if in the sequel they protested against those extreme violences committed on his person by the military leaders their opposition came too late after having supplied these usurpers with the power and the pretenses by which they maintained their sanguinary measures they had indeed concurred with the royalist in recalling the king but ought they to be esteemed on that account more affectionate to the royal cause rage and animosity from disappointed ambition were plainly their sole motives and if the king should now be so imprudent as to distinguish them by any particular indulgences he would soon experience from them the same hatred and opposition which had proved so fatal to his father the catholics though they had little interest in the nation were a considerable party at court and from their services and sufferings during the civil wars it seemed but just to bear them some favor and regard these religionists dreaded an entire union among the protestants were they the sole nonconformists in the nation the severe execution of penal laws upon their sect seemed an infallible consequence and they used therefore all their interest to push matters to extremity against the presbyterians who had formerly been their most severe oppressors and whom they now expected for their companions in affliction the earl of bristol who from conviction or interest or levity or complaisance for the company with whom he lived had changed his religion during the king's exile was regarded as the head of this party the church party had during so many years suffered such injuries and indignities from the sectaries of every denomination that no moderation much less deference was on this occasion to be expected in the ecclesiastics even the laity of that communion seemed now disposed to retaliate upon their enemies according to the usual measures of party justice this sect or faction for it partook of both encouraged the rumors of plots and conspiracies against the government crimes which without any apparent reason they imputed to their adversaries and instead of enlarging the terms of communion in order to comprehend the presbyterians they gladly laid hold of the prejudices which had prevailed among that sect in order to eject them from their livings by the bill of uniformity it was required that every clergyman should be reordained if he had not before received episcopal ordination should declare his assent to everything contained in the book of common prayer should take the oath of canonical obedience should abjure the solemn league and covenant and should renounce the principle of taking arms on any pretense whatsoever against the king this bill reinstated the church in the same condition in which it stood before the commencement of the civil wars and as the old persecuting laws of elizabeth still subsisted in their full rigor and new clauses of a like nature were now enacted all the king's promises of toleration and of indulgence to tender consciences were thereby eluded and broken it is true charles in his declaration from breda had expressed his intention of regulating that indulgence by the advice and authority of parliament 
but this limitation could never reasonably be extended to a total infringement and violation of his engagements. However, it is agreed that the king did not voluntarily concur with this violent measure, and that the zeal of Clarendon and of the church party among the commons, seconded by the intrigues of the Catholics, was the chief cause which extorted his consent. The royalists, who now predominated, were very ready to signalize their victory by establishing those high principles of monarchy which their antagonist had controverted. But when any real power or revenue was demanded for the crown, they were neither so forward nor so liberal in their concessions as the king would gladly have wished. Though the Parliament passed laws for regulating the navy, they took no notice of the army, and declined giving their sanction to this dangerous innovation. The king's debts were become intolerable, and the commons were at last constrained to vote him an extraordinary supply of one million two hundred thousand pounds to be levied by eighteen monthly assessments. But besides that this supply was much inferior to the occasion, the king was obliged earnestly to solicit the commons before he could obtain it, and in order to convince the house of its absolute necessity, he desired them to examine strictly into all his receipts and disbursements. Finding, likewise, upon inquiry, that the several branches of revenue fell much short of the sums expected, they at last, after much delay, voted a new imposition of two shillings on each hearth, and this tax they settled on the king during life. The whole established revenue, however, did not for many years exceed a million, a sum confessedly too narrow for the public expenses. A very rigid frugality, at least, which the king seems to have wanted, would have been requisite to make it suffice for the dignity and security of government. After all business was dispatched, the Parliament was prorogued. Before the Parliament rose, the court was employed in making preparations for the reception of the new queen, Catherine of Portugal, to whom the king was betrothed, and who had just landed at Portsmouth. During the time that the protector carried on the war with Spain, he was naturally led to support the Portuguese in their revolt, and he engaged himself by treaty to supply them with ten thousand men for their defense against the Spaniards. On the king's restoration, advances were made by Portugal for the renewal of the alliance, and in order to bind the friendship closer, an offer was made of the Portuguese princess, and a portion of five hundred thousand pounds, together with two fortresses, Tangiers in Africa, and Bombay in the East Indies. Spain, who after the peace of the Pyrenees, bent all her force to recover Portugal, now in appearance abandoned by France, took the alarm, and endeavored to fix Charles in an opposite interest. The Catholic king offered to adopt any other princess as a daughter of Spain, either the princess of Parma, or, what he thought more popular, some Protestant princess, the daughter of Denmark, Saxony, or Orange and on any of these he promised to confer a dowry equal to that which was offered by Portugal. But many reasons inclined Charles rather to accept of the Portuguese proposals. The great disorders in the government and finances of Spain made the execution of her promises be much doubted, and the king's urgent necessities demanded some immediate supply of money. The interest of the English commerce likewise seemed to require that the independency of Portugal should be supported, lest the union of that crown with Spain should put the whole treasures of America into the hands of one potentate. The claims, too, of Spain upon Dunkirk and Jamaica rendered it impossible, without further concessions, to obtain the cordial friendship of that power, and, on the other hand, the offer made by Portugal of two such considerable fortresses promised a great accession to the naval force of England. Above all, the proposal of a Protestant princess was no allurement to Charles, whose inclinations led him strongly to give preference to a Catholic alliance. According to the most probable accounts, the resolution of marrying the daughter of Portugal was taken by the king, unknown to all his ministers, and no remonstrances could prevail with him to alter his intentions. When the matter was laid before the council, all voices concurred in approving the resolution, and the Parliament expressed the same complacence, and thus was concluded seemingly with universal consent, the inauspicious marriage with Catherine, a princess of virtue, but who was never able, either by the graces of her person or humor, to make herself agreeable to the king. The report, however, of her natural incapacity to have children seems to have been groundless, since she was twice declared to be pregnant. The festivity of these espousals was clouded by the trial and execution of criminals. 
Berkstead, Cabot, and O'Keefe, three regicides, had escaped beyond sea, and after wandering some time concealed in Germany, came privately to Delft, having appointed their families to meet them in that place. They were discovered by Downing, the king's resident in Holland, who had formerly served the protector and commonwealth in the same station, and who once had even been chaplain to O'Keefe's regiment. He applied for a warrant to arrest them. It had been usual for the states to grant these warrants, though at the same time they had ever been careful secretly to advertise the persons that they might be enabled to make their escape. This precaution was eluded by the vigilance and dispatch of Downing. He quickly seized the criminals, hurried them on board a frigate which lay off the coast, and sent them to England. These three men behaved with more moderation and submission than any of the other regicides who had suffered. O'Kee, in particular, at the place of execution, prayed for the king, and expressed his intention, had he lived, of submitting peacefully to the established government. He had risen, during the wars, from being a chandler in London to a high rank in the army, and in all his conduct appeared to be a man of humanity and honor. In consideration of his good character and of his dutiful behavior, his body was given to his friends to be buried. The attention of the public was much engaged by the trial of two distinguished criminals, Lambert and Vane. These men, though none of the late king's judges, had been accepted from the general indemnity and committed to prison. The convention parliament, however, was so favorable to them as to petition the king, if they should be found guilty, to suspend their execution. But this new parliament, more zealous for monarchy, applied for their trial and condemnation. Not to revive disputes which were better buried in oblivion, the indictment of Vane did not comprehend any of his actions during the war between the king and parliament. It extended only to his behavior after the late king's death, as member of the council of state, and secretary of the navy, where fidelity to the trust reposed in him required his opposition to monarchy. Vane wanted neither courage nor capacity to avail himself of this advantage. He urged that, if a compliance with the government at that time established in England, and the acknowledging of its authority were to be regarded as criminal, the whole nation had incurred equal guilt, and none would remain whose innocence could entitle them to try or condemn him for his pretended treasons, that, according to these maxims, wherever an illegal authority was established by force, a total and universal destruction must ensue. While the usurpers proscribed one part of the nation for disobedience, the lawful prince punished the other for compliance. That the legislature of England, foreseeing this violent situation, had provided for public security by the famous statute of Henry the Seventh, in which it was enacted that no man, in case of any revolution, should ever be questioned for his obedience to the king in being, that whether the established government were a monarchy or a commonwealth, the reason of the thing was still the same, nor ought the expelled prince to think himself entitled to allegiance, so long as he could not afford protection." that it belonged not to private persons, possessed of no power, to discuss the title of their governors, and every usurpation, even the most flagrant, would equally require obedience with the most legal establishment, that the controversy between the late king and his parliament was one of the most delicate nature, and men of the greatest probity had been divided in their choice of the party which they should embrace, that the parliament being rendered indissoluble by its own consent, was become a kind of coordinate power with the king. And as the case was thus entirely new and unknown to the Constitution, it ought not to be tried rigidly by the letter of the ancient laws. That for his part, all the violences which had been put upon the Parliament, and upon the person of the Sovereign, he had ever condemned, nor had he once in the House for some time before and after the execution of the king. That, finding the whole government thrown into disorder, he was still resolved in every revolution to adhere to the commons, the root, the foundation of all lawful authority, that in prosecution of this principle he had cheerfully undergone all the violence of Cromwell's tyranny, and would now with equal alacrity expose himself to the rigors of perverted law and justice, that though it was in his power on the king's restoration to have escaped from his enemies, he was determined, in imitation of the most illustrious names of antiquity, to perish in defense of liberty, and to give testimony with his blood for that honorable cause in which he had been enlisted. 
and that, besides the ties by which God and nature had bound him to his native country, he was voluntarily engaged by the most sacred covenant, whose obligation no earthly power should ever be able to make him relinquish. End of section 3 Chapter 63 Part 3 Recording by Jim Dennison J-I-M-D-E-N-I-S-O-N dot I-C-A-N-V-O-I-C-E dot com Section 4 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1 F, Section 4, Chapter 63, Part 4. All the defense which Vane could make was fruitless. The court, considering more the general opinion of his active guilt in the beginning and prosecution of the civil wars than the articles of treason charged against him, took advantage of the letter of the law and brought him in guilty. His courage deserted him not upon his condemnation. Though timid by nature, the persuasion of a just cause supported him against the terrors of death, while his enthusiasm, excited by the prospect of glory, embellished the conclusion of a life which through the whole course of it had been so much disfigured by the prevalence of that principle. Lest pity for a courageous sufferer should make impression on the populace, drummers were placed under the scaffold, whose noise, as he began to launch out in reflections on the government, drowned his voice and admonished him to temper the ardor of his zeal. He was not astonished at this unexpected incident. In all his behavior there appeared a firm and animated intrepidity, and he considered death but as a passage to that eternal felicity which he believed to be prepared for him. This man, so celebrated for his parliamentary talents and for his capacity in business, has left some writings behind him. They treat, all of them, of religious subjects, and are absolutely unintelligible. No traces of eloquence, or even of common sense, appear in them. A strange paradox. Did we not know that men of the greatest genius, where they relinquish by principle the use of their reason, are only enabled by their vigor of mind to work themselves the deeper into error and absurdity? It was remarkable that as Vane, by being the chief instrument of Stratford's death, had first opened the way for that destruction which overwhelmed the nation, so that by his death he closed the scene of blood. He was the last that suffered on account of the civil wars. Lambert, though condemned, was reprieved at the bar, and the judges declared that if Vane's behavior had been equally dutiful and submissive, he would have experienced like lenity in the king. Lambert survived his condemnation near thirty years. He was confined to the Isle of Guernsey, where he lived contented, forgetting all his past schemes of greatness, and entirely forgotten by the nation. He died a Roman Catholic. However odious Vane and Lambert were to the Presbyterians, that party had no leisure to rejoice at their condemnation. The fatal St. Bartholomew approached, the day when the clergy were obliged, by the late law, either to relinquish their livings or to sign the articles required of them. A combination had been entered into by the more zealous of the Presbyterian ecclesiastics to refuse the subscription, in hopes that the bishops would not venture at once to expel so great a number of the most popular preachers. The Catholic party at court, who desired a great rent among the Protestants, encouraged them in this obstinacy, and gave them hopes that the king would protect them in their refusal. The king himself, by his irresolute conduct, contributed, either from design or accident, to increase this opinion. Above all, the terms of subscription had been made strict and rigid, on purpose to disguise all the zealous and scrupulous among the Presbyterians, and deprive them of their livings. About two thousand of the clergy in one day relinquished their cures, and, to the astonishment of the court, sacrificed their interest to their religious tenants. Fortified by society in their sufferings, 
they were resolved to undergo any hardships rather than openly renounce those principles which on other occasions they were so apt from interest to warp or elude the church enjoyed the pleasure of retaliation and even pushed as usual the vengeance farther than the offence during the dominion of the parliamentary party a fifth of each living had been left to the ejected clergyman but this indulgence though at first insisted on by the house of peers was now refused to the presbyterians however difficult to conciliate peace among theologians it was hoped by many that some relaxation in the terms of communion might have kept the presbyterians united to the church and have cured those ecclesiastical factions which had been so fatal and were still so dangerous bishoprics were offered to calamy baxter and reynolds leaders among the presbyterians the last only could be prevailed on to accept deaneries and other preferments were refused by many the next measure of the king has not had the good fortune to be justified by any party but is often considered on what grounds i shall not determine as one of the greatest mistakes if not blemishes of his reign it is the sale of dunkirk to the french the parsimonious maxims of the parliament and the liberal or rather careless disposition of charles were ill suited to each other and notwithstanding the supplies voted him his treasury was still very empty and very much indebted he had secretly received the sum of two hundred thousand crowns from france for the support of portugal but the forces sent over to that country and the fleets maintained in order to defend it had already cost the king that sum and together with it nearly double the money which had been paid as the queen's portion the time fixed for payment of his sister's portion to the duke of orleans was approaching tangiers a fortress from which great benefit was expected was become an additional burden to the crown and rutherford who now commanded in dunkirk had increased the charge of that garrison to a hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year these considerations had such influence not only on the king but even on clarendon that this uncorrupt minister was the most forward to advise accepting a sum of money in lieu of a place which he thought the king from the narrow state of his revenue was no longer able to retain by the treaty with portugal it was stipulated that dunkirk should never be yielded to the spaniards france was therefore the only purchaser that remained d'estratus was invited over by a letter from the chancellor himself in order to conclude the bargain nine hundred thousand pounds were demanded one hundred thousand were offered the english by degrees lowered their demand the french raised their offer and the bargain was concluded at four hundred thousand pounds the artillery and stores were valued at a fifth of the sum the importance of this sale was not at this time sufficiently known either abroad or at home the french monarch himself so fond of acquisitions and so good a judge of his own interest thought that he had made a hard bargain and this sum in appearance so small was the utmost which he would allow his ambassador to offer a new incident discovered such a glimpse of the king's character and principles as at first the nation was somewhat at a loss how to interpret but such as subsequent events by degrees rendered sufficiently plain and manifest he issued a declaration on pretense of mitigating the rigors contained in the act of uniformity after expressing his firm resolution to observe the general indemnity and to trust entirely to the affections of his subjects not to any military power for the support of his throne he mentioned the promises of liberty of conscience contained in his declaration of breda and he subjoined that as in the first place he had been zealous to settle the uniformity of the church of england in discipline ceremony and government and shall ever constantly maintain it so as for what concerns the penalties upon those who living peaceably do not conform themselves thereunto through scruple and tenderness of misguided conscience but modestly and without scandal perform their devotions in their own way he should make it his special care so far as in him lay without invading the freedom of parliament to incline their wisdom next approaching sessions to concur with him in making such act for that purpose as may enable him to exercise with a more universal satisfaction that power of dispensing which he conceived to be inherent in him here a most important prerogative was exercised by the king 
but under such artful reserves and limitations as might prevent the full discussion of the claim and obviate a breach between him and his parliament the foundation of this measure lay much deeper and was of the utmost consequence the king during his exile had imbibed strong prejudices of favor of the catholic religion and according to the most probable accounts had already been secretly reconciled in form to the church of rome the great zeal expressed by the parliamentary party against all papists had always from a spirit of opposition inclined the court and all the royalists to adopt more favorable sentiments toward that sect which through the whole course of the civil wars had strenuously supported the rights of the sovereign the rigor too which the king during his abode in scotland had experienced from the presbyterians disposed him to run into the other extreme and to bear a kindness to the party most opposite in its genius to the severity of those religionists the solicitations and importunities of the queen mother the contagion of the company which he frequented the view of a more splendid and courtly mode of worship the hopes of indulgence and pleasure all these causes operated powerfully on a young prince whose careless and dissolute temper made him incapable of adhering closely to the principles of his early education but if the thoughtless humor of charles rendered him an easy convert to popery the same disposition ever prevented the theological tenets of that sect from taking any fast hold of him during his vigorous state of health while his blood was warm and his spirits high a contempt and disregard to all religion held possession of his mind and he might more properly be denominated a deist than a catholic but in those revolutions of temper when the love of raillery gave place to reflection and his penetrating but negligent understanding was clouded with fears and apprehensions he had starts of mere sincere conviction and a sect which always possessed his inclination was then master of his judgment and opinion but though the king thus fluctuated during his whole reign between irreligion which he more openly professed and popery to which he retained a secret propensity his brother the duke of york had zealously adopted all the principles of that theological party his eager temper and narrow understanding made him a thorough convert without any reserve from interest or doubts from reasoning and inquiry by his application to business he had acquired a great ascendant over the king who though possessed of more discernment was glad to throw the burden of affairs on the duke of whom he entertained little jealousy on pretence of easing the protestant dissenters they agreed upon a plan for introducing a general toleration and giving the catholics the free exercise of their religion at least the exercise of it in private houses the two brothers saw with pleasure so numerous and popular a body of the clergy refuse conformity and it was hoped that under shelter of their name the small and hated sect of the catholics might meet with favor and protection but while the king pleaded his early promises of toleration and insisted on many other plausible topics the parliament who sat a little after the declaration was issued could by no means be satisfied with this measure the declared intention of easing the dissenters and the secret purpose of favoring the catholics were equally disagreeable to them and in these prepossessions they were encouraged by the king's ministers themselves particularly the chancellor the house of commons represented to the king that his declaration of breda contained no promise to the presbyterians or other dissenters but only an expression of his intentions upon supposition of the concurrence of parliament that even if the nonconformists had been entitled to plead a promise they had entrusted this claim as all their other rights and privileges to the house of commons who were their representatives and who now freed the king from that obligation that it was not to be supposed that his majesty and the houses were so bound by that declaration as to be incapacitated from making any laws which might be contrary to it that even at the king's restoration there were laws of uniformity in force which could not be dispensed with but by act of parliament and that the indulgence intended would prove most pernicious both to church and state would open the door to schism encourage faction disturb the public peace and discredit the wisdom of the legislature the king did not think proper after this remonstrance to insist any further at present on the project of indulgence in order to deprive the catholics of all hopes the two houses concurred in a remonstrance against them 
the king gave a gracious answer though he scrupled not to profess his gratitude towards many of that persuasion on account of their faithful services in his father's cause and in his own a proclamation for form's sake was soon after issued against jesuits and romish priests but care was taken by the very terms of it to render it ineffectual the parliament had allowed that all foreign priests belonging to the two queens should be accepted and that a permission for them to remain in england should still be granted in the proclamation the word foreign was purposely omitted and the queens were thereby authorized to give protection to as many english priests as they should think proper that the king might reap some advantage from his compliances however fallacious he engaged the commons anew into an examination of his revenue which chiefly by the negligence in levying it had proved he said much inferior to the public charges notwithstanding the price of dunkirk his debts he complained amounted to a considerable sum and to satisfy the commons that the money formerly granted him had not been prodigally expended he offered to lay before them the whole account of his disbursements it is however agreed on all hands that the king though during his banishment he had managed his small and precarious income with great order and economy had now much abated of these virtues and was unable to make his royal revenues suffice for his expenses the commons without entering into too nice a disquisition voted him four subsidies and this was the last time that taxes were levied in that manner several laws were made this session with regard to trade the militia also came under consideration and some rules were established for ordering and arming it it was enacted that the king should have no power of keeping the militia under arms above fourteen days in the year the situation of this island together with its great naval power has always occasioned other means of security however requisite to be much neglected among us and the parliament showed here a very superfluous jealousy of the king's strictness in disciplining the militia the principles of liberty rather require a contrary jealousy the earl of bristol's friendship with clarington which had subsisted with great intimacy during their exile and the distresses of the royal party had been considerably impaired since the restoration by the chancellor's refusing his assent to some grants which bristol had applied for to a court lady and a little after the latter nobleman agreeably to the impetuosity and indiscretion of his temper broke out against the minister in the most outrageous manner he even entered a charge of treason against him before the house of peers but had concerted his efforts so imprudently that the judges when consulted declared that neither for its matter nor its form could the charge be legally received the articles indeed resemble more the incoherent altercations of a passionate enemy than a serious accusation fit to be discussed by a court of judicature and bristol himself was so ashamed of his conduct and defeat that he absconded during some time notwithstanding his fine talents his eloquence his spirit and his courage he could never regain the character which he lost by this hasty and precipitate measure but though clarendon was able to elude this rash assault his credit at court was sensibly declining and in proportion as the king found himself established on the throne he began to alienate himself from a minister whose character was so little suited to his own charles's favor for the catholics was always opposed by clarendon public liberty was secured against all attempts of the overzealous royalist prodigal grants of the king were checked or refused and the dignity of his own character was so much consulted by the chancellor that he made it an inviolable rule as did also his friend southampton never to enter into any connection with the royal mistresses the king's favorite was mrs palmer afterwards created duchess of cleveland a woman prodigal rapacious dissolute violent revengeful she failed not in her turn to undermine clarendon's credit with his master and her success was at this time made apparent to the whole world secretary nicholas the chancellor's great friend was removed from his place and sir harry bennet his avowed enemy was advanced to that office bennet was soon after created lord arlington though the king's conduct had hitherto since his restoration been in the main laudable 
men of penetration began to observe that those virtues by which he had at first so much dazzled and enchanted the nation had great show but not equal solidity his good understanding lost much of its influence by his want of application his bounty was more the result of a felicity of disposition than any generosity of character his social humor led him frequently to neglect his dignity his love of pleasure was not attended with proper sentiment and decency and while he seemed to bear a good will to every one that approached him he had a heart not very capable of friendship and he had secretly entertained a very bad opinion and distrust of mankind but above all what sullied his character in the eyes of good judges was his negligent ingratitude toward the unfortunate cavaliers whose zeal and sufferings in the royal cause had known no bounds this conduct however in the king may from the circumstances of his situation and temper admit of some excuse at least of some alleviation as he had been restored more by the efforts of his reconciled enemies than of his ancient friends the former pretended a title to share his favor and being from practice acquainted with public business they were better qualified to execute any trust committed to them the king's revenues were far from being large or even equal to his necessary expenses and his mistresses and the companions of his mirth and pleasures gained by solicitation every request from his easy temper the very poverty to which the more zealous royalists had reduced themselves by rendering them insignificant made them unfit to support the king's measures and caused him to deem them a useless encumbrance and as many false and ridiculous claims of merit were offered his natural indolence averse to a strict discussion of inquiry led him to treat them all with equal indifference the parliament took some notice of the poor cavaliers sixty thousand pounds were at one time distributed among them mrs lane also and the penderells had handsome presents and pensions from the king but the greater part of the royalists still remained in poverty and distress aggravated by their cruel disappointment and their sanguine hopes and by seeing favor and preferment bestowed upon their most inveterate foes with regard to the act of indemnity and oblivion they universally said that it was an act of indemnity to the king's enemies and of oblivion to his friends end of section four chapter sixty three part four recording by jim dennison j i m d e n i s o n dot i can voice dot com section five of volume one f of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim dennison history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one f Section 5, Chapter 64, Part 1 Chapter 64, Charles the Second. The next session of Parliament discovered a continuance of the same principles which had prevailed in all the foregoing. Monarchy and the Church were still the objects of regard and affection. During no period of the present reign did this spirit more evidently pass the bounds of reason and moderation. The king, in his speech to the Parliament, had ventured openly to demand a repeal of the Triennial Act, and he even went so far as to declare that, notwithstanding the law, he never would allow any Parliament to be assembled by the methods prescribed in that statute. The Parliament, without taking offense at this declaration, repealed the law, and, in lieu of all the securities formerly provided, satisfied themselves with a general clause that parliament should not be interrupted above three years at the most as the english parliament had now raised itself to be a regular check and control upon royal power it is evident that they ought still to have preserved a regular security for their meeting and not have trusted entirely to the good will of the king who if ambitious or enterprising had so little reason to be pleased with these assemblies before the end of charles's reign the nation had occasion to feel very sensibly the effects of this repeal. By the act of uniformity, every clergyman who should officiate without being properly qualified was punishable by fine and imprisonment. But this security was not thought sufficient for the church. 
it was now enacted that wherever five persons above those of the same household should assemble in a religious congregation every one of them was liable for the first offence to be imprisoned three months or pay five pounds for the second to be imprisoned six months or pay ten pounds and for the third to be transported seven years or pay a hundred pounds the parliament had only in their eye the malignity of the sectaries they should have carried their attention further to the chief cause of that malignity the restraint under which they labored the commons likewise passed a vote that the wrongs dishonors and indignities offered to the english by the subjects of the united provinces were the greatest obstructions to all foreign trade and they promised to assist the king with their lives and fortunes in asserting the rights of his crown against all opposition whatsoever this was the first open step towards a dutch war we must explain the causes and motives of this measure that close union and confederacy which during a course of near seventy years has subsisted almost without interruption or jealousy between england and holland is not so much founded on the natural unalterable interest of these states as on their terror of the growing power of the french monarch who without their combination it is apprehended would soon extend his dominion over europe in the first years of charles's reign when the ambitious genius of lewis had not as yet displayed itself and when the great force of his people was in some measure unknown even to themselves the rivalship of commerce not checked by any other jealousy or apprehension had in england begotten a violent enmity against the neighboring republic trade was beginning among the english to be a matter of general concern but notwithstanding all their efforts and advantages their commerce seemed hitherto to stand upon a footing which was somewhat precarious the dutch who by industry and frugality were enabled to undersell them in every market retained possession of the most lucrative branches of commerce and the english merchants had the mortification to find that all attempts to extend their trade were still turned by the vigilance of their rivals to their loss and dishonor their indignation increased when they considered the superior naval power of england the bravery of her officers and seamen her favorable situation which enabled her to intercept the whole dutch commerce by the prospect of these advantages they were strongly prompted from motives less just and political to make war upon the states and at once to ravish from them by force what they could not obtain or could obtain but slowly by superior skill and industry the careless unambitious temper of charles rendered him little capable of forming so vast a project as that of engrossing the commerce and naval power of europe yet could he not remain altogether insensible to such obvious and tempting prospects his genius happily turned towards mechanics had inclined him to study naval affairs which of all branches of business he both loved the most and understood the best though the dutch during his exile had expressed towards him more civility and friendship than he had received from any other foreign power the Lufstein or aristocratic faction which at this time ruled the commonwealth had fallen into close union with france and could that party be subdued he might hope that his nephew the young prince of orange would be reinstated in the authority possessed by his ancestors and would bring the states to a dependence under england his narrow revenues made it still requisite for him to study the humors of his people which now ran violently towards war and it has been suspected though the suspicion was not justified by the event that the hopes of diverting some of the supplies to his private use were not overlooked by this necessitous monarch the duke of york more active and enterprising pushed more eagerly the war with holland he desired an opportunity of distinguishing himself he loved to cultivate commerce he was at the head of a new african company whose trade was extremely checked by the settlements of the dutch and perhaps the religious prejudices by which that prince was always so much governed began even so early to instil into him an antipathy against a protestant commonwealth the bulwark of the reformation clarington and southampton observing that the nation was not supported by any foreign alliance were averse to hostilities but their credit was now on the decline by these concurring motives the court and parliament were both of them inclined to a dutch war the parliament was prorogued without voting supplies 
but as they have been induced without any open application from the crown to pass that vote above mentioned against the dutch encroachments it was reasonably considered as sufficient sanction for the rigorous measures which were resolved on downing the english minister at the hague a man of an insolent impetuous temper presented a memorial to the states containing a list of those depredations of which the english complained it is remarkable that all the pretended depreciations preceded the year sixteen sixty two when a treaty of league and alliance had been renewed with the dutch and these complaints were then thought either so ill-grounded or so frivolous that they had not been mentioned in the treaty two ships alone the bonaventure and the good hope had been claimed by the english and it was agreed that the claim should be prosecuted by the ordinary course of justice the states had consigned a sum of money in case the cause should be decided against them but the matter was still independence carey who was entrusted by the proprietors with the management of the lawsuit for the bonaventure had resolved to accept of thirty thousand pounds which were offered him but was hindered by downing who told him that the claim was a matter of state between the two nations not a concern of private persons these circumstances give us no favorable idea of the justice of the english pretensions charles confined not himself to memorials and remonstrances sir robert holmes was secretly dispatched with a squadron of twenty-two ships to the coast of africa he not only expelled the dutch from cape course to which the english had some pretensions he likewise seized the dutch settlements of cape verde and the isle of gory together with several ships trading on that coast and having sailed to america he possessed himself of nova belgia since called new york a territory which james i had given by patent to the earl of stirling but which had never been planted but by the hollanders when the states complained of these hostile measures the king unwilling to avow what he could not well justify pretended to be totally ignorant of holmes's enterprise he likewise confined that admiral to the tower but some time after released him the dutch finding that their applications for redress were likely to be eluded and that a ground of quarrel was industriously sought for by the english began to arm with diligence they even exerted with some precipitation an act of vigor which hastened on the rupture sir john lawson and de ruyter had been sent with combined squadrons into the mediterranean in order to chastise the piratical states on the coast of barbary and the time of their separation and return was now approaching the state secretly dispatched orders to de ruyter that he should take in provisions at cadiz and sailing towards the coast of guinea should retaliate on the english and put the dutch in possession of those settlements whence holmes had expelled them de ruyter having a considerable force on board met with no opposition in guinea all the new acquisitions of the english except cape course were recovered from them they were even dispossessed of some old settlements such of their ships as fell into his hands were seized by de ruyter that admiral sailed next to america he attacked barbados but was repulsed he afterwards committed hostilities on long island meanwhile the english preparations for war were advancing with vigor and industry the king had received no supplies from parliament but by his own funds and credit he was enabled to equip a fleet the city of london lent him one hundred thousand pounds the spirit of the nation seconded his armaments he went himself from port to port inspecting with great diligence and encouraging the work and in a little time the english navy was put in a formidable condition eight hundred thousand pounds are said to have been expended on this armament when lawson arrived and communicated his suspicion of de ruyter's enterprise orders were issued for seizing all dutch ships and one hundred and thirty-five fell into the hands of the english these were not declared prizes till afterwards when war was proclaimed the parliament when it met granted a supply the largest by far that had ever been given to a king of england yet scarcely sufficient for the present undertaking near two millions and a half were voted to be levied by quarterly payments in three years the avidity of the merchants together with the great prospect of success had animated the whole nation against the dutch a great alteration was made this session in the method of taxing the clergy in almost all the other monarchies of europe the assemblies whose consent was formerly requisite to the enacting of laws were composed of three estates the clergy the nobility 
and the commonalty, which formed so many members of the political body, of which the king was considered as the head. In England, too, the Parliament was always represented as consisting of three estates, but their separation was never so distinct as in other kingdoms. A convocation, however, had usually sitten at the same time with the Parliament, though they possessed not a negative voice in the passing of laws, and assumed no other temporal power than that of imposing taxes on the clergy. By reason of ecclesiastical preferments which he could bestow, the king's influence over the church was more considerable than over the laity, so that the subsidies granted by the convocation were commonly greater than those which were voted by Parliament. The church, therefore, was not displeased to depart tacitly from the right of taxing herself and allow the commons to lay impositions on ecclesiastical revenues, as on the rest of the kingdom. In recompense, two subsidies, which the convocation had formerly granted, were remitted and the parochial clergy were allowed to vote at elections. Thus the Church of England made a barter of power for profit. Their convocations, having become insignificant to the crown, have been much disused of late years. The Dutch saw with utmost regret a war approaching whence they might dread the most fatal consequences, but which afforded no prospect of advantage. They tried every art of negotiation before they would come to extremities. Their measures were at that time directed by John de Witt, a minister equally eminent for greatness of mind, for capacity, and for integrity. Though moderate in his private deportment, he knew how to adopt in his public councils that magnanimity which suits the minister of a great state. It was ever his maxim that no independent government should yield to another any evident point of reason or equity and that all such concessions, so far from preventing war, served to no other purpose than to provoke fresh claims and insults. By his management a spirit of union was preserved in all the provinces. Great sums were levied, and a navy was equipped, composed of larger ships than the Dutch had ever built before, and able to cope with the fleet of England. As soon as certain intelligence arrived of de Ruyter's enterprises, Charles declared war against the states. His fleet, consisting of one hundred and fourteen sail, besides fire-ships and catches, was commanded by the Duke of York, and under him by Prince Rupert and the Earl of Sandwich. It had about twenty-two thousand men on board. Obdem, who was admiral of the Dutch navy, of nearly equal force, declined not to combat. In the heat of action, when engaged in close fight with the Duke of York, Obdem's ship blew up. This accident much discouraged the Dutch, who fled towards their own coast. Tromp alone, son of the famous admiral killed during the former war, bravely sustained with his squadron the efforts of the English, and protected the rear of his countrymen. The vanquished had nineteen ships sunk and taken. The victors lost only one. Sir John Lawson died soon after of his wounds. It is affirmed, and with an appearance of reason, that this victory might have been rendered more complete had not orders been issued to slacken sail by Brunker, one of the Duke's bedchamber, who pretended authority from his master. The Duke disclaimed the orders, but Brunker never was sufficiently punished for his temerity. It is allowed, however, that the Duke behaved with great bravery during the action. He was long in the thickest of the fire. The Earl of Falmouth, Lord Muscarry, and Mr. Boyle were killed by one shot at his side, and covered him all over with their brains and gore. And it is not likely that, in a pursuit, where even persons of inferior station and of the most cowardly disposition acquire courage, a commander should feel his spirits to flag Anna should turn from the back of an enemy whose face he had not been afraid to encounter. This disaster threw the Dutch into consternation and determined De Witt, who was the soul of their councils, to exert his military capacity in order to support the declining courage of his countrymen. He went on board the fleet, which he took under his command, and he soon remedied all those disorders which had been occasioned by the late misfortune. The genius of this man was of the most extensive nature. He quickly became as much master of naval affairs as if he had from his infancy been educated in them and he even made improvements in some parts of pilotage and sailing, beyond what men expert in those arts had ever been able to attain. The misfortunes of the Dutch determined their allies to act for their assistance and support. The King of France was engaged in a defensive alliance with the States, 
but as his naval force was yet in its infancy, he was extremely averse at that time from entering into a war with so formidable a power as England. He long tried to mediate a peace between the states, and for that purpose sent an embassy to London, which returned without effecting anything. Lord Hollis, the English ambassador at Paris, endeavored to draw over Lewis to the side of England, and, in his master's name, made him the most tempting offers. Charles was content to abandon all the Spanish low countries to the French, without pretending to a foot of ground for himself, provided Lewis would allow him to pursue his advantages against the Dutch. But the French monarch, though the conquest of that valuable territory was the chief object of his ambition, rejected the offer as contrary to his interests. He thought that if the English had once established an uncontrollable dominion over the sea and over commerce, they would soon be able to render his acquisitions a dear purchase to him. When De Leon, the French secretary, assured Van Buningen, ambassador of the States, that this offer had been pressed on his master during six months, I can readily believe it, replied the Dutchman. I am sensible that it is the interest of England. Such were the established maxims at that time with regard to the interest of princes. It must, however, be allowed that the politics of Charles in making this offer were not a little hazardous. The extreme weakness of Spain would have rendered the French conquest easy and infallible. But the vigor of the Dutch, it might be foreseen, would make the success of the English much more precarious. And even were the naval force of Holland totally annihilated, the acquisition of the Dutch commerce to England could not be relied on as a certain consequence nor is trade a constant attendant of power but depends on many other and some of them very delicate circumstances though the king of france was resolved to support the hollanders in that unequal contest in which they were engaged he yet protracted his declaration and employed the time in naval preparations both in the ocean and the mediterranean the king of Denmark, meanwhile, was resolved not to remain an idle spectator of the contest between the maritime powers. The part which he acted was the most extraordinary. He made a secret agreement with Charles to seize all the Dutch ships in his harbors, and to share the spoils with the English, provided they would assist him in executing this measure. In order to increase his prey, he perfidiously invited the Dutch to take shelter in his ports, and accordingly the East India fleet very richly laden, had put into Bergen. Sandwich, who now commanded the English navy, the Duke having gone ashore, dispatched Sir Thomas Tittleman with a squadron to attack them. But whether from the King of Denmark's delay in sending orders to the governor, or, what is more probable, from his avidity in endeavoring to engross the whole booty, the English admiral, though he behaved with great bravery, failed of his purpose. The Danish governor fired upon him, and the Dutch, having had leisure to fortify themselves, made a gallant resistance. End of section five, chapter sixty four, part one. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N dot I can voice dot com. Section 6 of Volume 1 F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1 F, Section 6, Chapter 64, Part 2 The King of Denmark, seemingly ashamed of his conduct, concluded with Sir Gilbert Talbot, the English envoy, an offensive alliance against the States, and at the very same time his resident at The Hague, by his orders, concluded an offensive alliance against England. To this latter alliance he adhered, probably from jealousy of the increasing naval power of England and he seized and confiscated all the English ships in his harbors. This was a sensible check to the advantages which Charles had obtained over the Dutch. Not only a blow was given to the English commerce, the King of Denmark's naval force was also considerable, and threatened every moment a conjunction with the Hollanders. That prince stipulated to assist his ally with a fleet of thirty sail, 
and he received in return a yearly subsidy of one million five hundred thousand crowns, of which three hundred thousand were paid by France. The king endeavored to counterbalance these confederacies by acquiring new friends and allies. He had dispatched Sir Richard Fanshawe into Spain, who met with a very cold reception. That monarchy was sunk into a state of weakness, and was menaced with an invasion from France, yet could not any motive prevail with Philip to enter into cordial friendship with England. Charles's alliance with Portugal, the detention of Jamaica and Tangiers, the sale of Dunkirk to the French, all these offenses sunk so deep in the mind of the Spanish monarch, that no motive of interest was sufficient to outweigh them. The Bishop of Munster was the only ally that Charles could acquire. This prelate, a man of restless enterprise and ambition, had entertained a violent animosity against the states, and he was easily engaged, by the promise of subsidies from England, to make an incursion on that republic. With a tumultuary army of near twenty thousand men, he invaded her territories, and met with weak resistance. The land forces of the states were as feeble and ill-governed as their fleets were gallant and formidable. But after his committing great ravages in several of the provinces, a stop was put to the progress of this warlike prelate. He had not military skill sufficient to improve the advantages which fortune had put into his hands. The king of France sent a body of six thousand men to oppose him. Subsidies were not regularly remitted him from England, and many of his troops deserted for want of pay. The elector of Brandenburg threatened him with an invasion in his own state, and on the whole he was glad to conclude a peace under the mediation of France. On the first surmise of his intentions, Sir William Temple was sent from London with money to fix him in his former alliance, but found that he arrived too late. The Dutch, encouraged by all these favorable circumstances, continued resolute to exert themselves to the utmost in their own defense. De Ruyter, their great admiral, was arrived from his expedition to Guinea. Their Indian fleet was come home in safety. Their harbors were crowded with merchant ships. Faction at home was appeased. The young Prince of Orange had put himself under the tuition of the States of Holland, and of De Witt, their pensionary, who executed his trust with honor and fidelity. And the animosity which the Hollanders entertained against the attack of the English, so unprovoked as they thought it, made them thirst for revenge, and hope for better success in their next enterprise. Such vigor was exerted in the common cause, that in order to man the fleet, all merchant ships were prohibited to sail, and even the fisheries were suspended. The English likewise continued in the same disposition, though another more grievous calamity had joined itself to that of war. The plague had broken out in London, and that with such violence, as to cut off in a year near ninety thousand inhabitants. The king was obliged to summon the Parliament at Oxford. A good agreement still subsisted between the king and Parliament. They, on their part, unanimously voted him the supply demanded, twelve hundred and fifty thousand pounds, to be levied in two years by monthly assessments. And he, to gratify them, passed the Five Mile Act, which has given occasion to grievous and not unjust complaints. The church, under pretense of guarding monarchy against its inveterate enemies, persevered in the project of wreaking her own enmity against the nonconformists. It was enacted that no dissenting teacher, who took not the non-resistance oath above mentioned, should, except upon the road, come within five miles of any corporation or of any place where he had preached after the act of oblivion. The penalty was a fine of fifty pounds and six months' imprisonment. By ejecting the nonconforming clergy from their churches, and prohibiting all separate congregations, they had been rendered incapable of gaining any livelihood by their spiritual profession, and now, under color of removing them from places where their influence might be dangerous, an expedient was fallen upon to deprive them of all means of subsistence. Had not the spirit of the nation undergone a change, these violences were preludes to the most furious persecution. However prevalent the hierarchy, this law did not pass without opposition. Besides several peers, attached to the old Parliament party, Southampton himself, though Clarendon's great friend, expressed his disapprobation of these measures. 
But the church party, not discouraged with this opposition, introduced into the House of Commons a bill for imposing the oath of non-resistance on the whole nation. It was rejected only by three voices. The Parliament, after a short session, was prorogued. After France had declared war, England was evidently overmatched in force. Yet she possessed this advantage by her situation, that she lay between the fleets of her enemies, and might be able, by speedy and well-concerted operations, to prevent their junction. But such was the unhappy conduct of her commanders, or such the want of intelligence in her ministers, that this circumstance turned rather to her prejudice. Lewis had given orders to the Duke of Beaufort, his admiral, to sail from Toulon, and the French squadron under his command, consisting of above forty sail, was now commonly supposed to be entering the channel. The Dutch fleet, to the number of seventy-six sail, was at sea, under the command of de Ruyter and Tromp, in order to join him. The Duke of Albemarle and Prince Rupert commanded the English fleet, which exceeded not seventy-four sail. Albemarle, who, from his successes under the protector, had too much learned to despise the enemy, proposed to detach Prince Rupert with twenty ships, in order to oppose the Duke of Beaufort. Sir George Askew, well acquainted with the bravery and conduct of de Ruyter, protested against the temerity of this resolution, but Albemarle's authority prevailed. The remainder of the English set sail to give battle to the Dutch, who, seeing the enemy advance quickly upon them, cut their cables and prepared for the combat. The battle that ensued is one of the most memorable that we read of in story, whether we consider its long duration or the desperate courage with which it was fought. Albemarle made here some atonement by his valor for the rashness of the attempt. No youth, animated by glory and ambitious hopes, could exert himself more than did this man, who was now in the decline of life, and who had reached the summit of honors. We shall not enter minutely into particulars. It will be sufficient to mention the chief events of each day's engagement. In the first day, Sir William Berkeley, vice-admiral, leading the van, fell into the thickest of the enemy, was overpowered, and his ship taken. He himself was found dead in his cabin, all covered with blood. The English had the weather gauge of the enemy. But as the wind blew so hard that they could not use their lower tier, they derived but small advantage from this circumstance. The Dutch shot, however, fell chiefly on their sails and rigging, and few ships were sunk or much damaged. Chain-shot was at that time a new invention, commonly attributed to De Witt. Sir John Harmon exerted himself extremely on this day. The Dutch Admiral Everts was killed in engaging him. Darkness parted the combatants. The second day the wind was somewhat fallen, and the combat became more steady and more terrible. The English now found that the greatest valor cannot compensate the superiority of numbers against an enemy who is well conducted and who is not defective in courage. De Ruyter and Van Tromp, rivals in glory and enemies from faction, exerted themselves in emulation of each other, and de Ruyter had the advantage of disengaging and saving his antagonist, who had been surrounded by the English and was in the most imminent danger. Sixteen fresh ships joined the Dutch fleet during the action, and the English were so shattered that their fighting ships were reduced to twenty-eight, and they found themselves obliged to retreat towards their own coast. The Dutch followed them, and were on the point of renewing the combat, when a calm, which came a little before night, prevented the engagement. Next morning the English were obliged to continue their retreat, and a proper disposition was made for that purpose. The shattered ships were ordered to stretch ahead, and sixteen of the most entire followed them in good order, and kept the enemy in awe. Albemarle himself closed the rear, and presented an undaunted countenance to his victorious foes. The Earl of Ossory, son of Ormond, a gallant youth, who sought honor and experience in every action throughout Europe, was then on board the Admiral. Albemarle confessed to him his intention rather to blow up his ship and perish gloriously than yield to the enemy. Ossory applauded this desperate resolution. About two o'clock the Dutch had come up with their enemy and were ready to renew the fight, when a new fleet was descried from the south, crowding all their sail to reach the scene of action. The Dutch flattered themselves that Beaufort was arrived to cut off the retreat of the vanquished, the English hoped that Prince Rupert had come to turn the scale of action. 
Albemarle, who had received intelligence of the prince's approach, bent his course towards him. Unhappily, Sir George Askew, in a ship of a hundred guns, the largest in the fleet, stuck on the Galloper Sands, and could receive no assistance from his friends, who were hastening to join the reinforcement. He could not even reap the consolation of perishing with honor, and revenging his death on his enemies. They were preparing fire-ships to attack him, and he was obliged to strike. The English sailors, seeing the necessity, with the utmost indignation, surrendered themselves prisoners. Albemarle and Prince Rupert were now determined to face the enemy, and next morning the battle began afresh, with more equal force than ever, and with equal valor. After long cannonading, the fleets came to a close combat, which was continued with great violence, till parted by a mist. The English retired first into their harbors. Though the English, by their obstinate courage, reaped the chief honor in this engagement, it is somewhat uncertain who obtained the victory. The Hollanders took a few ships, and having some appearances of advantage, expressed their satisfaction by all the signs of triumph and rejoicing. But as the English fleet was repaired in a little time, and put to sea more formidable than ever, together with many of those ships which the Dutch had boasted to have burned or destroyed, all Europe saw that those two brave nations were engaged in a contest which was not likely, on either side, to prove decisive. It was in conjunction alone of the French that could give a decisive superiority to the Dutch. In order to facilitate this conjunction, de Ruyter, having repaired his fleet, posted himself at the mouth of the Thames. The English, under Prince Rupert and Albemarle, were not long in coming to the attack. The numbers of each fleet amounted to about eighty sail, and the valor and experience of the commanders, as well as of the seamen, rendered the engagement fierce and obstinate. Sir Thomas Allen, who commanded the white squadron of the English, attacked the Dutch van, which he entirely routed, and he killed three admirals who commanded it. Van Tromp engaged Sir Jeremy Smith, and during the heat of action, he was separated from de Ruyter and the main body, whether by accident or design was never certainly known. De Ruyter, with conduct and valor, maintained the combat against the main body of the English, and though overpowered by numbers, kept his station till night ended the engagement. Next day, finding the Dutch fleet scattered and discouraged, his high spirit submitted to a retreat, which he had conducted with such skill as to render it equally honorable to himself as the greatest victory. Full of indignation, however, at yielding the superiority to the enemy, he frequently exclaimed, My God, what a wretch I am! Among so many thousand bullets is there not one to put an end to my miserable life? One De Witt, his son-in-law, who stood near, exhorted him, since he sought death, to turn upon the English, and render his life a dear purchase to the victors. But De Ruyter esteemed it more worthy a brave man to persevere to the uttermost, and as long as possible to render service to his country. All that night and next day the English pressed upon the rear of the Dutch, and it was chiefly by redoubled efforts of de Ruyter that the latter saved themselves in their harbors. The loss sustained by the Hollanders in this action was not very considerable, but as violent animosities had broken out between the two admirals, who engaged all the officers on one side or other, the consternation which took place was great among the provinces. Tromp's commission was at last taken from him, but though several captains had misbehaved, they were so effectually protected by their friends in the magistracy of the towns that most of them escaped punishment, and many were still continued in their commands. The English now rode incontestable masters of the sea, and insulted the Dutch in their harbors. A detachment under Holmes was sent into the road of Vlie, and burned a hundred and forty merchantmen, two men of war, together with Branderus, a large and rich village on the coast. The Dutch merchants, who lost by this enterprise, uniting themselves to the Orange faction, exclaimed against an administration which, they pretended, had brought such disgrace and ruin on their country. None but the firm and intrepid mind of De Witt could have supported itself under such a complication of calamities. The King of France, apprehensive that the Dutch would sink under their misfortunes, at least that De Witt, his friend, might be dispossessed of the administration, hastened the advance of the duke of beaufort the dutch fleet likewise was again equipped and under the command of de ruyter 
cruised near the Straits of Dover. Prince Rupert, with the English navy, now stronger than ever, came full sail upon them. The Dutch admiral thought proper to decline the combat, and retired into St. John's Road near Boulogne. Here he sheltered himself, both from the English and from a furious storm which arose. Prince Rupert, too, was obliged to retire to St. Helens, where he stayed some time, in order to repair the damages which he had sustained. Meanwhile the Duke of Beaufort proceeded up the channel, and passed the English fleet unperceived, but he did not find the Dutch as he expected. De Ruyter had been seized with a fever. Many of the chief officers had fallen into sickness. A contagious distemper was spread through the fleet, and the states thought it necessary to recall them into their harbors, before the enemy should be refitted. The French king, anxious for his navy, which with so much care and industry he had so lately built, dispatched orders to Beaufort to make the best of his way to Brest. That admiral had again the good fortune to pass the English. One ship alone, the Ruby, fell into the hands of the enemy. While the war continued without any decisive success on either side, a calamity happened in London which threw the people into great consternation. Fire, breaking out in a baker's house near the bridge, spread itself on all sides with such rapidity that no efforts could extinguish it till it laid in ashes a considerable part of the city. The inhabitants, without being able to provide effectually for their relief, were reduced to be spectators of their own ruin, and were pursued from street to street by the flames, which unexpectedly gathered round them. Three days and nights did the fire advance, and it was only by the blowing up of houses that it was at last extinguished. The king and duke used their utmost endeavors to stop the progress of the flames, but all their industry was unsuccessful. About four hundred streets and thirteen thousand houses were reduced to ashes. The causes of this calamity were evident. The narrow streets of London, the houses built entirely of wood, the dry season, and a violent east wind which blew. These were so many concurring circumstances which rendered it easy to assign the reason of the destruction that ensued. But the people were not satisfied with this obvious account. Prompted by blind rage, some ascribed the guilt to the Republicans, others to the Catholics, though it is not easy to conceive how the burning of London could serve the purposes of either party. As the Papists were the chief objects of public detestation, the rumor which threw the guilt on them was more favorably received by the people. No proof, however, or even presumption, after the strictest inquiry by a committee of Parliament, ever appeared to authorize such a calumny. Yet in order to give countenance to the popular prejudice, the inscription, engraved by authority on the monument, ascribed this calamity to that hated sect. This clause was erased by order of King James when he came to the throne, but after the revolution it was replaced. So credulous, as well as obstinate, are the people in believing everything which flatters their prevailing passion. The fire of London, though at the time a great calamity, has proved in the issue beneficial both to the city and the kingdom. The city was rebuilt in a very little time, and care was taken to make the streets wider and more regular than before. A discretionary power was assumed by the king to regulate the distribution of the buildings, and to forbid the use of lath and timber, the materials of which the houses were formerly composed. The necessity was so urgent and the occasion so extraordinary, that no exceptions were taken at an exercise of authority which otherwise might have been deemed illegal. Had the king been enabled to carry his power still further, and made the houses be rebuilt with perfect regularity and entirely upon one plan, he had much contributed to the convenience as well as the embellishment of the city. Great advantages, however, have resulted from the alterations, though not carried to the full length. London became much more healthy after the fire. The plague, which used to break out with great fury twice or thrice every century, and indeed was always lurking in some corner or other of the city, has scarcely ever appeared since that calamity. End of section six, chapter sixty four, part two. Recording by Jim Dennison, J I M D E N I S O N dot I can voice dot com. Section seven of volume one F of 
History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1 F, Section 7, Chapter 64, Part 3. The Parliament met soon after, and gave the sanction of law to those regulations made by royal authority, as well as appointed commissioners for deciding all such questions of property as might arise from the fire. They likewise voted a supply of one million eight hundred thousand pounds to be levied partly by a poll bill partly by assessments. Though their inquiry brought out no proofs which could fix on the papist the burning of London, the general aversion against that sect still prevailed, and complaints were made, probably without much foundation, of its dangerous increase. Charles, at the desire of the commons, issued a proclamation for the banishment of all priests and Jesuits, but the bad execution of this, as well as of former edicts, destroyed all confidence in his sincerity whenever he pretended an aversion towards the catholic religion whether suspicions of this nature had diminished the king's popularity is uncertain but it appears that the supply was voted much later than charles expected or even than the public necessities seemed to require the intrigues of the duke of buckingham a man who wanted only steadiness to render him extremely dangerous had somewhat embarrassed the measures of the court, and this was the first time that the king found any considerable reason to complain of a failure of confidence in this House of Commons. The rising symptoms of ill-humor tended, no doubt, to quicken the steps which were already making towards a peace with foreign enemies. Charles began to be sensible that all the ends for which the war had been undertaken were likely to prove entirely abortive. The Dutch, even when single, had defended themselves with vigor, and were every day improving in their military skill and preparations. Though their trade had suffered extremely, their extensive credit enabled them to levy great sums, and while the seamen of England loudly complained of want of pay, the Dutch navy was regularly supplied with money, and everything requisite for its subsistence. As two powerful kings now supported them, every place, from the extremity of Norway to the coast of Bayonne, was become hostile to the English. And Charles, neither fond of action nor stimulated by any violent ambition, earnestly sought for means of restoring tranquillity to his people, disgusted with a war which, being joined with the plague and fire, had proved so fruitless and destructive. The first advances towards an accommodation were made by England. When the king sent for the body of Sir William Berkeley, he insinuated to the states his desire of peace on reasonable terms, and their answer corresponded in the same amicable intentions. Charles, however, to maintain the appearance of superiority, still insisted that the state should treat at London, and they agreed to make him this compliment so far as concerned themselves but being engaged in alliance with two crowned heads they could not they said prevail with these to depart in that respect from their dignity on a sudden the king went so far on the other side as to offer the sending of ambassadors to the hague but this proposal which seemed honorable to the dutch was meant only to divide and distract them by affording the english an opportunity to carry on cobbles with the disaffected party the offer was therefore rejected and conferences were secretly held in the queen mother's apartments at paris where the pretensions of both parties were discussed the dutch made equitable proposals either that all things should be restored to the same condition in which they stood before the war or that both parties should continue in possession of their present acquisitions. Charles accepted of the latter proposal, and almost everything was adjusted, except the disputes with regard to the Isle of Polaron. 
This island lies in the East Indies, and was formerly valuable for its produce of spices. The English had been masters of it, but were dispossessed at the time when the violences were committed against them at Amboyna. Cromwell had stipulated to have it restored, and the Hollanders, having first entirely destroyed all the spice trees, maintained that they had executed the treaty, but that the English had been anew expelled during the course of the war. Charles renewed his pretensions to this island, and as the reasons on both sides began to multiply, and seemed to require a long discussion, it was agreed to transfer the treaty to some other place, and Charles made choice of Breda. Lord Hollis and Henry Coventry were the English ambassadors. They immediately desired that a suspension of arms should be agreed to, till the several claims should be adjusted. But this proposal, seemingly so natural, was rejected by the credit of De Witt. That penetrating and active minister, thoroughly acquainted with the characters of princes and the situation of affairs, had discovered an opportunity of striking a blow, which might at once restore to the Dutch the honor lost during the war, and severely revenge those injuries which he ascribed to the wanton ambition and injustice of the English. Whatever projects might have been formed by Charles for secreting the money granted him by Parliament, he had hitherto failed in his intention. The expenses of such vast armaments had exhausted all the supplies, and even a great debt was contracted to the seamen. The king, therefore, was resolved to save, as far as possible, the last supply of one million eight hundred thousand pounds, and to employ it for payment of his debts, as well those which had been occasioned by the war, as those which he had formerly contracted. He observed that the Dutch had been with great reluctance forced into the war, and that the events of it were not such as to inspire them with great desire of its continuance. The French, he knew, had been engaged into hostilities by no other motive than that of supporting their ally, and were now more desirous than ever of putting an end to the quarrel. The differences between the parties were so inconsiderable that the conclusion of the peace appeared infallible, and nothing but forms, at least some vain points of honor, seemed to remain for the ambassadors at Breda to discuss. In this situation, Charles, moved by an ill-timed frugality, remitted his preparations, and exposed England to one of the greatest affronts which it has ever received. Two small squadrons alone were equipped, and during a war with such potent and martial enemies, everything was left almost in the same situation as in times of the most profound tranquillity. De Witt protracted the negotiations at Breda and hastened the naval preparations. The Dutch fleet appeared in the Thames, under the command of De Ruyter, and threw the English into the utmost consternation. A chain had been drawn across the river Medway, some fortifications had been added to Sheerness and Upnor Castle, but all these preparations were unequal to the present necessity. Sheerness was soon taken, nor could it be saved by the valor of Sir Edward Sprague, who defended it. Having the advantage of a spring tide and an easterly wind, the Dutch pressed on and broke the chain, though fortified by some ships, which had been there sunk by orders of the Duke of Albemarle. They burned the three ships which lay to guard the chain, the Matthias, the Unity, and the Charles V. After damaging several vessels and possessing themselves of the hull of the Royal Charles, which the English had burned, they advanced with six men of war and five fire ships as far as Upnor Castle, where they burned the Royal Oak, the Loyal London, and the Great James. Captain Douglas, who commanded on board the Royal Oak, perished in the flames, though he had an easy opportunity of escaping. Never was it known, he said, that a Douglas had left his post without orders. The Hollanders fell down the Medway without receiving any considerable damage, and it was apprehended that they might next tide sail up the Thames, and extend their hostilities even to the Bridge of London. Nine ships were sunk at Woolwich, four at Blackwall, Platforms were raised in many places, furnished with artillery. 
The train bands were called out, and every place was in a violent agitation. The Dutch sailed next to Portsmouth, where they made a fruitless attempt. They met with no better success at Plymouth. They insulted Harwich. They sailed again up the Thames as far as Tilbury, where they were repulsed. The whole coast was in alarm, and had the French thought proper at this time to join the Dutch fleet and to invade England, consequences the most fatal might justly have been apprehended. But Lewis had no intention to push the victory to such extremities. His interest required that a balance should be kept between the two maritime powers, not that an uncontrolled superiority should be given to either. Great indignation prevailed amongst the English to see an enemy, whom they regarded as inferior, whom they had expected totally to subdue, and over whom they had gained many honorable advantages, now of a sudden ride undisputed masters of the ocean, burn their ships in their very harbors, fill every place with confusion, and strike a terror into the capital itself. But though the cause of all these disasters could be ascribed neither to bad fortune, to the misconduct of admirals, nor to the ill behavior of seamen, but solely to the avarice, at least to the improvidence, of the government, no dangerous symptoms of discontent appeared, and no attempt for an insurrection was made by any of those numerous sectaries who had been so openly branded for their rebellious principles, and who, upon that supposition, had been treated with such severity. In the present distress, two expedients were embraced. An army of twelve thousand men was suddenly levied, and the Parliament, though it lay under prorogation, was summoned to meet. The houses were very thin, and the only vote which the Commons passed was an address for breaking the army, which was complied with. This expression of jealousy showed the court what they might expect from that assembly, and it was thought more prudent to prorogue them till next winter. But the signing of the treaty at Breda extricated the king from his present difficulties. The English ambassadors received orders to recede from those demands, which, however frivolous in themselves, could not now be relinquished without acknowledging a superiority in the enemy. Polaron remained with the Dutch. Satisfaction for the ships, Bonaventure, and Good Hope, the pretended grounds of the quarrel, were no longer insisted on. Acadie was yielded to the French. The acquisition of New York, a settlement so important by its situation, was the chief advantage which the English reaped from a war, in which the national character of bravery had shone out with luster, but where the misconduct of the government especially in the conclusion, had been no less apparent. To appease the people by some sacrifice seemed requisite before the meeting of Parliament, and the prejudices of the nation pointed out the victim. The Chancellor was at this time much exposed to the hatred of the public, and every party which divided the nation. All the numerous sectaries regarded him as their determined enemy and ascribed to his advice and influence those persecuting laws to which they had lately been exposed. The Catholics knew that while he retained any authority, all their credit with the king and the duke would be entirely useless to them, nor must they ever expect any favor or indulgence. Even the royalists, disappointed in their sanguine hopes of preferment, threw a great load of envy on Clarendon, into whose hands the king seemed at first to have resigned the whole power of government. The sale of Dunkirk, the bad payment of the seamen, the disgrace at Chatham, the unsuccessful conclusion of the war, all these misfortunes were charged on the Chancellor, who, though he had ever opposed the rupture with Holland, thought it still his duty to justify what he could not prevent. A building, likewise, of more expense and magnificence than his slender fortune could afford, being unwarily undertaken by him, much exposed him to public reproach, as if he had acquired great riches by corruption. The populace gave it commonly the appellation of Dunkirk House. The king himself, who had always more revered than loved the chancellor, was now totally estranged from him. Amidst the dissolute manners of the court, 
that minister still maintained an inflexible dignity and would not submit to any condescensions which he deemed unworthy of his age and character buckingham a man of profligate morals happy in his talent for ridicule but exposed his own conduct to all the ridicule which he threw on others still made him the object of his raillery and gradually lessened in the king that regard which he bore to his minister when any difficulties arose either for want of power or money the blame was thrown on him who it was believed had carefully at the restoration checked all lavish concessions to the king and what perhaps touched charles more nearly he found in clarendon it is said obstacles to his pleasures as well as to his ambition the king disgusted with the homely person of his consort and desirous of having children had hearkened to proposals of obtaining a divorce on pretence either of her being pre-engaged to another or having made a vow of chastity before her marriage he was further stimulated by his passion for mrs stuart daughter of a scotch gentleman a lady of great beauty and whose virtue he had hitherto found impregnable but clarendon apprehensive of the consequences attending a disputed title and perhaps anxious for the succession of his own grandchildren engaged the duke of richmond to marry mrs stuart and thereby put an end to the king's hopes it is pretended that charles never forgave this disappointment when politics therefore and inclination both concurred to make the king sacrifice clarington to popular prejudices the memory of his past services was not able any longer to delay his fall the great seal was taken from him and given to sir orlando bridgeman by the title of lord keeper southampton the treasurer was now dead who had persevered to the utmost in his attachments to the chancellor the last time he appeared at the council table he exerted his friendship with a vigor which neither age nor infirmities could abate this man said he speaking of clarendon is a true protestant and an honest englishman and while he enjoys power we are secure of our laws liberties and religion i dread the consequences of his removal but the fall of the chancellor was not sufficient to gratify the malice of his enemies his total ruin was resolved on the duke of york in vain exerted his interest in behalf of his father-in-law both prince and people united in promoting that violent measure and no means were thought so proper for ingratiating the court with a parliament which had so long been governed by that very minister who was now to be the victim of their prejudices some popular acts paved the way for the session and the parliament in their first address gave the king thanks for these instances of his goodness and among the rest they took care to mention his dismission of clarendon the king in reply assured the houses that he would never again employ that nobleman in any public office whatsoever immediately the charge against him was opened in the house of commons by mr seymour afterwards sir edward and consisted of seventeen articles the house without examining particulars further than hearing general affirmations that all would be proved immediately voted his impeachment many of the articles we know to be either false or frivolous and such of them as we are less acquainted with we may fairly presume to be no better grounded his advising the sale of dunkirk seems the heaviest and truest part of the charge but a mistake in judgment allowing it to be such where there appear no symptoms of corruption or bad intentions it would be very hard to impute as a crime to any minister the king's necessities which occasioned that measure cannot with any appearance of reason be charged on clarendon and chiefly proceeded from the over frugal maxims of the parliament itself in not granting the proper supplies to the crown when the impeachment was carried up to the peers as it contained an accusation of treason in general without specifying any particulars it seemed not a sufficient ground for committing clarendon to custody the precedents of stratford and laud were not by reason of the violence of the times deemed a proper authority but as the commons still insisted upon his commitment 
it was necessary to appoint a free conference between the houses. The lords persevered in their resolution, and the commons voted this conduct to be an obstruction to public justice, and a precedent of evil and dangerous tendency. They also chose a committee to draw up a vindication of their own proceedings. Clarington, finding that the popular torrent, united to the violence of power, ran with impetuosity against him, and that a defense offered to such prejudiced ears would be entirely ineffectual, thought proper to withdraw. At Calais he wrote a paper addressed to the House of Lords. He there said that his fortune, which was but moderate, had been gained entirely by the lawful, avowed profits of his office, and by the voluntary bounty of the king. That, during the first years after the restoration, he had always concurred in opinion with the other counsellors, men of such reputation, that no one could entertain suspicions of their wisdom or integrity, that his credit soon declined, and however he might disapprove of some measures, he found it vain to oppose them, that his repugnance to the Dutch war, the source of all the public grievances, was always generally known, as well as his disapprobation of many unhappy steps taken in conducting it, and that, whatever pretense might be made of public offences, his real crime, that which had exasperated his powerful enemies, was his frequent opposition to exorbitant grants, which the importunity of suitors had extorted from his majesty. The lords transmitted this paper to the commons under the appellation of a libel, and by a vote of both houses it was condemned to be burned by the hands of the hangman. The Parliament next proceeded to exert their legislative power against Clarendon, and passed a bill of banishment and incapacity, which received the royal assent. He retired into France, where he lived in a private manner. He survived his banishment six years, and he employed his leisure chiefly in reducing into order the history of the civil wars, for which he had before collected materials. The performance does honor to his memory, and, except Whitlock's memorials, is the most candid account of those times composed by any contemporary author. End of section 7, chapter 64, part 3. Recording by Jim Dennison, J I M D E N I S O N dot I can voice dot com. Section 8 of Volume 1 F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. By David Hume, Volume One F, Section Eight, Chapter Sixty Four, Part Four. Clarendon was always a friend to the liberty and constitution of his country. At the commencement of the civil wars, he had entered into the late king's service and was honored with a great share in the esteem and friendship of that monarch. He was pursued with unrelenting animosity by the Long Parliament. He had shared all the fortunes and directed all the counsels of the present king during his exile. He had been advanced to the highest trust and offices after the restoration. Yet all these circumstances, which might naturally operate with such force, either on resentment, gratitude, or ambition, had no influence on his uncorrupted mind. It is said that when he first engaged in the study of law, his father exhorted him with great earnestness to shun the practice, too common in that profession, of straining every point in favor of prerogative, and perverting so useful a science to the oppression of liberty. And in the midst of these rational and virtuous counsels which he reiterated, he was suddenly seized with an apoplexy, and expired in his son's presence. This circumstance gave additional weight to the principles which he inculcated. The combination of king and subject to oppress so good a minister affords to men of opposite dispositions an equal occasion of inveighing against the ingratitude of princes or ignorance of the people. 
Charles seems never to have mitigated his resentment against Clarendon, and the national prejudices pursued him to his retreat in France. A company of English soldiers, being quartered near him, assaulted his house, broke open the doors, gave him a dangerous wound on the head, and would have proceeded to the last extremities, had not their officers, hearing of the violence, happily interposed. The next expedient which the king embraced, in order to acquire popularity, is more deserving of praise, and, had it been steadily pursued, would have probably rendered his reign happy, certainly his memory respected. It is the triple alliance of which I speak, a measure which gave entire satisfaction to the public. The glory of France, which had long been eclipsed, either by domestic factions or by the superior force of the Spanish monarchy, began now to break out with great luster, and to engage the attention of the neighboring nations. The independent power and mutinous spirit of the nobility were subdued, the popular pretensions of the Parliament restrained, the Huguenot party reduced to subjection. That extensive and fertile country, enjoying every advantage of both climate and situation, was fully peopled with ingenious and industrious inhabitants. And while the spirit of the nation discovered all the vigor and bravery requisite for great enterprises, it was tamed to an entire submission under the will of the sovereign. The sovereign who now filled the throne was well adapted, by his personal character, both to increase and to avail himself of these advantages. Louis the Fourteenth, endowed with every quality which could enchant the people, possessed many which merit the approbation of the wise. The masculine beauty of his person was embellished with a noble air. The dignity of his behavior was tempered with affability and politeness. Elegant without effeminacy addicted to pleasure without neglecting business, decent in his very vices, and beloved in the midst of arbitrary power. He surpassed all contemporary monarchs as in grandeur, so likewise in fame and glory. His ambition, regulated by prudence, not by justice, had carefully provided every means of conquest, and before he put himself in motion, he seemed to have absolutely ensured success. His finances were brought into order, a naval power created. His armies increased and disciplined, magazines and military stores provided. And though the magnificence of his court was supported beyond all former example, so regular was the economy observed, and so willingly did the people, now enriched by arts and commerce, submit to multiplied taxes that his military force much exceeded what in any preceding age had ever been employed by any European monarch. The sudden decline and almost total fall of the Spanish monarchy opened an inviting field to so enterprising a prince, and seemed to promise him easy and extensive conquests. The other nations of Europe, feeble or ill-governed, were astonished at the greatness of his rising empire, and all of them cast their eyes towards England, as the only power that could save them from that subjection with which they seemed to be so nearly threatened. The animosity which had anciently subsisted between the English and French nations, and which had been suspended for above a century by the jealousy of Spanish greatness, began to revive and to exert itself. The glory of preserving the balance of Europe, a glory so much founded on justice and humanity, flattered the ambition of england and the people were eager to provide for their own future security by opposing the progress of so hated a rival the prospect of embracing such measures had contributed among other reasons to render the peace of breda so universally acceptable to the nation by the death of philip the fourth king of spain an inviting opportunity, and some very slender pretenses had been afforded to call forth the ambition of Louis. At the Treaty of the Pyrenees, when Louis espoused the Spanish princess, he had renounced every title of succession to every part of the Spanish monarchy, and this renunciation had been couched in the most accurate and most precise terms that language could afford. But on the death of his father-in-law, he retracted his renunciation and pretended that natural rights, depending on blood and succession, 
could not be annihilated by any extorted deed or contract. Philip had left a son, Charles the Second of Spain, but as the Queen of France was of a former marriage, she laid claim to a considerable province of the Spanish monarchy, even to the exclusion of her brother. By the customs of some parts of Brabant, a female of the first marriage was preferred to a male of a second, in succession to private inheritances, and Lewis thence inferred that his queen had acquired a right to the dominion of that important duchy. A claim of this nature was more properly supported by military force than by argument and reasoning. Lewis appeared on the frontiers of the Netherlands, with an army of forty thousand men, commanded by the best generals of the age, and provided with everything necessary for action. The Spaniards, though they might have foreseen this measure, were totally unprepared. Their towns, without magazines, fortifications, or garrisons, fell into the hands of the French king, as soon as he presented himself before them. Ath, Lyle, Tournay, Oudenard, Courtray, Chaleroy, Binch, were immediately taken, and it was visible that no force in the Low Countries was able to stop or retard the progress of the French arms. This measure, executed with such celerity and success, gave great alarm to almost every court in Europe. It had been observed with what dignity, or even haughtiness, Lewis, from the time he began to govern, had ever supported all his rights and pretensions. D'Estradus, the French ambassador, and Watville, the Spanish, having quarrelled in London on account of their claims for presidency, the French monarch was not satisfied till Spain sent to Paris a solemn embassy, and promised never more to revive such contests. Crequi, his ambassador at Rome, had met with an affront from the Pope's guards. The Pope, Alexander the Seventh, had been constrained to break his guards, to send his nephew to ask pardon, and to allow a pillar to be erected in Rome itself as a monument of his own humiliation. The King of England, too, had experienced the high spirit and unsubmitting temper of Lewis. A pretension to superiority in the English flag having been advanced, the French monarch remonstrated with such vigor, and prepared himself to resist with such courage, that Charles found it more prudent to desist from his vain and antiquated claims. The King of England, said Lewis to his ambassador, D'Estradus, may know my force, but he knows not the sentiments of my heart. Everything appears to me contemptible in comparison of glory. These measures of conduct had given strong indications of his character, but the invasion of Flanders discovered an ambition which, being supported by such overgrown power, menaced the general liberties of Europe. As no state lay nearer the danger, none was seized with more terror than the United Provinces. They were still engaged, together with France, in a war against England, and Lewis had promised them that he would take no step against Spain without previously informing them. But, contrary to this assurance, he kept a total silence, till on the very point of entering upon action. If the renunciation made at the Treaty of the Pyrenees was not valid, it was foreseen that upon the death of the King of Spain, a sickly infant, the whole monarchy would be claimed by Lewis, after which it would be vainly expected to set bounds to his pretensions. Charles, acquainted with these well-grounded apprehensions of the Dutch, had been the most obstinate in insisting on his own conditions at Breda, and by delaying to sign the treaty, had imprudently exposed himself to the signal disgrace which he received at Chatham. De Witt, sensible that a few weeks' delay would be of no consequence in the Low Countries, took this opportunity of striking an important blow, and of finishing the war with honor to himself and to his country. Negotiations, meanwhile, commenced for the saving of Flanders, but no resistance was made to the French arms. The Spanish ministers exclaimed everywhere against the flagrant injustice of Lewis's pretensions, and represented it to be the interest of every power in Europe, even more than of Spain itself, to prevent his conquest of the Low Countries. The Emperor and the German princes discovered evident symptoms of discontent, but their motions were slow and backward. The states, though terrified at the prospect of having their frontier exposed to so formidable a foe, 
saw no resource, no means of safety. England, indeed, seemed disposed to make opposition to the French, but the variable and impolitic conduct of Charles kept the Republic from making him any open advances, by which she might lose the friendship of France without acquiring any new ally. And though Louis, dreading a combination of all Europe, had offered terms of accommodation, the Dutch apprehended lest these, either from the obstinacy of the Spaniards or the ambition of the French, would never be carried into execution. Charles resolved with great prudence to take the first steps towards a confederacy. Sir William Temple, his resident at Brussels, received orders to go secretly to the Hague, and to concert with the States the means of saving the Netherlands. This man, whom philosophy had taught to despise the world, without rendering him unfit for it, was frank, open, sincere, superior to the little tricks of vulgar politicians. And meeting in De Witt with a man of the same generous and enlarged sentiments, he immediately opened his master's intentions, and pressed a speedy conclusion. A treaty was from the first negotiated between these two statesmen, with the same cordiality as if it were a private transaction between intimate companions. Deeming the interest of their country the same, they gave full scope to that sympathy of character, which disposed them to an entire reliance on each other's professions and engagements. And though jealousy against the House of Orange might inspire De Witt with an aversion to a strict union with England, he generously resolved to sacrifice all private considerations to the public service. Temple insisted on an offensive league between England and Holland, in order to oblige France to relinquish all her conquests. But De Witt told him that this measure was too bold and precipitate to be agreed to by the States. He said that the French were the old and constant allies of the Republic, and till matters came to extremities, she would never deem it prudent to abandon a friendship so well established, and rely entirely on a treaty with England, which had lately waged so cruel a war against her, that ever since the reign of Elizabeth there had been such a fluctuation in the English councils, that it was not possible, for two years together, to take any sure or certain measures with that kingdom, that though the present ministry, having entered into views so conformable to national interest, promised greater firmness and constancy, it might still be unsafe, in a business of such consequence, to put entire confidence in them, that the French monarch was young, haughty, and powerful, and if treated in so imperious a manner, would expose himself to the greatest extremities rather than submit, that it was sufficient if he could be constrained to adhere to the offers which he himself had already made, and if the remaining provinces of the Low Countries could be thereby saved from the danger with which they were at present threatened, and that the other powers in Germany and the North, whose assistance they might expect, would be satisfied with putting a stop to the French conquest, without pretending to recover the places already lost. The English minister was content to accept the terms proposed by the pensionary. Lewis had offered to relinquish all the Queen's rights, on condition of either keeping the conquests which he had made last campaign, or of receiving, in lieu of them, Franchet Comte, together with Cambrai, Eyre, and saint Omers. De Witt and Temple founded their treaty upon this proposal they agreed to offer their mediation to the contending powers, and oblige France to adhere to this alternative, and Spain to accept of it. If Spain refused, they agreed that France should not prosecute her claim by arms, but leave it entirely to England and Holland to employ force for making the terms effectual. And the remainder of the Low Countries they thenceforth guaranteed to Spain. A defensive alliance was likewise concluded between Holland and England. The articles of this confederacy were soon adjusted by such candid and able negotiators. But the greatest difficulties still remained. By the constitution of the Republic, all the towns in all the provinces must give their consent to every alliance. And besides that this formality could not be dispatched in less than two months, it was justly to be dreaded that the influence of France would obstruct the passing of the treaty in some of the smaller cities. D'Estradus, the French ambassador, a man of abilities, hearing of the league which was on the carpet, treated it lightly. 
Six weeks hence, said he, we shall speak of it. To obviate this difficulty, De Witt had the courage, for the public good, to break through the laws in so fundamental an article, and by his authority he prevailed with the States General at once to sign and ratify the League, though they acknowledged that, if that measure should displease their constituents, they risked their heads by this irregularity. After sealing, all parties embraced with great cordiality. Temple cried out, At Breda, as friends, here, as brothers. And De Witt added, that now the matter was finished, it looked like a miracle. Room had been left in the treaty for the accession of Sweden, which was soon after obtained, and thus was concluded in five days the Triple League, an event received with equal surprise and approbation by the world. Notwithstanding the unfortunate conclusion of the last war, England now appeared in her proper station, and, by this wise conduct, had recovered all her influence and credit in Europe. Temple, likewise, received great applause, but to all the compliments made him on the occasion, he modestly replied that to remove things from their center or proper element required force and labor, but that of themselves they easily returned to it. The French monarch was extremely displeased with this measure. Not only bounds were set at present to his ambition, such a barrier was also raised as seemed forever impregnable. And though his own offer was made the foundation of the treaty, he had prescribed so short a time for the acceptance of it that he still expected, from the delays and reluctance of Spain, to find some opportunity of eluding it. The court of Madrid showed equal displeasure. To relinquish any part of the Spanish provinces, in lieu of claims so apparently unjust, and these urged with such violence and haughtiness, inspired the highest disgust. Often did the Spaniards threaten to abandon entirely the low countries, rather than submit so cruel a mortification, and they endeavored, by this menace, to terrify the mediating powers into more vigorous measures for their support. But Temple and De Witt were better acquainted with the views and interests of Spain, they knew that she must still retain the Low Countries as a bond of connection with the other European powers, who alone, if her young monarch should happen to die without issue, could ensure her independency against the pretensions of France. They still urged, therefore, the terms of the Triple League, and threatened Spain with war in case of refusal. The plenipotentiaries of all the powers met at Aix-la-Chapelle. Temple was minister for England van buningen for holland dona for sweden spain at last pressed on all hands accepted the alternative offered but in her very compliance she gave strong symptoms of ill-humor and discontent it had been apparent that the hollanders entirely neglecting the honor of the spanish monarchy had been anxious only for their own security and provided they could remove lewis to a distance from their frontier were more indifferent to what progress he made in other places. Sensible of these views, the Queen Regent of Spain resolved still to keep them in an anxiety, which might for the future be the foundation of a union more intimate than they were willing at present to enter into Franche Comte, by a vigorous and well-concerted plan of the French king, had been conquered in fifteen days, during a rigorous season and in the midst of winter. She chose, therefore, to recover this province, and to abandon all the towns conquered in Flanders during the last campaign. By this means, Lewis extended his garrisons into the heart of the Low Countries, and a very feeble barrier remained to the Spanish provinces. But notwithstanding the advantages of his situation, the French monarch could entertain small hopes of ever extending his conquest on that quarter, which lay the most exposed to his ambition, and where his acquisitions were of most importance. The Triple League guaranteed the remaining provinces to Spain, and the emperor and other powers of Germany, whose interests seemed to be intimately concerned, were invited to enter into the same confederacy. Spain herself, having about this time, under the mediation of Charles, made peace on equal terms with Portugal, might be expected to exert more vigor and opposition to her haughty and triumphant rival. 
The great satisfaction expressed in England on account of the counsels now embraced by the court, promised the hearty concurrence of Parliament in every measure which could be proposed for opposition to the grandeur of France. And thus all Europe seemed to repose herself with security under the wings of that powerful confederacy which had been so happily formed for her protection. It is now time to give some account to the state of affairs in Scotland and in Ireland. End of section 8, chapter 64, part 4. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N. dot I can voice. dot com. Section 9 of Volume 1 F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1 F, Section 9, Chapter 64, Part 5. The Scottish nation, though they had never been subject to the arbitrary power of their prince, had but very imperfect notions of law and liberty, and scarcely in any age had they ever enjoyed an administration which had confined itself within the proper boundaries. By their final union alone with England, their once hated adversary, they have happily attained the experience of a government perfectly regular, and exempt from all violence and injustice. Charles, from his aversion to business, had entrusted the affairs of that country to his ministers, particularly Middleton, and these could not forbear making very extraordinary stretches of authority. There had been intercepted a letter, written by Lord Lorne to Lord Duffus, in which, a little too plainly, but very truly, he complained that his enemies had endeavored by falsehood to prepossess the king against him. But he said that he had now discovered them, had defeated them, and had gained the person, meaning the Earl of Clarendon, upon whom the chief of them depended. This letter was produced before the Parliament, and Lorne was tried upon an old tyrannical absurd law against leasing-making, by which it was rendered criminal to belie the subjects to the king, or create in him an ill opinion of them. He was condemned to die, but Charles was much displeased with the sentence, and granted him a pardon. It was carried in Parliament that twelve persons, without crime, witness, trial, or accuser, should be declared incapable of all trust or office, and to render this injustice more egregious, it was agreed, that these persons should be named by ballot, a method of voting which several republics had adopted at elections, in order to prevent faction and intrigue, but which could serve only as a cover to malice and iniquity in the inflicting of punishments. Lauderdale, Crawford, and Sir Robert Murray, among others, were incapacitated, but the king, who disapproved of this injustice, refused his assent. An act was passed against all persons who should move the king for restoring the children of those who were attainted by Parliament, an unheard-of restraint on applications for grace and mercy. No penalty was affixed, but the act was but the more violent and tyrannical on that account. The court lawyers had established it as a maxim, that the assigning of a punishment was a limitation of the crown whereas a law forbidding anything, though without a penalty, made the offenders criminal, and in that case they determined that the punishment was arbitrary, only that it could not extend to life. Middleton, as commissioner, passed this act, though he had no instructions for that purpose. An act of indemnity passed, but at the same time it was voted that all those who had offended during the late disorders should be subjected to fines and a committee of Parliament was appointed for imposing them. These proceeded without any regard to some equitable rules which the king had prescribed to them, the most obnoxious compounded secretly. 
no consideration was had either of men's riches or of the degrees of their guilt no proofs were produced inquiries were not so much as made but as fast as information was given in against any man he was marked down for a particular fine and all was transacted in a secret committee when the list was read in parliament exceptions were made to several some had been under age during the civil wars some had been abroad but it was still replied that a proper time would come when every man should be heard in his own defence the only intention it was said of setting the fines was that such persons should have no benefit by the act of indemnity unless they paid the sum demanded every one that chose to stand upon his innocence and renounce the benefit of the indemnity might do it at his peril it was well known that no one would dare so far to set at defiance so arbitrary an administration the king wrote to the council ordering them to supersede the levying of those fines but middleton found means during some time to elude these orders and at last the king obliged his ministers to compound for half the sums which had been imposed in all these transactions and in most others which passed during the present reign we still find the moderating hand of the king interposed to protect the scots from the oppressions which their own countrymen employed in the ministry were desirous of exercising over them but the chief circumstance whence were derived all the subsequent tyranny and disorders in scotland was the execution of the laws for the establishment of episcopacy a mode of government to which a great part of the nation had entertained an unsurmountable aversion the rights of patrons had for some years been abolished and the power of electing ministers had been vested in the kirk session and lay elders it was now enacted that all incumbents who had been admitted upon this title should receive a presentation from the patron and should be instituted anew by the bishop under the penalty of deprivation the more rigid presbyterians concerted measures among themselves and refused obedience they imagined that their number would protect them three hundred and fifty parishes above a third of the kingdom were at once declared vacant the western counties chiefly were obstinate in this particular new ministers were sought for all over the kingdom and no one was so ignorant or vicious as to be rejected the people who loved extremely and respected their former teachers men remarkable for the severity of their manners and their fervor in preaching were inflamed against these intruders who had obtained their livings under such invidious circumstances and who took no care by the regularity of their manners to soften the prejudices entertained against them even most of those who retained their livings by compliance fell under the imputation of hypocrisy either by their showing a disgust to the new model of ecclesiastical government which they had acknowledged or on the other hand by declaring that their former adherence to presbytery and the covenant had been the result of violence and necessity and as middleton and the new ministry indulged themselves in great riot and disorder to which the nation had been little accustomed an opinion universally prevailed that any form of religion offered by such hands must be profane and impious the people notwithstanding their discontents were resolved to give no handle against them by the least symptom of mutiny or sedition but this submissive disposition instead of procuring a mitigation of the rigors was made use of as an argument for continuing the same measures which by their vigor it was pretended had produced so prompt an obedience the king however was disgusted with the violence of middleton and he made roths commissioner in his place this nobleman was already president of the council and soon after was made lord keeper and treasurer lauderdale still continued secretary of state and commonly resided at london affairs remained in a peaceable state till the severe law was made in england against conventicles the scottish parliament imitated that violence by passing a like act a kind of high commission court was appointed by the privy council for executing this rigorous law and for the direction of ecclesiastical affairs 
But even this court, illegal as it might be deemed, was much preferable to the method next adopted. Military force was let loose by the council. Wherever the people had generally forsaken their churches, the guards were quartered throughout the country. Sir James Turner commanded them, a man whose natural ferocity of temper was often inflamed by the use of strong liquors. He went about, and received from the clergy list of those who absented themselves from church, or were supposed to frequent conventicles. Without any proof or legal conviction, he demanded a fine from them, and quartered soldiers on the supposed delinquents till he received payment. As an insurrection was dreaded during the Dutch War, new forces were levied, and entrusted to the command, of Dalziel and Drummond two officers who had served the king during the civil wars, and had afterwards engaged in the service of Russia, where they had increased the native cruelty of their disposition. A full career was given to their tyranny by the Scottish ministry. Representations were made to the king against these enormities. He seemed touched with the state of the country, and besides giving orders that the ecclesiastical commission should be discontinued, he signified his opinion that another way of proceeding was necessary for his service. The solemnity of the kings came too late to remedy the disorders. The people, inflamed with bigotry and irritated by ill usage, rose in arms. They were instigated by Guthrie, Semple, and other preachers. They surprised Turner in Dumfries, and resolved to have him put to death. But finding that his orders, which fell into their hands, were more violent than his execution of them, they spared his life. At Laneric, after many prayers, they renewed the covenant, and published their manifesto, in which they professed all submission to the king. They desired only the re-establishment of presbytery, and of their former ministers. As many gentlemen of their party had been confined on suspicion, Wallace and Learmont, two officers who had served, but in no high rank, were entrusted by the populace with the command. Their force never exceeded two thousand men, and though the country in general bore them favor, men's spirits were so subdued that the rebels could expect no further accession of numbers. Dalziel took the field to oppose their progress. Their number was now diminished to eight hundred, and these, having advanced near Edinburgh, attempted to find their way back into the west by Pentland Hills. They were attacked by the king's forces. Finding that they could not escape, they stopped their march. Their clergy endeavored to infuse courage into them. After singing some psalms, the rebels turned on the enemy, and being assisted by the advantage of the ground, they received the first charge very resolutely. But that was all the action. Immediately they fell into disorder, and fled for their lives. About forty were killed on the spot, and a hundred and thirty taken prisoners. The rest, favored by the night, and by the weariness, and even by the pity of the king's troops, made their escape. The oppressions which these people had suffered, the delusions under which they labored, and their inoffensive behavior during the insurrection, made them the objects of compassion. Yet were the king's ministers, particularly sharp, resolved to take severe vengeance. Ten were hanged on one gibbet at Edinburgh, thirty-five before their own doors in different places. These criminals might all have saved their lives if they would have renounced the covenant. The executions were going on when the king put a stop to them. He said that enough blood had already been shed and he wrote a letter to the Privy Council in which he ordered that such of the prisoners as should simply promise to obey the laws for the future should be set at liberty, and that the incorrigible should be sent to the plantations. This letter was brought by Burnet, Archbishop of Glasgow, but not being immediately delivered to the Council by Sharp, the President, one Mackail, had in the interval been put to the torture under which he expired. He seemed to die in an ecstasy of joy. Farewell, sun, moon, and stars! Farewell, world and time! Farewell, weak and frail body! Welcome, eternity! Welcome, angels and saints! 
welcome saviour of the world and welcome god the judge of all such were his last words and these animated speeches he uttered with an accent and manner which struck all the bystanders with astonishment the settlement of ireland after the restoration was a work of greater difficulty than that of england or even of scotland not only the power during the former usurpations had there been vested in the king's enemies the whole property in a manner of the kingdom had also been changed and it became necessary to redress but with as little violence as possible many grievous hardships and iniquities which were there complained of the irish catholics had in sixteen forty eight concluded a treaty with ormond the king's lieutenant in which they had stipulated pardon for their past rebellion and had engaged under certain conditions to assist the royal cause and though the violence of the priest and the bigotry of the people had prevented in a great measure the execution of this treaty yet were there many who having strictly at the hazard of their lives adhered to it seemed on that account well entitled to reap the fruits of their loyalty cromwell having without distinction expelled all the native irish from the three provinces of munster leinster and ulster had confined them to connaught and the county of clare and among those who had thus been forfeited were many whose innocence was altogether unquestionable several protestants likewise and ormond among the rest had all along opposed the irish rebellion yet having afterwards embraced the king's cause against the parliament they were all of them attainted by cromwell and there were many officers who had from the commencement of the insurrection served in ireland and who because they would not desert the king had been refused all their arrears by the english commonwealth to all these unhappy sufferers some justice seemed to be due but the difficulty was to find the means of redressing such great and extensive iniquities almost all of the valuable parts of ireland had been measured out and divided either to the adventurers who had lent money to the parliament for the suppression of the irish rebellion or to the soldiers who had received land in lieu of their arrears these could not be dispossessed because they were the most powerful and only armed part of ireland because it was requisite to favor them in order to support the protestant and english interest in that kingdom and because they had generally with a seeming zeal and alacrity concurred in the king's restoration the king therefore issued a proclamation in which he promised to maintain their settlement and at the same time engaged to give redress to the innocent sufferers there was a quantity of land as yet undivided in ireland and from this and some other funds it was thought possible for the king to fulfil both these engagements a court of claims was erected consisting altogether of english commissioners who had no connection with any of the parties into which ireland was divided before these were laid four thousand claims of persons craving restitution on account of their innocence and the commissioners had found leisure to examine only six hundred it already appeared that if all these were to be restored the funds whence the adventurers and soldiers must get reprisals would fall short of giving them any tolerable satisfaction a great alarm and anxiety seized all ranks of men the hopes and fears of every party were excited these eagerly grasped at recovering their paternal inheritance those were resolute to maintain their new acquisitions the duke of ormond was created lord lieutenant being the only person whose prudence and equity could compose such jarring interests a parliament was assembled at dublin and as the lower house was almost entirely chosen by the soldiers and adventurers who still kept possession it was extremely favorable to that interest the house of peers showed great impartiality an insurrection was projected together with a surprisal of the castle of dublin by some of the disbanded soldiers but this design was happily defeated by the vigilance of ormond some of the criminals were punished blood the most desperate of them escaped into england 
but affairs could not long remain in the confusion and uncertainty into which they had fallen all parties seemed willing to abate somewhat of their pretensions in order to attain some stability and ormond interposed his authority for that purpose the soldiers and adventurers agreed to relinquish a third of their possessions and as they had purchased their lands at very low prices they had reason to think themselves favored by this composition all those who had been attainted on account of their adhering to the king were restored and some of the innocent irish it was a hard situation that a man was obliged to prove himself innocent in order to recover possession of the estate which he and his ancestors had ever enjoyed but the hardship was augmented by the difficult conditions annexed to this proof if the person had ever lived in the quarters of the rebels he was not admitted to plead his innocence and he was for that reason alone supposed to have been a rebel the heinous guilt of the irish nation made men the more readily overlook any iniquity which might fall on individuals and it was considered that though it be always the interest of all good governments to prevent injustice it is not always possible to remedy it after it has had a long course and has been attended with great successes ireland began to attain a state of some composure when it was disturbed by a violent act passed by the english parliament which prohibited the importation of irish cattle into england ormond remonstrated strongly against this law he said that the present trade carried on between england and ireland was extremely to the advantage of the former kingdom which received only provisions or rude materials in return for every species of manufacture that if the cattle of ireland were prohibited the inhabitants of that island had no other commodity by which they could pay england for their importations and must have recourse to other nations for a supply that the industrious inhabitants of england if deprived of irish provisions which made living cheap would be obliged to augment the price of labor and thereby render their manufactures too dear to be exported to foreign markets that the indolent inhabitants of ireland finding provisions fall almost to nothing would never be induced to labor but would perpetuate to all generations their native sloth and barbarism that by cutting off almost entirely the trade between the kingdoms all the natural bands of union were dissolved and nothing remained to keep the irish in their duty but force and violence and that by reducing that kingdom to extreme poverty it would be even rendered incapable of maintaining that military power by which during its well-grounded discontents it must necessarily be retained in subjection the king was so much convinced of the justness of these reasons that he used all his interest to oppose the bill and he openly declared that he could not give his assent to it with a safe conscience but the commons were resolute in their purpose some of the rents of england had fallen of late years which had been ascribed entirely to the importation of irish cattle several intrigues had contributed to inflame that prejudice particularly those of buckingham and ashley who were desirous of giving ormond disturbance in his government and the spirit of tyranny of which nations are as susceptible as individuals had extremely animated the english to exert their superiority over their dependent state no affair could be conducted with greater violence than this was by the commons they even went so far in the preamble of the bill as to declare the importation of irish cattle to be a nuisance by this expression they gave scope to their passion and at the same time barred the king's prerogative by which he might think himself entitled to dispense with a law so full of injustice and bad policy the lords expunged the word but as the king was sensible that no supply would be given by the commons unless they were gratified in their prejudices he was obliged both to employ his interest with the peers for making the bill pass and to give the royal assent to it he could not however forbear expressing his displeasure at the jealousy entertained against him and at the intention which the commons discovered of retrenching his prerogative this law brought great distress for some time upon the irish 
but it has occasioned their applying with greater industry to manufactures, and has proved in the issue beneficial to that kingdom. End of section 9, chapter 64, part 5. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N dot I can voice dot com. Section 10 of Volume 1 F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. By David Hume, Volume One F, Section Ten, Chapter Sixty Five, Part One. Chapter Sixty Five, Charles the Second. Since the Restoration, England had attained a situation which had never been experienced in any former period of her government, and which seemed the only one that could fully ensure at once her tranquillity and her liberty. The king was in continual want of supply from the Parliament and he seemed willing to accommodate himself to that dependent situation. Instead of reviving those claims of prerogative, so strenuously insisted on by his predecessors, Charles had strictly confined himself within the limits of law, and had courted, by every art of popularity, the affections of his subjects. Even the severities, however blamable, which he had exercised against nonconformists, are to be considered as expedients by which he strove to ingratiate himself with that party which predominated in Parliament. But notwithstanding these promising appearances, there were many circumstances which kept the government from resting steadily on that bottom on which it was placed. The crown, having lost almost all its ancient domains, relied entirely on voluntary grants of the people, and the commons, not fully accustomed to this new situation, were not yet disposed to supply, with sufficient liberality, the necessities of the crown. They imitated, too, strictly the example of their predecessors in a rigid frugality of public money, and neither sufficiently considered the indigent condition of their prince, nor the general state of Europe, where every nation, by its increase both of magnificence and force, had made great additions to all public expenses. Some considerable sums, indeed, were bestowed on Charles, and the patriots of that age, tenacious of ancient maxims, loudly upbraided the commons with prodigality. But if we may judge by the example of a later period, when the government has become more regular, and the harmony of its parts has been more happily adjusted, the parliaments of this reign seem rather to have merited a contrary reproach. The natural consequence of the poverty of the crown was besides feeble, irregular transactions in foreign affairs, a continual uncertainty in its domestic administration. No one could answer with any tolerable assurance for the measures of the House of Commons. Few of the members were attached to the court by any other band than that of inclination. Royalist, indeed, in their principles, but unexperienced in business, they lay exposed to every rumor or insinuation, and were driven by momentary gust or currents, no less than the populace themselves. Even the attempts made to gain an ascendant over them by offices, and, as it is believed, by bribes and pensions, were apt to operate in a manner contrary to what was intended by the ministers. The novelty of the practice conveyed a general, and indeed a just alarm, while at the same time the poverty of the crown rendered this influence very limited and precarious. The character of Charles was ill-fitted to remedy those defects in the Constitution. He acted in the administration of public affairs as if government were a pastime, rather than a serious occupation, and, by the uncertainty of his conduct, he lost that authority which could alone bestow constancy on the fluctuating resolutions of the Parliament. His expenses, too, which sometimes perhaps exceeded the proper bounds, were directed more by inclination than by policy, 
and while they increased his dependence on the Parliament, they were not calculated fully to satisfy either the interested or disinterested part of that assembly. The Parliament met after a long adjournment, and the King promised himself everything from the attachment of the Commons. All his late measures had been calculated to acquire the good will of his people, and above all, the Triple League, it was hoped, would be able to efface all the disagreeable impressions left by the unhappy conclusion of the Dutch War. But a new attempt made by the court, and a laudable one, too, lost him for a time the effect of all these endeavors. Buckingham, who was in great favor with the king, and carried on many intrigues among the commons, had also endeavored to support connections with the nonconformist, and he now formed a scheme, in concert with the Lord Keeper, Sir Orlando Bridgman, and the Chief Justice, Sir Matthew Hale, two worthy patriots, to put an end to those severities under which these religionists had so long labored. It was proposed to reconcile the Presbyterians by a comprehension, and to grant a toleration to the independents in other sectaries. Favor seems not, by this scheme, as by others embraced during the present reign, to have been intended the Catholics. Yet were the zealous commons so disgusted that they could not be prevailed on even to give the king thanks for the Triple League, however laudable that measure was then, and has ever since been esteemed. They immediately voted an address for a proclamation against conventicles. Their request was complied with but as the king still dropped some hints of his desire to reconcile his Protestant subjects, the commons passed a very unusual vote, that no man should bring into the house any bill of that nature. The king in vain reiterated his solicitations for supply, represented the necessity of equipping a fleet, and even offered that the money which they should grant should be collected and issued for that purpose by commissioners appointed by the house instead of complying the commons voted an inquiry into all the miscarriages during the late war the slackening of sale after the duke's victory from false orders delivered by brunker the miscarriage at bergen the division of the fleet under prince rupert and albemarle the disgrace at Chatham. Brunker was expelled the House, and ordered to be impeached. Commissioner Pett, who had neglected orders issued for the security of Chatham, met with the same fate. These impeachments were never prosecuted. The House, at length, having been indulged in all their prejudices, were prevailed with to vote the King three hundred and ten thousand pounds, by an imposition on wine and other liquors after which they were adjourned. Public business, besides being retarded by the disgust of the commons against the tolerating maxims of the court, met with obstructions this session from a quarrel between the two houses. Skinner, a rich merchant in London, having suffered some injuries from the East India Company, laid the matter by petition before the House of Lords, by whom he was relieved in cost and damages to the amount of five thousand pounds. The commons voted that the lords, in taking cognizance of this affair, originally, without any appeal from inferior courts, had acted in a manner not agreeable to the laws of the land, and tending to deprive the subject of the right, ease, and benefit due him by these laws, and that Skinner, in prosecuting the suit after this manner, had infringed the privileges of the commons, for which offence they ordered him to be taken into custody. Some conferences ensued between the houses where the lords were tenacious of their right of judicature, and maintained that the method in which they had exercised it was quite regular. The commons rose into a great ferment, and went so far as to vote that whoever should be aiding or assisting in putting in execution the order or sentence of the House of Lords, in the case of Skinner against the East India Company, should be deemed a portrayer of the rights and liberties of the Commons of England, and an infringer on the privileges of the House of Commons. They rightly judged that it would not be easy after this vote to find any one who would venture to incur their indignation. 
The proceedings indeed of the Lords seem in this case to have been unusual and without precedent. The king's necessities obliged him again to assemble the Parliament, who showed some disposition to relieve him. The price, however, which he must pay for this indulgence, was his yielding to new laws against conventicles. His complacence in this particular contributed more to gain the commons than all the pompous pretenses of supporting the Triple Alliance, that popular measure by which he expected to make such advantage. The quarrel between the two houses was revived, and as the commons had voted only four hundred thousand pounds, with which the king was not satisfied, he thought proper, before they had carried their vote into a law, to prorogue them. The only business finished this short session was the receiving of the report of the committee appointed for examining the public accounts. On the first inspection of this report, there appears a great sum, no less than a million and a half, unaccounted for. And the natural inference is that the king had much abused the trust reposed in him by Parliament. But a more accurate inspection of particulars serves, in a great measure, to remove this imputation. The king indeed went so far as to tell the Parliament, from the throne, that he had fully informed himself of that matter, and did affirm that no part of those monies which they had given him had been diverted to other uses. But on the contrary, besides all those supplies, a very great sum had been raised out of his standing revenue and credit, and a very great debt contracted, and all for the war. Though artificial pretenses have often been employed by kings in their speeches to Parliament, and by none more than Charles, it is somewhat difficult to suspect him of a direct lie and falsehood. He must have had some reasons, and perhaps not unplausible ones, for this affirmation, of which all his hearers, as they had the accounts lying before them, were at that time competent judges. The method which all parliaments had hitherto followed was to vote a particular sum for the supply, without any distinction or any appropriation to particular services. So long as the demands of the crown were small and casual, no great inconveniences arose from this practice. But as all the measures of government were now changed, it must be confessed that, if the king made a just application of public money, this inaccurate method of proceeding, by exposing him to suspicion, was prejudicial to him. If he were inclined to act otherwise, it was equally hurtful to the people. For these reasons, a contrary practice during all the late reigns has constantly been followed by the commons. When the Parliament met after the prorogation, they entered anew upon the business of supply, and granted the King an additional duty during eight years of twelve pounds on each ton of Spanish wine imported, eight on each ton of French. A law also passed, empowering him to sell the fee-farm rents, the last remains of the domains, by which the ancient kings of England had been supported. By this expedient he obtained some supply of his present necessities, but left the crown, if possible, still more dependent than before. How much money might be raised by these sales is uncertain, but it could not be near one million eight hundred thousand pounds, the sum assigned by some writers. The act against conventicles passed, and received the royal assent. It bears the appearance of mitigating the former persecuting laws. But if we may judge by the spirit which had broken out almost every session during this Parliament, it was not intended as any favor to the nonconformists. Experience probably had taught that laws over rigid and severe could not be executed. By this act, the hearer in a conventicle, that is, in a dissenting assembly, where more than five were present, besides the family, were fined five shillings for the first offence, ten for the second. The preacher, twenty pounds for the first offence, forty for the second. The person in whose house the conventicle met was immersed a like sum with the preacher. One clause is remarkable, that if any dispute should arise, 
the judges should always explain the doubt in the sense least favorable to the conventicles, it being the intention of Parliament entirely to suppress them. Such was the zeal of the commons, that they violated the plainest and most established maxims of civil policy, which require that in all criminal prosecutions favor should always be given to the prisoner. The affair of Skinner still remained a ground of quarrel between the two houses, but the king prevailed with the peers to accept of the expedient proposed by the commons, that a general razure should be made of all the transactions with regard to that disputed question. Some attempts were made by the king to effect a union between England and Scotland, though they were too feeble to remove all the difficulties which obstructed that useful and important undertaking. Commissioners were appointed to meet, in order to regulate the conditions, but the design, chiefly by the intrigues of Lauderdale, soon after came to nothing. The king about this time began frequently to attend the debates of the House of Peers. He said that they amused him, and that he found them no less entertaining than a play. But deeper designs were suspected. As he seemed to interest himself extremely in the cause of Lord Ruse, who had obtained a divorce from his wife on the accusation of adultery, and applied to Parliament for leave to marry again, people imagined that Charles intended to make a precedent of the case, and that some other pretense would be found for getting rid of the Queen. Many proposals to this purpose, it is said, were made him by Buckingham. But the King, how little scrupulous soever in some respects, was incapable of any action harsh or barbarous, and he always rejected every scheme of this nature. A suspicion, however, of such intentions, it was observed, had at this time begotten a coldness between the two royal brothers. We now come to a period when the king's counsels, which had hitherto in the main been good, though negligent and fluctuating, became during some time remarkably bad, or even criminal, and breeding incurable jealousies in all men were followed by such consequences as had almost terminated in the ruin both of prince and people. Happily the same negligence still attended him, and as it had lessened the influence of the good, it also diminished the effect of the bad measures which he embraced. It was remarked that the committee of council established for foreign affairs was entirely changed, and that Prince Rupert, the Duke of Ormond, Sectary Trevor, and the Lord Keeper Bridgeman, men in whose honor the nation had great confidence, were never called to any deliberations. The whole secret was entrusted to five persons, Clifford, Ashley, Buckingham, Arlington, and Lauderdale. These men were known by the appellation of the Cabal, a word which the initial letters of their names happened to compose. Never was there a more dangerous ministry in England, nor one more noted for pernicious counsels. Lord Ashley, soon known after by the name of Earl of Shaftesbury, was one of the most remarkable characters of the age, and the chief spring of all the succeeding movements. During his early youth he had engaged in the late king's party, but being disgusted with some measures of Prince Maurice, he soon deserted to the Parliament. He insinuated himself into the confidence of Cromwell, and as he had great influence with the Presbyterians, he was serviceable in supporting, with his party, the authority of that usurper. He employed the same credit in promoting the restoration, and on that account both deserved and acquired favor with the king. In all his changes, he still maintained the character of never betraying those friends whom he deserted, and whichever party he joined, his great capacity and singular talents soon gained him their confidence, and enabled him to take the lead among them. No station could satisfy his ambition. No fatigues were insuperable to his industry. Well acquainted with the blind attachment of faction, he surmounted all sense of shame, and relying on the subtlety of his contrivances, he was not startled with enterprises the most hazardous and most criminal. His talents, both of public speaking and private insinuation, 
shone out in an eminent degree, and amidst all his furious passions he possessed a sound judgment of business, and still more of men. Though fitted by nature for beginning and pushing the greatest undertakings, he was never able to conduct any to a happy period, and his eminent abilities, by reason of his insatiable desires, were equally dangerous to himself, to the prince, and to the people. The Duke of Buckingham possessed all the advantages which a graceful person, a high rank, a splendid fortune, and a lively wit could bestow. But by his wild conduct, unrestrained either by prudence or principle, he found means to render himself in the end odious, and even insignificant. The least interest could make him abandon his honor. The smallest pleasure could seduce him from his interest. The most frivolous caprice was sufficient to counterbalance his pleasure. By his want of secrecy and constancy, he destroyed his character in public life. By his contempt of order and economy, he dissipated his private fortune. By riot and debauchery, he ruined his health. And he remained at last as incapable of doing hurt as he had ever been little desirous of doing good to mankind. The Earl, soon after created Duke of Lauderdale, was not defective in natural and still less in acquired talents. But neither was his address graceful, nor his understanding just. His principles, or more properly speaking his prejudices, were obstinate, but unable to restrain his ambition. His ambition was still less dangerous than the tyranny and violence of his temper. An implacable enemy, but a lukewarm friend, insolent to his inferiors, but abject to his superiors. Though in his whole character and deportment he was almost diametrically opposite to the king, he had the fortune, beyond any other minister, to maintain, during the greater part of his reign, an ascendant over him. The talents of parliamentary eloquence and intrigue had raised Sir Thomas Clifford, and his daring, impetuous spirit gave him weight in the king's councils. Of the whole cabal, Arlington was the least dangerous, either by his vices or his talents. His judgment was sound, though his capacity was but moderate, and his intentions were good, though he wanted courage and integrity to persevere in them. Together with Temple and Bridgman, he had been a great promoter of the Triple League, but he threw himself with equal alacrity into opposite measures, when he found them agreeable to his master. Clifford and he were secretly Catholics. Shaftesbury, though addicted to astrology, was reckoned a deist. Buckingham had too little reflection to embrace any steady principles. Lauderdale had long been a bigoted and furious Presbyterian, and the opinions of that sect still kept possession of his mind, how little soever they appeared in his conduct. End of section 10, chapter 65, part 1. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N voice dot com. Section 11 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. HISTORY OF ENGLAND FROM THE INVASION OF JULIUS CAESAR TO THE REVOLUTION OF 1688 BY DAVID HUME VOLUME 1 F SECTION 11 CHAPTER 65 PART 2 The dark counsels of the cabal, though from the first they gave anxiety to all men of reflection, were not thoroughly known but by the event. Such seemed to have been the views which they, in concurrence with some Catholic courtiers who had the ear of their sovereign, suggested to the king and the duke, and which these princes too greedily embraced. They said that the Parliament, though the spirit of party for the present attached them to the crown, 
were still more attached to those powers and privileges which their predecessors had usurped from the sovereign that after the first flow of kindness was spent they had discovered evident symptoms of discontent and would be sure to turn against the king all the authority which they yet retained and still more those pretensions which it was easy for them in a moment to revive that they not only kept the king in dependence by means of his precarious revenue but had never discovered a suitable generosity even in those temporary supplies which they granted him that it was high time for the prince to rouse himself from his lethargy and to recover that authority which his predecessors during so many ages had peaceably enjoyed that the great error or misfortune of his father was the not having formed any close connection with foreign princes who on the breaking out of the rebellion might have found their interest in supporting him that the present alliances being entered into with so many weaker potentates who themselves stood in need of the king's protection could never serve to maintain much less augment the royal authority that the french monarch alone so generous a prince and by blood so nearly allied to the king would be found both able and willing if gratified in his ambition to defend the common cause of kings against usurping subjects that a war undertaken against holland by the united force of two such mighty potentates would prove an easy enterprise and would serve all the purposes which were aimed at that under pretence of that war it would not be difficult to levy a military force without which during the prevalence of republican principles among his subjects the king would vainly expect to defend his prerogative that his naval power might be maintained partly by the supplies which on other pretenses would previously be obtained from parliament partly by subsidies from france partly by captures which might easily be made on that opulent republic that in such a situation attempts to recover the lost authority of the crown would be attended with success nor would any malcontents dare to resist a prince fortified by so powerful an alliance or if they did they would only draw more certain ruin on themselves and on their cause and that by subduing the states a great step would be made towards a reformation of the government since it was apparent that that republic by its fame and grandeur fortified in his factious subjects their attachment to what they vainly termed their civil and religious liberties these suggestions happened fatally to concur with all the inclinations and prejudices of the king his desire of more extensive authority his propensity to the catholic religion his avidity for money he seems likewise from the very beginning of his reign to have entertained great jealousy of his own subjects and on that account a desire of fortifying himself by an intimate alliance with france so early as sixteen sixty four he had offered the french monarch to allow him without opposition to conquer flanders provided that prince would engage to furnish him with ten thousand infantry and a suitable number of cavalry in case of any rebellion in england as no dangerous symptoms at that time appeared we are left to conjecture from this incident what opinion charles had conceived of the factious disposition of his people even during the time when the triple alliance was the most zealously cultivated the king never seems to have been entirely cordial in those salutary measures but still to have cast a longing eye toward the french alliance clifford who had much of his confidence said imprudently notwithstanding all this joy we must have a second war with holland the accession of the emperor to that alliance had been refused by england on frivolous pretenses and many unfriendly cavils were raised against the states with regard to surinam and the conduct of the east india company but about april sixteen sixty nine the strongest symptoms appeared of those fatal measure which were afterwards more openly pursued de witt at that time came to temple and told him that he paid him a visit as a friend not as a minister 
the occasion was to acquaint him with a conversation which he had lately had with puffendorf the swedish agent who had passed by the hague in the way from paris to his own country the french ministers puffendorf said had taken much pains to persuade him that the swedes would very ill find their account in those measures which they had lately embraced that spain would fail them in all her promises of subsidies nor would holland alone be able to support them that england would certainly fail them and had already adopted counsels directly opposite to those which by the triple league she had bound herself to pursue and that the resolution was not the less fixed and certain because the secret was as yet communicated to very few either in the french or english court when puffendorf seemed incredulous turenne showed him a letter from colbert de crossy the french minister at london in which after mentioning the success of his negotiations and the favorable disposition of the chief ministers there he added and i have at last made them sensible of the full extent of his majesty's bounty from this incident it appears that the infamous practice of selling themselves to foreign princes a practice which notwithstanding the malignity of the vulgar is certainly rare among men in high office had not been scrupled by charles's ministers who even obtained their master's consent to this dishonorable corruption but while all men of penetration both abroad and at home were alarmed with these incidents the visit which the king received from his sister the duchess of orleans was the foundation of still stronger suspicions lewis knowing the address and insinuation of that amiable princess and the great influence which she had gained over her brother had engaged her to employ all her good offices in order to detach charles from the triple league which he knew had fixed such unsurmountable barriers to his ambition and he now sent her to put the last hand to the plan of their conjunct operations that he might the better cover this negotiation he pretended to visit his frontiers particularly the great works which he had undertaken at dunkirk and he carried the queen and the whole court along with him while he remained on the opposite shore the duchess of orleans went over to england and charles met her at dover where they passed ten days together in great mirth and festivity by her artifices and caresses she prevailed on charles to relinquish the most settled maxims of honor and policy and to finish his engagements with lewis for the destruction of holland as well as for the subsequent change of religion in england but lewis well knew charles's character and the usual fluctuations of his counsels in order to fix him in the french interest he resolved to bind him by the ties of pleasure the only ones which with him were irresistible and he made him a present of a french mistress by whose means he hoped for the future to govern him the duchess of orleans brought with her a young lady of the name of Kerual, whom the king carried to london and soon after created duchess of portsmouth he was extremely attached to her during the whole course of his life and she proved a great means of supporting his connections with her native country the satisfaction which charles reaped from his new alliance received a great check by the death of his sister and still more by those melancholy circumstances which attended it her death was sudden after a few days illness and she was seized with the malady upon drinking a glass of succory water strong suspicions of poison arose in the court of france and were spread all over europe and as her husband had discovered many symptoms of jealousy and discontent on account of her conduct he was universally believed to be the author of the crime charles himself during some time was entirely convinced of his guilt but upon receiving the attestation of physicians who on opening her body found no foundation for the general rumor he was or pretended to be satisfied the duke of orleans indeed did never in any other circumstance of his life 
betray such dispositions as might lead him to so criminal an action and a lady it is said drank the remains of the same glass without feeling any inconvenience the sudden death of princes is commonly accompanied with these dismal surmises and therefore less weight is in this case to be laid on the suspicions of the public charles instead of breaking with france upon this incident took advantage of it to send over buckingham under pretence of condoling with the duke of orleans but in reality to concert further measures for the projected war never ambassador received greater caresses the more destructive the present measures were to the interest of england the more natural it was for lewis to load with civilities and even with favors those whom he could engage to promote them the journey of buckingham augmented the suspicions in holland which every circumstance tended still further to confirm lewis made a sudden eruption into lorraine and though he missed seizing the duke himself who had no surmise of the danger and who narrowly escaped he was soon able without resistance to make himself master of the whole country the french monarch was so far unhappy that though the most tempting opportunities offered themselves he had not commonly so much as the pretence of equity and justice to cover his ambitious measures this acquisition of lorraine ought to have excited the jealousy of the contracting powers in the triple league as much as an invasion of flanders itself yet did charles turn a deaf ear to all remonstrances made him upon that subject but what tended chiefly to open the eyes of de witt and the states with regard to the measures of england was the sudden recall of sir william temple this minister had so firmly established his character of honor and integrity that he was believed incapable even of obeying his master's commands in promoting measures which he esteemed pernicious to his country and so long as he remained in employment de witt thought himself assured of the fidelity of england charles was so sensible of this prepossession that he ordered temple to leave his family at the hague and pretended that that minister would immediately return after having conferred with the king about some business where his negotiation had met with obstructions de witt made the dutch resident inform the english court that he should consider the recall of temple as an express declaration of a change of measures in england and should even know what interpretation to put upon any delay of his return while these measures were secretly in agitation the parliament met according to adjournment the king made a short speech and left the business to be enlarged upon by the keeper that minister much insisted on the king's great want of supply the mighty increase of the naval power of france now triple to what it was before the last war with holland the decay of the english navy the necessity of fitting out next year a fleet of fifty sail the obligations which the king lay under by several treaties to exert himself for the common good of christendom among other treaties he mentioned the triple alliance and the defensive league with the states the artifice succeeded the house of commons entirely satisfied with the king's measures voted him considerable supplies a laud tax for a year was imposed of a shilling a pound two shillings a pound on two-thirds of the salaries of offices fifteen shillings on every hundred pounds of bankers money and stock an additional excise upon beer for six years and certain impositions upon law proceedings for nine years the parliament had never before been in a more liberal humour and never surely was it less merited by the counsels of the king and of his ministers the commons passed another bill for laying a duty on tobacco scotch salt glasses and some other commodities against this bill the merchants of london appeared by petition before the house of lords the lords entered into their reasons and began to make amendments on the bill sent up by the commons this attempt was highly resented by the lower house as an encroachment on the right which they pretended to possess alone of granting money to the crown many remonstrances passed between the two houses 
and by their altercations the king was obliged to prorogue the parliament, and he thereby lost the money which was intended him. This is the last time the peers have revived any pretensions of that nature. Ever since, the privilege of the commons, in all other places except in the House of Peers, has passed for uncontroverted. There was another private affair transacted about this time, by which the king was as much exposed to the imputation of a capricious lenity, as he was here blamed for unnecessary severity. Blood, a disbanded officer of the protectors, had been engaged in the conspiracy for raising an insurrection in Ireland, and on account of this crime he himself had been attainted, and some of his accomplices capitally punished. The daring villain meditated revenge upon Ormond, the Lord Lieutenant. Having by artifice drawn off the Duke's footman, he attacked his coach in the night time, as it drove along St. James Street in London, and he made himself master of his person. He might here have finished the crime, had he not meditated refinements in his vengeance. He was resolved to hang the Duke of Tyburn, and for that purpose bound him and mounted him on horseback behind one of his companions. They were advanced a good way into the fields, when the duke, making efforts for his liberty, threw himself to the ground, and brought down with him the assassin to whom he was fastened. They were struggling together in the mire, when Ormond's servants, whom the alarm had reached, came and saved him. Blood and his companions, firing their pistols in a hurry at the duke, rode off, and saved themselves by means of the darkness. Buckingham was at first, with some appearances of reason, suspected to be the author of this attempt. His profligate character, and his enmity against Ormond, exposed him to that imputation. Ossery soon after came to court, and seeing Buckingham stand by the king, his color rose, and he could not forbear expressing himself to this purpose. My lord, I know well that you are at the bottom of this late attempt upon my father, but I give you warning, if by any means he come to a violent end, I shall not be at a loss to know the author. I shall consider you as the assassin, I shall treat you as such, and wherever I meet you, I shall pistol you, though you stood behind the king's chair, and I tell you in his majesty's presence, that you may be sure I shall not fail of performance. If there was here any indecorum, it was easily excused in a generous youth, when his father's life was exposed to danger. A little after, Blood formed a design of carrying off the crown and regalia from the tower, a design to which he was prompted, as well by the surprising boldness of the enterprise as by the views of profit. He was near succeeding. He had bound and wounded Edwards, the keeper of the jewel office, and had gotten out of the tower with his prey, but was overtaken and seized with some of his associates. One of them was known to have been concerned in the attempt upon Ormond, and Blood was immediately concluded to be the ringleader. When questioned, he frankly avowed the enterprise, but refused to tell his accomplices. The fear of death, he said, should never engage him either to deny a guilt or betray a friend. All these extraordinary circumstances made him the general subject of conversation, and the king was moved by an idle curiosity to see and speak with a person so noted for his courage and his crimes. Blood might now esteem himself secure of pardon, and he wanted not address to improve the opportunity. He told Charles that he had been engaged with others in a design to kill him with a carabine above Battersea, where his majesty often went to bathe, that the cause of this resolution was the severity exercised over the consciences of the godly, in restraining the liberty of their religious assemblies, that when he had taken his stand among the reeds, full of these bloody resolutions, he found his heart checked with an awe of majesty and he not only relented himself, but diverted his associates from their purpose. That he had long ago brought himself to an entire indifference about life, which he now gave for lost. 
yet could he not forbear warning the king of the danger which might attend his execution that his associates had bound themselves by the strictest oaths to revenge the death of any of the confederacy and that no precaution or power could secure any one from the effects of their desperate resolutions whether these considerations excited fear or admiration in the king they confirmed his resolution of granting a pardon to blood but he thought it a point of decency first to obtain the duke of ormond's consent arlington came to ormond in the king's name and desired that he would not prosecute blood for reasons which he was commanded to give him the duke replied that his majesty's commands were the only reason that could be given and being sufficient he might therefore spare the rest charles carried his kindness to blood still further he granted him an estate of five hundred pounds a year in ireland he encouraged his attendants about his person he showed him great countenance and many applied to him for promoting their pretensions at court and while old edwards who had bravely ventured his life and had been wounded in defending the crown and regalia was forgotten and neglected this man who deserved only to be stared at and detested as a monster became a kind of favorite end of section eleven chapter sixty five part two recording by jim dennison j i m d e n i s o n voice dot com section twelve of volume one f of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim dennison history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one f section twelve chapter sixty five part three errors of this nature in private life have often as bad an influence as miscarriages in which the public is more immediately concerned another incident happened this year which infused a general displeasure and still greater apprehensions into all men the duchess of york died and in her last sickness she made open profession of the romish religion and finished her life in that communion this put an end to that thin disguise which the duke had hitherto worn and he now openly declared his conversion to the church of rome unaccountable terrors of popery ever since the accession of the house of stuart had prevailed throughout the nation but these had formerly been found so groundless and had been employed to so many bad purposes that surmises of this nature were likely to meet with the less credit among all men of sense and nothing but the duke's imprudent bigotry could have convinced the whole nation of his change of religion popery which had hitherto been only a hideous spectre was now become a real ground of terror being openly and zealously embraced by the heir to the crown a prince of industry and enterprise while the king himself was not entirely free from like suspicions it is probable that the new alliance with france inspired the duke with the courage to make open profession of his religion and rendered him more careless of the affections and esteem of the english this alliance became every day more apparent temple was declared to be no longer ambassador to the states and downing whom the dutch regarded as the inveterate enemy of their republic was sent over in his stead a ground of quarrel was sought by means of a yacht dispatched for lady temple the captain sailed through the dutch fleet which lay on their own coasts and he had orders to make them strike to fire on them and to persevere till they should return his fire the dutch admiral van ghent surprised at this bravado came on board the yacht and expressed his willingness to pay respect to the british flag according to former practice but that a fleet on their own coast should strike to a single vessel 
and that not a ship of war, was, he said, such an innovation, that he durst not without express orders agree to it. The captain, thinking it dangerous, as well as absurd, to renew firing in the midst of the Dutch fleet, continued his course, and for that neglect of orders was committed to the tower. This incident, however, furnished Downing with a new article to increase those vain pretenses on which it was purposed to ground the intended rupture. The English court delayed several months before they complained, lest, if they had demanded satisfaction more early, the Dutch might have had time to grant it. Even when Downing delivered his memorial, he was bound by his instructions not to accept of any satisfaction after a certain number of days, a very imperious manner of negotiating, and impracticable in Holland, where the forms of the Republic render delays absolutely unavoidable. An answer, however, though refused by Downing, was sent over to London, with an ambassador extraordinary, who had orders to use every expedient that might give satisfaction to the court of England. That court replied that the answer of the Hollanders was ambiguous and obscure, but they would not specify the articles or expressions which were liable to that objection. The Dutch ambassador desired the English ministry to draw the answer in what terms they pleased, and he engaged to sign it. The English ministry replied that it was not their business to draw papers for the Dutch. The ambassador brought them the draft of an article and asked them whether it were satisfactory. The English answered, that when he had signed and delivered it, they would tell him their mind concerning it. The Dutchman resolved to sign it at a venture, and on his demanding a new audience, an hour was appointed for that purpose. But when he attended, the English refused to enter upon business, and told him that the season for negotiating was now past. Long and frequent prorogations were made of the Parliament, lest the Houses should declare themselves with vigor against counsel so opposite to the inclination, as well as interest, of the public. Could we suppose that Charles, in his alliance against Holland, really meant the good of his people, that measure must pass for an extraordinary, nay, a romantic strain of patriotism, which could lead him, in spite of all difficulties, and even in spite of themselves, to seek the welfare of the nation. But every step which he took in this affair became a proof to all men of penetration that the present war was intended against the religion and liberties of his own subjects, even more than against the Dutch themselves. He now acted in everything as if he were already an absolute monarch, and was never more to lie under the control of national assemblies. The long prorogations of Parliament, if they freed the king from the importunate remonstrances of that assembly, were, however, attended with this inconvenience, that no money could be procured to carry on the military preparations against Holland. Under pretense of maintaining the Triple League, which at that very time he had firmly resolved to break, Charles had obtained a large supply from the commons but this money was soon exhausted by debts and expenses. France had stipulated to pay two hundred thousand pounds a year during the war, but that supply was inconsiderable compared to the immense charge of the English navy. It seemed as yet premature to venture on levying money without consent of Parliament, since the power of taxing themselves was the privilege of which the English were with reason particularly jealous some other resource must be fallen on. The king had declared that the staff of treasurer was ready for any one that could find an expedient for supplying the present necessities. Shaftesbury dropped a hint to Clifford, which the latter immediately seized and carried to the king, who granted him the promised reward together with a peerage. This expedient was the shutting up of the exchequer, and the retaining of all the payments which should be made into it. It had been usual for the bankers to carry their money to the exchequer, and to advance it upon security of the funds, by which they were afterwards reimbursed when the money was levied on the public. The bankers by this traffic got eight, sometimes ten percent, 
for sums which either had been consigned to them without interest or which they had borrowed at six per cent profits which they dearly paid for by this egregious breach of public faith the measure was so suddenly taken that none had warning of the danger a general confusion prevailed in the city followed by the ruin of many the bankers stopped payment the merchants could answer no bills distrust took place everywhere with a stagnation of commerce by which the public was universally affected and men full of dismal apprehensions asked each other what must be the scope of those mysterious councils whence the parliament and all men of honor were excluded and which commenced by the forfeiture of public credit and an open violation of the most solemn engagements both foreign and domestic another measure of the court contained something laudable when considered in itself but if we reflect on the motive whence it proceeded as well as the time when it was embraced it will furnish a strong proof of the arbitrary and dangerous counsels pursued at present by the king and his ministry charles resolved to make use of his supreme power in ecclesiastical matters a power he said which was not only inherent in him but which had been recognized by several acts of parliament by virtue of this authority he issued a proclamation suspending the penal laws enacted against all nonconformists or recusants whatsoever and granted to the protestant dissenters the public exercise of their religion to the catholics the exercise of it in private houses a fruitless experiment of this kind opposed by the parliament and retracted by the king had already been made a few years after the restoration but charles expected that the parliament whenever it should meet would now be tamed to greater submission and would no longer dare to control his measures meanwhile the dissenters the most inveterate enemies of the court were mollified by these indulgent maxims and the catholics under their shelter enjoy more liberty than the laws had hitherto allowed them at the same time the act of navigation was suspended by royal will and pleasure a measure which though a stretch of prerogative seemed useful to commerce while all the seamen were employed on board the royal navy a like suspension had been granted during the first dutch war and was not much remarked because men had at that time entertained less jealousy of the crown a proclamation was also issued containing rigorous clauses in favor of pressing another full of menaces against those who presumed to speak undutifully of his majesty's measures and even against those who heard such discourse unless they informed in due time against the offenders another against importing or vending any sort of painted earthenware except those of china upon pain of being grievously fined and suffering the utmost punishment which might be lawfully inflicted upon contemners of his majesty's royal authority an army had been levied and it was found that discipline could not be enforced without the exercise of martial law which was therefore established by order of council though contrary to the petition of right all these acts of power how little important soever in themselves savored strongly of arbitrary government and were nowise suitable to that legal administration which the parliament after such violent convulsions and civil wars had hoped to have established in the kingdom it may be worth remarking that the lord keeper refused to affix the great seal to the declaration for suspending the penal laws and was for that reason though under other pretenses removed from his office shaftesbury was made chancellor in his place and thus another member of the cabal received the reward of his counsels foreign transactions kept pace with these domestic occurrences an attempt before the declaration of war was made on the dutch smyrna fleet by sir robert holmes this fleet consisted of seventy sail valued at a million and a half and the hopes of seizing so rich a prey had been a great motive for engaging charles in the present war and he had considered that capture 
as a principal resource for supporting his military enterprises. Holmes, with nine frigates and three yachts, had orders to go on this command, and he passed Sprague in the Channel, who was returning with a squadron from a cruise in the Mediterranean. Sprague informed him of the near approach of the Hollanders, and had not Holmes, from a desire of engrossing the honor and profit of the enterprise, kept the secret of his orders, the conjunction of these squadrons had rendered the success infallible. When Holmes approached the Dutch, he put on an amicable appearance, and invited the Admiral, Van S., who commanded the convoy, to come on board of him. One of his captains gave a like insidious invitation to the rear admiral. But these officers were on their guard. They had received an intimation of the hostile intentions of the English, and had already put all the ships of war and merchantmen in an excellent posture of defense. Three times were they valiantly assailed by the English, and as often did they valiantly defend themselves. In the third attack, one of the Dutch ships of war was taken, and three or four of their most inconsiderable merchantmen fell into the enemy's hands. The rest, fighting with skill and courage, continued their course, and favored by a mist, got safe into their own harbors. This attempt is denominated perfidious and piratical by the Dutch writers, and even by many of the English. It merits at least the appellation of irregular and as it had been attended with bad success, it brought double shame upon the contrivers. The English ministry endeavored to apologize for the action by pretending that it was a casual rencounter, arising from the obstinacy of the Dutch in refusing the honors of the flag. But the contrary was so well known that even Holmes himself had not the assurance to persist in this asseveration. Till this incident, the States, notwithstanding all the menaces and preparations of the English, never believed them thoroughly in earnest, and had always expected that the affair would terminate either in some demands of money or in some proposals for the advancement of the Prince of Orange. The French themselves had never much reckoned on assistance from England, and scarcely could believe that their ambitious projects would, contrary to every maxim of honor and policy, be forwarded by that power which was most interested and most able to oppose them. But Charles was too far advanced to retreat. He immediately issued a declaration of war against the Dutch, and surely reasons more false and frivolous never were employed to justify a flagrant violation of treaty. Some complaints are there made of injuries done to the East India Company, which yet that company disavowed. The detention of some English in Suriname is mentioned, though it appears that these persons had voluntarily remained there. The refusal of a Dutch fleet on their own coast to strike to an English yacht is much aggravated. And to piece up all these pretensions, some abusive pictures are mentioned, and represented as a ground of quarrel. The Dutch were long at a loss what to make of this article, till it was discovered that a portrait of Cornelius de Witt, brother to the pensionary, painted by order of certain magistrates of Dort, and hung up in a chamber of the townhouse, had given occasion to the complaint. In the perspective of this portrait, the painter had drawn some ships on fire in a harbor. This was construed to be Chatham, where de Witt had really distinguished himself and had acquired honor. But little did he imagine that while the insult itself committed in open war had so long been forgiven, the picture of it should draw such severe vengeance upon his country. The conclusion of this manifesto, where the king still professed his resolution of adhering to the Triple Alliance, was of a piece with the rest of it. Lewis's declaration of war contained more dignity if undisguised violence and injustice could merit that appellation. He pretended only that the behavior of the Hollanders had been such that it did not consist with his glory any longer to bear. That monarch's preparations were in great forwardness, and his ambition was flattered with the most promising views of success. 
Sweden was detached from the Triple League. The Bishop of Munster was engaged by the payment of subsidies to take part with France. The Elector of Cologne had entered into the same alliance, and having consigned Bonn and other towns into the hands of Louis, magazines were there erected, and it was from that quarter that France purposed to invade the United Provinces. The standing force of that kingdom amounted to a hundred and eighty thousand men, and with more than half of this great army was the French king now approaching to the Dutch frontiers. The order, economy, and industry of Colbert, equally subservient to the ambition of the prince and happiness of the people, furnished unexhausted treasures. These, employed by the unrelenting vigilance of Louvois, supplied every military preparation, and facilitated all the enterprises of the army. Condé, Touraine, seconded by Luxembourg, Crequy, and the most renowned generals of the age, conducted this army, and by their conduct and reputation inspired courage into every one. The monarch himself, surrounded with a brave nobility, animated his troops by the prospect of reward, or, what was more valued, by the hopes of his approbation. The fatigues of war gave no interruption to gaiety. Its dangers furnished matter for glory and in no enterprise did the genius of that gallant and polite people ever break out with more distinguished luster. Though De Witt's intelligence in foreign courts was not equal to the vigilance of his domestic administration, he had long before received many surmises of this fatal confederacy. But he prepared not for defense so early, or with such industry, as the danger required. A union of England with France was evidently, he saw, destructive to the interest of the former kingdom, and therefore overlooking, or ignorant of the humors and secret views of Charles, he concluded it impossible that such pernicious projects could ever really be carried into execution. Secure in this fallacious reasoning, he allowed the Republic to remain too long in that defenseless situation into which many concurring accidents had conspired to throw her. By a continued and successful application to commerce, the people were become unwarlike, and confided entirely for their defense in that mercenary army which they maintained. After the Treaty of Westphalia, the states, trusting to their peace with Spain and their alliance with France, had broken a great part of this army and did not support with sufficient vigilance the discipline of the troops which remained. When the aristocratic party prevailed, it was thought prudent to dismiss many of the old, experienced officers who were devoted to the House of Orange, and their place was supplied by raw youths, the sons or kinsmen of burgomasters, by whose interest the party was supported. These new officers, relying on the credit of their friends and family, neglected their military duty, and some of them, it is said, were even allowed to serve by deputies, to whom they assigned a small part of their pay. During the war with England, all the forces of that nation had been disbanded. Lewis's invasion of Flanders, followed by the Triple League, occasioned the dismission of the French regiments, and the place of these troops, which had ever had a chief share in the honor and fortune of all the wars in the Low Countries, had not been supplied by any new levies. End of section twelve, chapter sixty five, part three. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N Voice dot com. Section 13 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1, F, Section 13, Chapter 65, Part 4. 
De Witt, sensible of this dangerous situation, and alarmed by the reports which came from all quarters, exerted himself to supply those defects to which it was not easy of a sudden to provide a suitable remedy. But every proposal which he could make met with opposition from the Orange Party, now become extremely formidable. The long and uncontrolled administration of this statesman had begotten envy. The present incidents roused up his enemies and opponents, who ascribed to his misconduct alone the bad situation of the Republic, and above all the popular affection to the young prince, which had so long been held in violent constraint, and had thence acquired new accession of force, began to display itself, and to threaten the commonwealth with some great convulsion. William the Third, Prince of Orange, was in the twenty-second year of his age, and gave strong indications of those great qualities by which his life was afterwards so much distinguished. De Witt himself, by giving him an excellent education, and instructing him in all the principles of government and sound policy, had generously contributed to make his rival formidable. Dreading the precarious situation of his own party, he was always resolved, he said, by conveying to the prince the knowledge of affairs, to render him capable of serving his country, if any future emergence should ever throw the administration into his hands. The conduct of William had hitherto been extremely laudable. Notwithstanding his powerful alliances with England and Brandenburg, he had expressed his resolution of depending entirely on the States for his advancement, and the whole tenor of his behavior suited extremely the genius of that people. Silent and thoughtful, given to hear and to inquire, of a sound and steady understanding, firm in what he once resolved or once denied, strongly intent on business, little on pleasure. By these virtues he engaged the attention of all men. And the people, sensible that they owed their liberty and very existence to his family, and remembering that his great-uncle Maurice had been able, even in more early youth, to defend them against the exorbitant power of Spain, were desirous of raising this prince to all the authority of his ancestors, and hoped, from his valor and conduct alone, to receive protection against those imminent dangers with which they were at present threatened. While these two powerful factions struggled for superiority, every scheme for defense was opposed, every project retarded. What was determined with difficulty was executed without vigor. Levies, indeed, were made, and the army completed to seventy thousand men. The prince was appointed both general and admiral of the commonwealth, and the whole military power was put into his hands. But new troops could not of a sudden acquire discipline and experience, and the partisans of the prince were still unsatisfied, as long as the perpetual edict, so it was called, remained in force, by which he was excluded from the stadtholdership and from all share in the civil administration. It had always been the maxim of De Witt's party to cultivate naval affairs with extreme care, and to give the fleet a preference above the army, which they represented as the object of an unreasonable partiality la the princes of Orange. The two violent wars which had of late been waged with England had exercised the valor and improved the skill of the sailors. And above all, De Ruder, the greatest sea commander of the age, was closely connected with the Lovstein party, and every one was disposed, with confidence and alacrity, to obey him. The equipment of the fleet was therefore hastened by De Witt, in hopes that, by striking at first a successful blow, he might inspire courage into the dismayed states, and support his own declining authority. He seems to have been, in a peculiar manner, incensed against the English, and he resolved to take revenge on them for their conduct, of which, he thought, he himself and his country had such reason to complain. By the offer of a close alliance for mutual defense, they had seduced the Republic to quit the alliance of France. But no sooner had she embraced these measures than they formed leagues for her destruction, with that very power which they had treacherously engaged her to offend. 
in the midst of full peace nay during an intimate union they attacked her commerce her only means of subsistence and moved by shameful rapacity had invaded that property which from a reliance on their faith they had hoped to find unprotected and defenceless contrary to their own manifest interest as well as to their honor they still retained a malignant resentment for her successful conclusion of the former war a war which had at first sprung from their own wanton insolence and ambition to repress so dangerous an enemy would de witt imagined give peculiar pleasure and contribute to the future security of his country whose prosperity was so much the object of general envy actuated by like motives and views de ruyter put to sea with a formidable fleet consisting of ninety-one ships of war and forty-four fire-ships cornelius de witt was on board as deputy from the states they sailed in quest of the english who were under the command of the duke of york and who had already joined the french under mariscal de tris the combined fleets lay at sole bay in a very negligent posture and sandwich being an experienced officer had given the duke warning of the danger but received it is said such an answer as intimated that there was more of caution than of courage in his apprehensions upon the appearance of the enemy every one ran to his post with precipitation and many ships were obliged to cut their cables in order to be in readiness sandwich commanded the van and though determined to conquer or to perish he so tempered his courage with prudence that the whole fleet was visibly indebted to him for its safety he hastened out of the bay where it had been easy for de bruder with his fire-ships to have destroyed the combined fleets which were crowded together and by this wise measure he gave time to the duke of york who commanded the main body and to mariscal de tris admiral of the rear to disengage themselves he himself meanwhile rushed into battle with the hollanders and by presenting himself to every danger had drawn upon him all the bravest of the enemy he killed van ghent a dutch admiral and beat off his ship he sunk another ship which ventured to lay him aboard he sunk three fire ships which endeavored to grapple with him and though his vessel was torn in pieces with shot and of a thousand men she contained near six hundred were laid dead upon the deck he continued still to thunder with all his artillery in the midst of the enemy but another fire-ship more fortunate than the preceding having laid hold of his vessel her destruction was now inevitable warned by sir edward haddock his captain he refused to make his escape and bravely embraced death as a shelter from that ignominy which a rash expression of the duke's he thought had thrown upon him during this fierce engagement with sandwich de ruyter remained not inactive he attacked the duke of york and fought him with such fury for above two hours that of two and thirty actions in which that admiral had been engaged he declared this combat to be the most obstinately disputed the duke's ship was so shattered that he was obliged to leave her and remove his flag to another his squadron was overpowered with numbers till sir joseph jordan who had succeeded to sandwich's command came to his assistance and the fight being more equally balanced was continued till night when the dutch retired and were not followed by the english the loss sustained by the fleets of the two maritime powers was nearly equal if it did not rather fall more heavy on the english the french suffered very little because they had scarcely been engaged in the action and as this backwardness is not their national character it was concluded that they had received secret orders to spare their ships while the dutch and english should weaken each other by their mutual animosity almost all the other actions during the present war tended to confirm this suspicion it might be deemed honorable for the dutch to have fought with some advantage the combined fleet of two such powerful nations but nothing less than a complete victory could serve the purpose of de witt or save his country from those calamities which from every quarter threatened to overwhelm her he had expected that the french would make their attack on the side of maestricht 
which was well fortified and provided with a good garrison. But Lewis, taking advantage of his alliance with Cologne, resolved to invade the enemy on that frontier, which he knew to be more feeble and defenseless. The armies of that elector, and those of Munster, appeared on the other side of the Rhine, and divided the force and attention of the states. The Dutch troops, too weak to defend so extensive a frontier, were scattered into so many towns that no considerable body remained in the field, and a strong garrison was scarcely to be found in any fortress. Lewis passed the Meuse at Viset, and lay siege to Orsoy, a town of the elector of Brandenburg's, but garrisoned by the Dutch. He carried it in three days. He divided his army, and invested at once Berwick, Wessel, Emmerich, and Rimburg, four places regularly fortified, and not unprovided with troops. In a few days all these places were surrendered. A general astonishment had seized the Hollanders, from the combination of such powerful princes against the Republic, and nowhere was resistance made suitable to the ancient glory or present greatness of the state. Governors without experience commanded troops without discipline, and despair had universally extinguished that sense of honor by which alone men in such dangerous extremities can be animated to a valorous defense. Lewis advanced to the banks of the Rhine, which he prepared to pass. To all the other calamities of the Dutch was added the extreme drought of the season, by which the greatest rivers were much diminished and in some places rendered fordable. The French cavalry, animated by the presence of their prince, full of impetuous courage, but ranged in exact order, flung themselves into the river. The infantry passed in boats. A few regiments of Dutch appeared on the other side, who were unable to make resistance. And thus was executed without danger, but not without glory, the passage of the Rhine so much celebrated at that time by the flattery of the French courtiers, and transmitted to posterity by the more durable flattery of their poets. Each success added courage to the conquerors, and struck the vanquished with dismay. The Prince of Orange, though prudent beyond his age, was but newly advanced to the command, unacquainted with the army, unknown to them and all men, by reason of the violent factions which prevailed, were uncertain of the authority on which they must depend. It was expected that the fort of Skink, famous for the sieges which it had formerly sustained, would make some resistance, but it yielded to Turin in a few days. The same general made himself master of Arnheim, Notzenburg, and Nimeguin, as soon as he appeared before them. Duisburg, at the same time opened its gates to Lewis. Soon after, Hardewick, Amersfoort, Campen, Rennen, Vian, Elberg, Zwoll, Quilemberg, Wageningen, Lockham, Warden, fell into the army's hands. Grohl and Deventer surrendered to the Mariscal Luxembourg, who commanded the troops of Munster, and every hour brought to the States news of the rapid progress of the French, and of the cowardly defense of their own garrisons. The Prince of Orange, with his small and discouraged army, retired into the province of Holland, where he expected, from the natural strength of the country, since all human art and courage failed, to be able to make some resistance. The town and province of Utrecht sent deputies, and surrendered themselves to Louis. Narden, a place within three leagues of Amsterdam, was seized by the Marquis of Rockfort and had he pushed on to Maiden, he had easily gotten possession of it. Fourteen stragglers of his army having appeared before the gates of that town, the magistrates sent them the keys, but a servant-maid, who was alone in the castle, having raised the drawbridge, kept them from taking possession of that fortress. The magistrates afterwards, finding the party so weak, made them drunk, and took the keys from them. Maiden is so near to Amsterdam, that its cannon may infest the ships which enter that city. Louis, with a splendid court, made a solemn entry into Utrecht, full of glory, because everywhere attended with success, though more owing to the cowardice and misconduct of his enemies than to his own valor or prudence. 
three provinces were already in his hands guelderland overissel and utrecht groningen was threatened friesland was exposed the only difficulty lay in holland and zealand and the monarch deliberated concerning the proper measures for reducing them conde and turin exhorted him to dismantle all the towns which he had taken except a few and fortifying his main army by the garrisons put himself in a condition of pushing his conquests louvois hoping that the other provinces weak and dismayed would prove an easy prey advised him to keep possession of places which might afterwards serve to retain the people in subjection his counsel was followed though it was found soon after to have been the most impolitic meanwhile the people throughout the republic instead of collecting a noble indignation against the haughty conqueror discharged their rage upon their own unhappy minister on whose prudence and integrity every one formally bestowed the merited applause the bad condition of the armies was laid to his charge the ill choice of governors was ascribed to his partiality as instances of cowardice multiplied treachery was suspected and his former connections with france being remembered the populace believed that he and his partisans had now combined to betray them to their most mortal enemy the prince of orange notwithstanding his youth and inexperience was looked on as the only saviour of the state and men were violently driven by their fears into his party to which they had always been led by favour and inclination amsterdam alone seemed to retain some courage and by forming a regular plan of defence endeavoured to infuse spirit into the other cities the magistrates obliged the burgesses to keep a strict watch the populace whom want of employment might engage to mutiny were maintained by regular pay and armed for the defence of the public some ships which lay useless in the harbour were refitted and stationed to guard the city and the sluices being opened the neighbouring country without regard to the damage sustained was laid under water all the province followed the example and scrupled not in this extremity to restore to the sea those fertile fields which with great art and expense had been won from it the states were assembled to consider whether any means were left to save the remains of their lately flourishing and now distressed commonwealth though they were surrounded with waters which barred all access to the enemy their deliberations were not conducted with that tranquillity which could alone suggest measures proper to extricate them from their present difficulties the nobles gave their vote that provided their religion liberty and sovereignty could be saved everything else should without scruple be sacrificed to the conqueror eleven towns concurred in the same sentiments amsterdam singly declared against all treaty with insolent and triumphant enemies but notwithstanding that opposition ambassadors were dispatched to employ the pity of the two combined monarchs it was resolved to sacrifice to louis maestrich and all the frontier towns which lay without the bounds of the seven provinces and to pay him a large sum for the charges of the war louis deliberated with his ministers louvois and pompon concerning the measures which he should embrace in the present emergence and fortunately for europe he still preferred the violent counsels of the former he offered to evacuate his conquest on condition that all duties lately imposed on the commodities of france should be taken off that the public exercise of the romish religion should be permitted in the united provinces the churches shared with the catholics and their priests maintained by appointments from the states that all the frontier towns of the republic should be yielded to him together with nimeguen skink Natzenburg, and that part of guelderland which lay on the other side of the rhine as likewise the isle of bommel that of vorn the fortress of st andrew those of lufstein and Krivakor, that the state should pay him the sum of twenty millions of livres for the charges of the war that they should every year send him a solemn embassy 
and present him with a golden medal as an acknowledgment that they owed to him the preservation of that liberty which by the assistance of his predecessors they had formerly acquired and that they should give entire satisfaction to the king of england and he allowed them but ten days for the acceptance of these demands the ambassadors sent to london met with still worse reception no minister was allowed to treat with them and they were retained in a kind of confinement but notwithstanding this rigorous conduct of the court the presence of the dutch ambassadors excited the sentiments of tender compassion and even indignation among the people in general especially among those who could foresee the aim and result of those dangerous counsels the two most powerful monarchs they said in europe the one by land the other by sea have contrary to the faith of solemn treaties combined to exterminate an illustrious republic what a dismal prospect does their success afford to the neighbors of the one and to the subjects of the other charles had formed the triple league in order to restrain the power of france a sure proof that he does not now err from ignorance he had courted and obtained the applauses of his people by that wise measure as he now adopts contrary counsels he must surely expect by their means to render himself independent of his people whose sentiments are become so indifferent to him during the entire submission of the nation and dutiful behavior of the parliament dangerous projects without provocation are formed to reduce them to subjection and all the foreign interests of the people are sacrificed in order the more surely to bereave them of their domestic liberties lest any instance of freedom should remain within their view the united province the real barrier of england must be abandoned to the most dangerous enemy of england and by a universal combination of tyranny against laws and liberty all mankind who have retained in any degree their precious though hitherto precarious birthrights are forever to submit to slavery and injustice End of section 13, chapter 65, part 4. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N voice dot com. Section 14 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1F, Section 14, Chapter 65, Part 5. Though the fear of giving umbrage to his confederate had engaged Charles to treat the Dutch ambassadors with such rigor, he was not altogether without uneasiness on account of the rapid and unexpected progress of the French arms. Were Holland entirely conquered, its whole commerce and naval force, he perceived, must become an accession to France. The Spanish Low Countries must soon follow, and Louis, now independent of his ally, would no longer think it his interest to support him against his discontented subjects charles though he never carried his attention to very distant consequences could not but foresee these obvious events and though incapable of envy or jealousy he was touched with anxiety when he found everything yield to the french arms while such vigorous resistance was made to his own he soon dismissed the Dutch ambassadors, lest they should cabal among his subjects, who bore them great favor. But he sent over Buckingham and Arlington, and soon after Lord Halifax, to negotiate anew with the French king, in the present prosperous situation of that monarch's affairs. These ministers passed through Holland, and as they were supposed to bring peace to the distressed republic, they were everywhere received with the loudest acclamations god bless the king of england god bless the prince of orange confusion to the states this was everywhere the cry of the populace the ambassadors had several conferences with the states and the prince of orange 
but made no reasonable advances toward an accommodation. They went to Utrecht, where they renewed the league with Lewis, and agreed that neither of the kings should make peace with Holland, but by common consent. They next gave in their pretensions, of which the following are the principal articles. That the Dutch should give up the honor of the flag, without the least reserve or limitation, nor should whole fleets, even on the coast of Holland, refuse to strike or lower their topsails to the smallest ship carrying the British flag. That all persons guilty of treason against the king, or of writing seditious libels, should, on complaint, be banished for ever the dominions of the states. That the Dutch should pay the king a million sterling towards the charges of the war, together with ten thousand pounds a year, for permission to fish on the British seas. That they should share the Indian trade with the English. That the Prince of Orange and his descendants should enjoy the sovereignty of the United Provinces, at least that they should be invested with the dignities of Stadtholder, Admiral, and General, in as ample a manner as had ever been enjoyed by any of his ancestors, and that the Isle of Walcheren, the city and castle of Sluys, together with the Isles of Cadsat, Gorey, and Vorn, should be put into the king's hands, as a security for the performance of articles. The terms proposed by Lewis bereaved the Republic of all security against any invasion by land from France. Those demanded by Charles exposed them equally to an invasion by sea from England, and when both were united they appeared absolutely intolerable, and reduced the Hollanders, who saw no means of defence, to the utmost despair. What extremely augmented their distress were the violent factions with which they continued to be everywhere agitated. De Witt, too pertinacious in defence of his own system of liberty, while the very being of the commonwealth was threatened, still persevered in opposing the repeal of the perpetual edict, now become the object of horror to the Dutch populace. Their rage at last broke all bounds, and bore everything before it. They rose in an insurrection at Dort, and by force constrained their burgomasters to sign the repeal so much demanded. This proved a signal of a general revolt throughout all the provinces. At Amsterdam, The Hague, Middelburg, Rotterdam, the people flew to arms, and trampling underfoot the authority of their magistrates, obliged them to submit to the Prince of Orange. They expelled from their office such as displeased them. They required the Prince to appoint others in their place. And, agreeably to the proceedings of the populace in all ages, provided they might wreak their vengeance on their superiors, they express great indifference for the protection of their civil liberties. The superior talents and virtues of De Witt made him on this occasion the chief object of envy, and exposed him to the utmost rage of popular prejudice. Four assassins, actuated by no other motive than mistaken zeal, had assaulted him in the streets, and after giving him many wounds, had left him for dead. One of them was punished. The others were never questioned for the crime. His brother Cornelius, who had behaved with prudence and courage on board the fleet, was obliged by sickness to come ashore, and he was now confined to his house at Dort. Some assassins broke in upon him, and it was with the utmost difficulty that his family and servants could repel their violence. At Amsterdam the house of the brave de Ruyter, the sole resource of the distressed commonwealth, was surrounded by the enraged populace, and his wife and children were for some time exposed to the most imminent danger. One Tetchler, a barber, a man noted for infamy, accused Cornelius de Witt of endeavouring by bribes to engage him in the design of poisoning the Prince of Orange. The accusation, though attended with the most improbable and even absurd circumstances, was greedily received by the credulous multitude and Cornelius was cited before a court of judicature. The judges, either blinded by the same prejudices, or not daring to oppose the popular torrent, condemned him to suffer the question. This man, who had bravely served his country in war, and who had been invested with the highest dignities, was delivered into the hands of the executioner, and torn in pieces by the most inhuman torments. 
Amidst the severe agonies which he endured, he still made protestation of his innocence, and frequently repeated an ode of Horace, which contained sentiments suited to his deplorable condition. Justum et tenacem prosposity virum. The judges, however, condemned him to lose his offices and to be banished the commonwealth. The pensionary, who had not been terrified from performing the part of a kind brother and faithful friend during this prosecution, resolved not to desert him on account of the unmerited infamy which was endeavored to be thrown upon him. He came to his brother's prison, determined to accompany him to the place of his exile. The signal was given to the populace. They rose in arms. They broke open the doors of the prison. They pulled out the two brothers and a thousand hands vied who should first be imbrued in their blood. Even their death did not satiate the brutal rage of the crowd. They exercised on the dead bodies of those virtuous citizens indignities too shocking to be recited. Until tired with their own fury, they permitted not the friends of the deceased to approach, or to bestow on them the honors of a funeral, silent and unattended. The massacre of the DeWitts put an end for the time to the remains of their party, and all men, from fear, inclination, or prudence, concurred in expressing the most implicit obedience to the Prince of Orange. The Republic, though half subdued by foreign force, and as yet dismayed by its misfortunes, was now firmly united under one leader, and began to collect the remains of its pristine vigor. William worthy of that heroic family from which he sprang, adopted sentiments becoming the head of a brave and free people. He bent all his efforts against the public enemy. He sought not against his country any advantages which might be dangerous to civil liberty. Those intolerable conditions demanded by their insolent enemies, he exhorted the states to reject with scorn, and by his advice they put an end to negotiations, which served only to break the courage of their fellow-citizens and delay the assistance of their allies. He showed them that the numbers and riches of the people, aided by the advantages of situation, would still be sufficient if they abandoned not themselves to despair, to resist, at least retard the progress of their enemies, and preserve the remaining provinces till the other nations of Europe, sensible of the common danger, could come to their relief. He represented that, as envy at their opulence and liberty had produced this mighty combination against them, they would in vain expect by concessions to satisfy foes whose pretensions were as little bounded by moderation as by justice. He exhorted them to remember the generous valor of their ancestors, who, yet in the infancy of the state, preferred liberty to every human consideration and rousing their spirits to an obstinate defense, repelled all the power, riches, and military discipline of Spain, and he professed himself willing to tread in the steps of his illustrious predecessors, and hoped that as they had honored him with the same affection which their ancestors paid to the former princes of Orange, they would second his efforts with the same constancy and manly fortitude. The spirit of the young prince infused itself into his hearers. Those who lately entertained thoughts of yielding their necks to subjection were now bravely determined to resist the haughty victor, and to defend those last remains of their native soil of which neither the eruptions of Lewis nor the inundation of waters had as yet bereaved them. Should even the ground fail them on which they might combat, they were still resolved not to yield the generous strife but flying to their settlements in the indies erect a new empire in those remote regions and preserve alive even in the climates of slavery that liberty of which europe was become unworthy already they concerted measures for executing this extraordinary resolution and found that the vessels contained in their harbors could transport above two hundred thousand inhabitants to the east indies the combined princes, finding at last some appearance of opposition, bent all their efforts to seduce the Prince of Orange, on whose valor and conduct the fate of the commonwealth entirely depended. The sovereignty of the province of Holland was offered him, 
and the protection of England and France, to ensure him, as well against the invasion of foreign enemies, as the insurrection of his subjects. All proposals were generously rejected, and the prince declared his resolution to retire into Germany, and to pass his life in hunting on his lands there, rather than abandon the liberty of his country, or betray the trust reposed in him. When Buckingham urged the inevitable destruction which hung over the United Provinces, and asked him whether he did not see that the Commonwealth was ruined, "'There is one certain means,' replied the prince, "'by which I can be sure never to see my country's ruin. I will die in the last ditch.' The people in Holland had been much incited to espouse the prince's party, by the hopes that the King of England, pleased with his nephew's elevation, would abandon those dangerous engagements into which he had entered, and would afford his protection to the distressed republic. But all these hopes were soon found to be fallacious. Charles still persisted in his alliance with France, and the combined fleets approached the coast of Holland with an English army on board, commanded by Count Schomberg. It is pretended that an unusual tide carried them off the coast, and that providence thus interposed in an extraordinary manner to save the republic from the imminent danger to which it was exposed very tempestuous weather it is certain prevailed all the rest of the season and the combined fleets either were blown to a distance or durst not approach a coast which might prove fatal to them lewis finding that his enemies gathered courage behind their inundations and that no further success was likely for the present to attend his arms, had retired to Versailles. The other nations of Europe regarded the subjection of Holland as the forerunner of their own slavery, and retained no hopes of defending themselves, should such a mighty accession be made to the already exorbitant power of France. The emperor, though he lay at a distance, and was naturally slow in his undertakings, began to put himself in motion. Brandenburg showed a disposition to support the states. Spain had sent some forces to their assistance, and by the present efforts of the Prince of Orange, and the prospect of relief from their allies, a different face of affairs began already to appear. Groningen was the first place that stopped the progress of the enemy. The Bishop of Munster was repulsed from before that town, and obliged to raise the siege with loss and dishonor. Narden was attempted by the Prince of Orange, but Mariscal Luxembourg, breaking in upon his entrenchments with a sudden eruption, obliged him to abandon the enterprise. There was no ally on whom the Dutch more relied for assistance than the Parliament of England, which the King's necessities at last obliged him to assemble. The eyes of all men, both abroad and at home, were fixed on this session which met after prorogations continued for near two years. It was evident how much the king dreaded the assembling of his parliament, and the discontents universally excited by the bold measures entered into, both in foreign and domestic administration, had given but too just foundation for his apprehensions. The king, however, in his speech, addressed them with all the appearance of cordiality and confidence, he said that he would have assembled them sooner, had he not been desirous to allow them leisure for attending their private affairs, as well as to give his people respite from taxes and impositions, that since their last meeting he had been forced into a war, not only just, but necessary, necessary both for the honor and interest of the nation, that in order to have peace at home, while he had war abroad, he had issued his declaration of indulgence to dissenters, and had found many good effects to result from that measure, that he heard of some exceptions which had been taken to this exercise of power, but he would tell them plainly that he was resolved to stick to his declaration, and would be much offended at any contradiction, and that though a rumor had been spread as if the new levied army had been intended to control law and property, he regarded that jealousy as so frivolous, that he was resolved to augment his forces next spring, and did not doubt but they would consider the necessity of them in their supplies. The rest of the business he left to the Chancellor. 
The Chancellor enlarged on the same topics, and added many extraordinary positions of his own. He told them that the Hollanders were the common enemies of all monarchies, especially that of England, their only competitor for commerce and naval power, and the sole obstacle to their views of attaining a universal empire as extensive as that of ancient Rome that even during their present distress and danger they were so intoxicated with these ambitious projects as to slight all treaty nay to refuse all cessation of hostilities that the king in entering on this war did no more than prosecute those maxims which had engaged the parliament to advise and approve of the last and he might therefore safely say that it was their war that the states being the eternal enemies of england both by interest and inclination the parliament had wisely judged it necessary to extirpate them and had laid it down as an eternal maxim that delenda es carthago this hostile government by all means is to be subverted and that though the dutch pretended to have assurances that the parliament would furnish no supplies to the king he was confident that this hope, in which they extremely trusted, would soon fail them. Before the commons entered upon business, there lay before them an affair which discovered, beyond a possibility of doubt, the arbitrary projects of the king, and the measures taken upon it proved that the house was not at present in a disposition to submit to them. It had been the constant undisputed practice, ever since the Parliament of 1604, for the house in case of any vacancy to issue out writs for new elections and the chancellor who before that time had had some precedents in his favor had ever afterwards abstained from all exercise of that authority this indeed was one of the first steps which the commons had taken in establishing and guarding their privileges and nothing could be more requisite than this precaution in order to prevent the clandestine issuing of writs and to ensure a fair and free election no one but so desperate a minister as shaftesbury who had entered into a regular plan for reducing the people to subjection could have entertained thoughts of breaking in upon a practice so reasonable and so well established or could have hoped to succeed in so bold an enterprise several members had taken their seats upon irregular writs issued by the chancellor but the house was no sooner assembled and the speaker placed in the chair than a motion was made against them and the members themselves had the modesty to withdraw their election was declared null and new writs in the usual form were issued by the speaker the next step taken by the commons had the appearance of some more complacence but in reality proceeded from the same spirit of liberty and independence they entered a resolution that in order to supply his majesty's extraordinary occasions for that was the expression employed they would grant eighteen months assessment at the rate of seventy thousand pounds a month amounting in the whole to one million two hundred and sixty thousand pounds though unwilling to come to a violent breach with the king they would not express the least approbation of the war, and they gave him the prospect of this supply, only that they might have permission to proceed peaceably in the redress of other grievances of which they had such reason to complain. End of section 14, chapter 65, part 5. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N Voice dot com. Section 15 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1 F, Section 15, Chapter 65, Part 6. No grievance was more alarming, both on account of the secret views from which it proceeded, and the consequences which might attend it, than the declaration of indulgence. 
a remonstrance was immediately framed against that exercise of prerogative. The king defended his measure, the commons persisted in their opposition to it, and they represented that such a practice, if admitted, might tend to interrupt the free course of the laws and alter the legislative power which had always been acknowledged to reside in the king and the two houses. All men were in expectation with regard to the issue of this extraordinary affair. The king seemed engaged in honor to support his measure, and in order to prevent all opposition, he had positively declared that he would support it. The commons were obliged to persevere, not only because it was dishonorable to be foiled, where they could plead such strong reasons, but also because, if the king prevailed in his pretensions, an end seemed to be put to all the legal limitations of the Constitution. It is evident that Charles was now come to that delicate crisis which he ought at first to have foreseen, when he embraced those desperate counsels, and his resolutions, in such an event, ought long ago to have been entirely fixed and determined. Besides his usual guards, he had an army encamped at Blackheath, under the command of Mariscal Schomburg, a foreigner, and many of the officers were of the Catholic religion. His ally, the French king, he might expect, would second him, if force became requisite for restraining his discontented subjects, and supporting the measures which, by common consent, they had agreed to pursue. But the king was startled when he approached so dangerous a precipice as that which lay before him. Were violence once offered, there could be no return, he saw, to mutual confidence and trust with his people. The perils attending foreign succors, especially from so mighty a prince, were sufficiently apparent, and the success which his own arms had met with in the war was not so great as to increase his authority or terrify the malcontents from opposition. The desire of power, likewise, which had engaged Charles in these precipitate measures, had less proceeded, we may observe, from ambition than from love of ease. Strict limitations of the Constitution rendered the conduct of business complicated and troublesome, and it was impossible for him, without much contrivance and intrigue, to procure the money necessary for his pleasures, or even for the regular support of government. When the prospect, therefore, of such dangerous opposition presented itself, the same love of ease inclined him to retract what it seemed so difficult to maintain and his turn of mind, naturally pliant and careless, made him find little objection to a measure which a more haughty prince would have embraced with the utmost reluctance. That he might yield with the better grace, he asked the opinion of the House of Peers, who advised him to comply with the Commons. Accordingly the king sent for the declaration, and with his own hands broke the seals. The commons expressed the utmost satisfaction with this measure, and the most entire duty to his majesty. Charles assured them that he would willingly pass any law offered him, which might tend to give them satisfaction in all their just grievances. Shaftesbury, when he found the king recede at once from so capital a point, which he had publicly declared his resolution to maintain, concluded that all schemes for enlarging royal authority were vanished and that Charles was utterly incapable of pursuing such difficult and such hazardous measures. The Parliament, he foresaw, might push their inquiries into those councils which were so generally odious, and the King, from the same facility of disposition, might abandon his ministers to their vengeance. He resolved, therefore, to make his peace in time with that party which was likely to predominate and to atone for all his violences in favor of monarchy by like violences in opposition to it. Never turn was more sudden, or less calculated to save appearances. Immediately he entered into all the cobbles of the country party, and discovered to them, perhaps magnified, the arbitrary designs of the court, in which he himself had borne so deep a share. He was received with open arms by that party, who stood in need of so able a leader, and no questions were asked with regard to his late apostasy. The various factions into which the nation had been divided, and the many sudden revolutions to which the public had been exposed, had tended much to debauch the minds of men, 
and to destroy the sense of honor and decorum in their public conduct. But the Parliament, though satisfied with the king's compliance, had not lost all those apprehensions to which the measures of the court had given so much foundation. A law passed for imposing a test on all who should enjoy any public office. Besides taking the oaths of allegiance and supremacy, and receiving the sacrament in the established church, they were obliged to abjure all belief in the doctrine of transubstantiation. As the dissenters had seconded the efforts of the commons against the king's declaration of indulgence, and seemed resolute to accept of no toleration in an illegal manner, they had acquired great favor with the Parliament, and a project was adopted to unite the whole Protestant interest against the common enemy, who now began to appear formidable. A bill passed the Commons for the ease and relief of the Protestant nonconformist, but met with some difficulties, at least delays, in the House of Peers. The resolution for supply was carried into a law, as a recompense to the king for his concessions. An act, likewise, of general pardon and indemnity was passed, which screened the ministers from all further inquiry. The Parliament probably thought that the best method of reclaiming the criminals was to show them that their case was not desperate. Even the remonstrance which the Commons voted of their grievances may be regarded as a proof that their anger was, for the time, somewhat appeased. None of the capital points are there touched on. The breach of the Triple League, the French alliance, or the shutting up of the exchequer. The sole grievances mentioned are an arbitrary imposition on coals for providing convoys, the exercise of martial law, the quartering and pressing of soldiers, and they prayed that, after the conclusion of the war, the whole army should be disbanded. The king gave them a gracious, though an evasive answer. When business was finished, the two houses adjourned themselves. Though the king had receded from his declaration of indulgence, and thereby had tacitly relinquished the dispensing power, he was still resolved, notwithstanding his bad success both at home and abroad, to persevere in his alliance with France, and in the Dutch war, and consequently in all those secret views, whatever they were, which depended on those fatal measures. The money granted by Parliament sufficed to equip a fleet, of which Prince Rupert was declared admiral, for the Duke was set aside by the test. Sir Edward Sprague and the Earl of Ossory commanded under the Prince. A French squadron joined them, commanded by de Tries. The combined fleets set sail towards the coast of Holland, and found the enemy lying at anchor within the sands of Schoenvelt. There is a natural confusion attending sea fights, even beyond other military transactions, derived from the precarious operations of winds and tides, as well as from the smoke and darkness in which everything is there involved. No wonder, therefore, that accounts of those battles are apt to contain uncertainties and contradictions, especially when delivered by writers of the hostile nations, who take pleasure in exalting the advantages of their own countrymen and depressing those of the enemy. All we can say with certainty of this battle is that both sides boasted of the victory, and we may thence infer that the event was not decisive. The Dutch, being near home, retired into their harbors. In a week they were refitted and presented themselves again to the combined fleets. A new action ensued, not more decisive than the foregoing. It was not fought with great obstinacy on either side, but whether the Dutch or the Allies first retired seems to be a matter of uncertainty. The loss in the former of these actions fell chiefly on the French, whom the English, diffident of their intentions, took care to place under their own squadrons, and they thereby exposed them to all the fire of the enemy. There seems not to have been a ship lost on either side in the second engagement. It was sufficient glory to de Ruyter that, with a fleet much inferior to the combined squadrons of France and England, he could fight them without any notable disadvantage, and it was sufficient victory that he could defeat the project of a descent in Zealand, which, had it taken place, had endangered, in the present circumstances, the total overthrow of the Dutch Commonwealth. 
Prince Rupert was also suspected not to favor the king's projects for subduing Holland, or enlarging his authority at home. And from these motives he was thought not to have pressed so hard on the enemy, as his well-known valor gave reason to expect. It is indeed remarkable that during this war, though the English with their allies much overmatched the Hollanders, they were not able to gain any advantage over them. While in the former war, though often overborne by numbers, they still exerted themselves with the greatest courage, and always acquired great renown, sometimes even signal victories. But they were disgusted by the present measures, which they deemed pernicious to their country. They were not satisfied in the justice of the quarrel, and they entertained a perpetual jealousy of their confederates, whom, had they been permitted, they would, with much more pleasure, have destroyed than even the enemy themselves. If Prince Rupert was not favorable to the designs of the court, he enjoyed as little favor from the court, at least from the duke, who, though he could no longer command the fleet, still possessed the chief authority in the admiralty. The prince complained of a total want of everything, powder shot, provisions, beer, and even water, and he went into harbor that he might refit his ships and supply their numerous necessities. After some weeks he was refitted, and he again put to sea. The hostile fleets met at the mouth of the Texel, and fought the last battle, which, during the course of so many years, these neighboring maritime powers have disputed with each other. De Ruyter, and under him Trump, commanded the Dutch in this action, as in the two former, for the Prince of Orange had reconciled these gallant rivals, and they retained nothing of their former animosity, except that emulation which made them exert themselves with more distinguished bravery against the enemies of their country. Brankert was opposed to de Trees, de Ruyter to Prince Rupert, Trump to Sprague. It is to be remarked that in all actions these brave admirals last mentioned had still selected each other as the only antagonist worthy of each other's valor, and no decisive advantage had as yet been gained by either of them. They fought in this battle as if there were no mean between death and victory. De Trees and all the French squadron, except Rear Admiral Martel, kept at a distance, and Brankert, instead of attacking them, bore down to the assistance of de Ruyter, who was engaged in furious battle with Prince Rupert. On no occasion did the prince acquire more deserved honor. His conduct, as well as valor, shone out with signal luster. Having disengaged his squadron from the numerous enemies with whom he was everywhere surrounded, and having joined Sir John Chichley, his rear admiral, who had been separated from him, he made haste to the relief of Sprague, who was hard-pressed by Tromp's squadron. The royal prince, in which Sprague first engaged, was so disabled that he was obliged to hoist his flag on board the St. George, while Tromp was, for a like reason, obliged to quit his ship, the Golden Lion, and go on board the Comet. The fight was renewed with utmost fury by these valorous rivals, and by the rear admirals, their seconds. Ossery, rear admiral to Sprague, was preparing to board Trump when he saw the St. George terribly torn and in a manner disabled. Sprague was leaving her in order to hoist his flag on board a third ship and return to the charge when a shot, which had passed through the St. George, took his boat and sunk her. The admiral was drowned, to the regret of Trump himself, who bestowed on his valor the deserved praises. Prince Rupert found affairs in this dangerous situation, and saw most of the ships in Sprague's squadron disabled from fight. The engagement, however, was renewed, and became very close and bloody. The prince threw the enemy into disorder. To increase it, he sent among them two fire-ships, and at the same time made a signal to the French to bear down, which if they had done, a decisive victory must have ensued. But the prince, when he saw that they neglected his signal, and observed that most of his ships were in no condition to keep the sea long, wisely provided for their safety by making easy sail towards the English coast. The victory in this battle was as doubtful as in all the actions fought during the present war. 
The turn which the affairs of the Hollanders took by land was more favorable. The Prince of Orange besieged and took Nairden, and from this success gave his country reason to hope for still more prosperous enterprises. Montecuculli, who commanded the imperialist of the Upper Rhine, deceived, by the most artful conduct, the vigilance and penetration of Turin, and making a sudden march, sat down before Bonn. The Prince of Orange's conduct was no less masterly. While he eluded all the French generals, and leaving them behind him, joined his army to that of the imperialists. Bonn was taken in a few days. Several other places in the electorate of Cologne fell into the hands of the Allies, and the communication being thus cut off between France and the United Provinces, Louis was obliged to recall his forces, and to abandon all his conquests with greater rapidity than he had at first made them. The taking of Maestricht was the only advantage which he gained this campaign. A congress was opened at Cologne under the mediation of Sweden, but with small hopes of success. The demands of the two kings were such as must have reduced the Hollanders to perpetual servitude. In proportion as the affairs of the states rose, the kings sunk in their demands, but the states still sunk lower in their offers and it was found impossible for the parties ever to agree on any conditions. After the French evacuated Holland, the Congress broke up, and the seizure of Prince William of Furstenberg by the imperialist afforded the French and English a good pretense for leaving Cologne. The Dutch ambassadors, in their memorials, expressed all the haughtiness and disdain so natural to a free state, which had met with such unmerited ill-usage. The Parliament of England was now assembled, and discovered much greater symptoms of ill-humor than had appeared in the last session. They had seen for some time a negotiation of marriage carried on between the Duke of York and the Archduchess of Innsbruck, a Catholic of the Austrian family, and they had made no opposition. But when that negotiation failed, and the Duke applied to a princess of the House of Modena, then in close alliance with France, this circumstance, joined to so many other grounds of discontent, raised the commons into a flame, and they remonstrated with the greatest zeal against the intended marriage. The king told them that their remonstrance came too late, and that the marriage was already agreed on, and even celebrated by proxy. The commons still insisted and proceeding to the examination of the other parts of government they voted the standing army a grievance and declared that they would grant no more supply unless it appeared that the dutch were so obstinate as to refuse all reasonable conditions of peace to cut short these disagreeable attacks the king resolved to prorogue the parliament and with that intention he came unexpectedly to the house of peers and sent the usher to summon the commons it happened that the speaker and the usher nearly met at the door of the house, but the speaker being within, some of the members suddenly shut the door and cried, To the chair, to the chair, while others cried, The black rod is at the door. The speaker was hurried to the chair, and the following motions were instantly made. That the alliance with France is a grievance. That the evil counsellors about the king are a grievance that the Duke of Lauderdale is a grievance, and not fit to be trusted or employed. There was a general cry, To the question, to the question. But the usher knocking violently at the door, the speaker leaped from the chair, and the house rose in great confusion. During the interval, Shaftesbury, whose intrigues with the malcontent party were now becoming notorious, was dismissed from the office of Chancellor, and the great seal was given to Sir Heneage Finch, by the title of Lord Keeper. The test had incapacitated Clifford, and the white staff was conferred on Sir Thomas Osborne, soon after created Earl of Danby, a minister of abilities, who had risen by his parliamentary talents. Clifford retired into the country, and soon after died. The Parliament had been prorogued, in order to give the duke leisure to finish his marriage. But the king's necessities soon obliged him again to assemble them, and by some popular acts he paved the way for the session. But all his efforts were in vain. 
the disgust of the commons was fixed in foundations too deep to be easily removed. They began with applications for a general fast, by which they intimated that the nation was in a very calamitous condition. They addressed against the king's guards, which they represented as dangerous to liberty, and even as illegal, since they never had yet received the sanction of Parliament. They took some steps towards establishing a new and more rigorous test against popery, and what chiefly alarmed the court, they made an attack on the members of the cabal, to whose pernicious counsels they imputed all their present grievances. Clifford was dead. Shaftesbury had made his peace with the country party, and was become their leader. Buckingham was endeavouring to imitate Shaftesbury, but his intentions were as yet known to very few. A motion was therefore made in the House of Commons for his impeachment. He desired to be heard at the bar, but expressed himself in so confused and ambiguous a manner as gave little satisfaction. He was required to answer precisely to certain queries which they proposed to him. These regarded all the articles of misconduct above mentioned, and among the rest the following query seems remarkable. By whose advice was the army brought up to overawe the debates and resolutions of the House of Commons? This shows to what length the suspicions of the House were at that time carried. Buckingham, in all his answers, endeavored to exculpate himself and to load Arlington. He succeeded not in the former intention. The Commons voted an address for his removal. But Arlington, who was on many accounts obnoxious to the House, was attacked. Articles were drawn up against him, though the impeachment was never prosecuted. The king plainly saw that he could expect no supply from the commons for carrying on a war so odious to them. He resolved, therefore, to make a separate peace with the Dutch on the terms which they had proposed through the channel of the Spanish ambassador, with a cordiality which, in the present disposition on both sides, was probably but affected, but which was obliging, he asked advice of the Parliament. The Parliament unanimously concurred, both in thanks for this gracious condescension, and in their advice for peace. Peace was accordingly concluded. The honor of the flag was yielded by the Dutch in the most extensive terms. A regulation of trade was agreed to. All possessions were restored to the same condition as before the war. The English planters in Suriname were allowed to remove at pleasure and the states agreed to pay to the king the sum of eight hundred thousand patacoons, near three hundred thousand pounds. Four days after the Parliament was prorogued, the peace was proclaimed in London, to the great joy of the people. Spain had declared that she could no longer remain neuter, if hostilities were continued against Holland, and a sensible decay of trade was foreseen, in case a rupture should ensue with that kingdom. The prospect of this loss contributed very much to increase the national aversion to the present war, and to enliven the joy for its conclusion. There was in the French service a great body of English, to the number of ten thousand men, who had acquired honor in every action, and had greatly contributed to the successes of Lewis. These troops, Charles said, he was bound by treaty not to recall, but he obliged himself to the states by a secret article not to allow them to be recruited. His partiality to France prevented a strict execution of this engagement. End of section 15, chapter 65, part 6. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N voice dot com. Section 16 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. By David Hume, Volume One F, Section Sixteen, Chapter Sixty Six, Part One. Chapter Sixty Six 
Charles the Second. If we consider the projects of the famous cabal, it will appear hard to determine whether the end which those ministers pursued were more blamable and pernicious, or the means by which they were to effect it more impolitic and imprudent. Though they might talk only of recovering or fixing the king's authority, their intention could be no other than that of making him absolute since it was not possible to regain or maintain in opposition to the people any of those powers of the crown abolished by late law or custom without subduing the people and rendering the royal prerogative entirely uncontrollable against such a scheme they might foresee that every part of the nation would declare themselves not only the old parliamentary faction which though they kept not in a body, were still numerous, but even the greatest royalists, who were indeed attached to monarchy, but desired to see it limited and restrained by law. It had appeared that the present Parliament, though elected during the greatest prevalence of the royal party, was yet tenacious of popular privileges, and retained a considerable jealousy of the crown, even before they had received any just ground of suspicion. The guards, therefore, together with a small army, new levied and undisciplined, and composed, too, of Englishmen, were almost the only domestic resources which the king could depend on in the prosecution of these dangerous counsels. The assistance of the French king was no doubt deemed by the cabal a considerable support in the schemes which they were forming but it is not easily conceived they could imagine themselves capable of directing and employing an associate of so domineering a character. They ought justly to have suspected that it would be the sole intention of Lewis, as it evidently was his interest, to raise incurable jealousies between the king and his people, and that he saw how much a steady, uniform government in this island, whether free or absolute, would form invincible barriers to his ambition. Should his assistance be demanded, if he sent a small supply, it would only serve to enrage the people, and render the breach altogether irreparable. If he furnished a great force, sufficient to subdue the nation, there was little reason to trust his generosity with regard to the use which he would make of this advantage. In all its other parts, the plan of the cabal, it must be confessed, appears equally absurd and incongruous. If the war with Holland were attended with great success, and involved the subjection of the Republic, such an accession of force must fall to Lewis, not to Charles. And what hopes, afterwards, of resisting by the greatest unanimity so mighty a monarch? How dangerous, or rather how ruinous, to depend upon his assistance against domestic discontents! If the Dutch, by their own vigor and the assistance of allies, were able to defend themselves and could bring the war to an equality, the French arms would be so employed abroad that no considerable reinforcement could thence be expected to second the king's enterprises in England. And might not the project of overawing and subduing the people be esteemed of itself sufficiently odious? without the aggravation of sacrificing that state which they regarded as their best ally, and with which, on many accounts, they were desirous of maintaining the greatest concord and strictest confederacy. Whatever views, likewise, might be entertained of promoting by these measures the Catholic religion, they could only tend to render all the other schemes abortive, and make them fall with inevitable ruin upon the projectors. The Catholic religion, indeed, were it established, is better fitted than the Protestant for supporting an absolute monarchy, but would any man have bought of it as the means of acquiring arbitrary authority in England, where it was more detested than even slavery itself? It must be allowed that the difficulties and even inconsistencies attending the schemes of the cabal are so numerous and obvious that one feels at first an inclination to deny the reality of those schemes, and to suppose them entirely the chimeras of calumny and faction. But the utter impossibility of accounting, by any other hypothesis, for those strange measures embraced by the court, 
as well as for the numerous circumstances which accompanied them, obliges us to acknowledge, though there remains no direct evidence of it, that a formal plan was laid for changing the religion, and subverting the constitution of England, and that the king and the ministry were in reality conspirators against the people. What is most probable in human affairs is not always true, and a very minute circumstance overlooked in our speculations serves often to explain events which may seem the most surprising and unaccountable. Sir John Dalrymple has since published some other curious particulars with regard to this treaty. We find that it was concerted and signed with the privity alone of four popish councillors of the kings, Arlington, Arundel, Clifford, and Sir Richard Beeling. The secret was kept from Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale. In order to engage them to take part in it, a very refined and a very mean artifice was fallen upon by the king. After the secret conclusion and signature of the treaty, the king pretended to these three ministers that for smaller matters and the ordinary occurrences of life, nor had he application enough to carry his view to distant consequences, or to digest and adjust any plan of political operations. As he scarcely ever thought twice on any one subject, every appearance of advantage was apt to seduce him, and when he found his way obstructed by unlooked-for difficulties, he readily turned aside into the first path where he expected more to gratify the natural indolence of his disposition. To this versatility, or pliancy of genius, he himself was inclined to trust, and he thought that, after trying an experiment for enlarging his authority and altering the national religion, he could easily, if it failed, return into the ordinary channel of government. But the suspicions of the people, though they burst not forth at once, were by this attempt rendered altogether incurable, and the more they reflected on the circumstances attending it, the more resentment and jealousy were they apt to entertain. They observed that the king never had any favorite, that he was never governed by his ministers, scarcely even by his mistresses, and that he himself was the chief spring of all public councils. Whatever appearance, therefore, of a change might be assumed, they still suspected that the same project was secretly in agitation, and they deemed no precaution too great to secure them against the pernicious consequences of such measures. He wished to have a treaty and alliance with France for mutual supports and for a Dutch war, and when various pretended obstacles and difficulties were surmounted, a sham treaty was concluded with their consent and approbation, containing every article of the former real treaty, except that of the king's change of religion. However, there was virtually involved, even in this treaty, the assuming of absolute government in England, for the support of French troops, and a war with Holland, so contrary to the interest and inclinations of his people, could mean nothing else. One cannot sufficiently admire the absolute want of common sense which appears throughout the whole of this criminal transaction. For if popery was so much the object of national horror, that even the king's three ministers, Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale, and such profligate ones too, either would not or durst not receive it, what hopes could he entertain of forcing the nation into that communion? Considering the state of the kingdom, full of veteran and zealous soldiers, bred during the civil wars, it is probable that he had not kept the crown two months after a declaration so wild and extravagant. This was probably the reason why the King of France and the French minister always dissuaded him from taking off the mask, till the successes of the Dutch war should render that measure prudent and practicable. The king, sensible of this jealousy, was inclined thenceforth not to trust his people, of whom he had even before entertained a great diffidence. And though obliged to make a separate peace, he still kept up connections with the French monarch. He apologized for deserting his ally, by presenting to him all the real, undissembled difficulties under which he labored. And Louis, 
with greatest complacence and good humor, admitted the validity of his excuses. The duke, likewise, conscious that his principles and conduct had rendered him still more obnoxious to the people, maintained on his own account a separate correspondence with the French court, and entered into particular connections with Louis, which these princes dignified with the name of friendship. The duke had only in view to secure his succession, and favor the Catholics, and it must be acknowledged to his praise, that though his schemes were in some particulars dangerous to the people, they gave the king no just ground of jealousy. A dutiful subject and an affectionate brother, he knew no other rule of conduct than obedience, and the same unlimited submission which afterwards, when king, he exacted of his people, he was ever willing, before he ascended the throne, to pay to his sovereign. As the king was at peace with all the world, and almost the only prince in Europe placed in that agreeable situation, he thought proper to offer his mediation to the contending powers, in order to compose their differences. France, willing to negotiate under so favorable a mediator, readily accepted of Charles's offer. But it was apprehended that, for a like reason, the allies would be inclined to refuse it. In order to give a sanction to his new measures, the king invited Temple from his retreat, and appointed him ambassador to the states. That wise minister, reflecting on the unhappy issue of his former undertakings, and the fatal turn of counsels which had occasioned it, resolved, before he embarked anew, to acquaint himself as far as possible with the real intentions of the king, in those popular measures which he seemed again to have adopted. After blaming the dangerous schemes of the cabal, which Charles was desirous to excuse, he told his majesty very plainly that he would find it extremely difficult, if not absolutely impossible, to introduce into England the same system of government and religion which was established in France, that the universal bent of the nation was against both, and it required ages to change the genius and sentiments of a people that many who were at the bottom indifferent in matters of religion would yet oppose all alterations on that head because they considered that nothing but force of arms could subdue the reluctance of the people against popery after which they knew there would be no security for civil liberty that in france every circumstance had long been adjusted to that system of government and tended to its establishment and support that the commonalty, being poor and dispirited, were of no account, the nobility, engaged by the prospect or possession of numerous offices, civil and military, were entirely attached to the court, the ecclesiastics, retained by like motives, added the sanction of religion to the principles of civil policy, that in England a great part of the landed property belonged either to the yeomanry or middling gentry. The king had few offices to bestow, and could not himself even subsist, much less maintain an army, except by the voluntary supplies of his parliament, that if he had an army on foot, yet if composed of Englishmen, they would never be prevailed on to promote ends which the people so much feared and hated, that the Roman Catholics in England were not the hundredth part of the nation, and in Scotland not the two hundredth and it seemed against all common sense to hope, by one part, to govern ninety-nine who were of contrary sentiments and dispositions, and that foreign troops, if few, would tend only to inflame hatred and discontent, and how to raise and bring over at once, or to maintain many, it was very difficult to imagine. To these reasonings Temple added the authority of Gourville, a Frenchman, for whom he knew the king had entertained a great esteem. A king of England, said Gourville, who will be the man of his people, is the greatest king in the world. But if he will be anything more, he is nothing at all. The king heard at first this discourse with some impatience. But being a dexterous dissembler, he seemed moved at last, and laying his hand on Temple said, with an appearing cordiality, 
and I will be the man of my people. Temple, when he went abroad, soon found that the scheme of mediating a peace was likely to prove abortive. The allies, besides their jealousy of the king's mediation, expressed a great ardor for the continuance of war. Holland had stipulated with Spain never to come to an accommodation, till all things in Flanders were restored to the condition in which they had been left by the Pyrenean Treaty. The emperor had high pretensions in Alsace, and as the greater part of the empire joined in the alliance, it was hoped that France, so much overmatched in force, would soon be obliged to submit to the terms demanded of her. The Dutch, indeed, oppressed by heavy taxes, as well as checked in their commerce, were desirous of peace, and had few or no claims of their own to retard it, but they could not in gratitude, or even in good policy, abandon allies to whose protection they had so lately been indebted for their safety. The Prince of Orange, likewise, who had great influence in their councils, was all on fire for military fame, and was well pleased to be at the head of armies, from which such mighty successes were expected. Under various pretenses, he eluded, during the whole campaign, the meeting with Temple, and after the troops were sent into winter quarters, he told that minister, in his first audience, that till greater impression were made on France, reasonable terms could not be hoped for, and it were therefore vain to negotiate. The success of the campaign had not answered expectation. The Prince of Orange, with a superior army, was opposed in Flanders to the Prince of Conde, and had hoped to penetrate into France by that quarter, where the frontier was then very feeble. After long endeavoring, though in vain, to bring Kund to a battle, he rashly exposed at Seneve a wing of his army, and that active prince failed not at once to see and to seize the advantage. But this imprudence of the Prince of Orange was amply compensated by his behavior in that obstinate and bloody action which ensued. He rallied his dismayed troops, he led them to the charge, he pushed the veteran and martial troops of France and he obliged the Prince of Kund, notwithstanding his age and character, to exert greater efforts, and to risk his person more, than in any action where, even during the heat of youth, he had ever commanded. After sunset, the action was continued by the light of the moon, and it was darkness at last, not the weariness of the combatants, which put an end to the contest, and left the victory undecided. The Prince of Orange, said Kund, with candor and generosity, has acted in everything like an old captain, except venturing his life, too, like a young soldier. Oudenard was afterwards invested by the Prince of Orange, but he was obliged by the imperial and Spanish generals to raise the siege on the approach of the enemy. He afterwards besieged and took grave, and at the beginning of winter the allied armies broke up with great discontents and complaints on all sides. The Allies were not more successful in other places. Louis, in a few weeks, reconquered Franche Gunt. In Alsace, Turin displayed against a much superior enemy all that military skill which had long rendered him the most renowned captain of his age and nation. By a sudden and forced march, he attacked and beat at Sinsheim the Duke of Lorraine and Caprera, general of the imperialist. Seventy thousand Germans poured into Alsace, and took up their quarters in that province. Turin, who had retired into Lorraine, returned unexpectedly upon them. He attacked and defeated a body of the enemy at Mulhausen. He chased from Colmar the elector of Brandenburg, who commanded the German troops. He gained a new advantage at Turkheim, and having dislodged all the allies, he obliged them to repass the Rhine, full of shame for their multiplied defeats, and still more of anger and complaints against each other. In England all these events were considered by the people with great anxiety and concern, though the king and his ministers affected great indifference with regard to them. Considerable alterations were made about this time in the English ministry. Buckingham was dismissed, 
who had long, by his wit and entertaining humor, possessed the king's favor. Arlington, now Chamberlain, and Danby, the treasurer, possessed chiefly the king's confidence. Great hatred and jealousy took place between these ministers, and public affairs were somewhat disturbed by their quarrels. But Danby daily gained ground with his master, and Arlington declined in the same proportion. Danby was a frugal minister, and by his application and industry he brought the revenue into tolerable order. He endeavored so to conduct himself as to give offense to no party, and the consequence was that he was able entirely to please none. He was a declared enemy to the French alliance, but never possessed authority enough to overcome the prepossessions which the king and the duke retained towards it. It must be ascribed to the prevalence of that interest, aided by money remitted from Paris, that the Parliament was assembled so late this year, lest they should attempt to engage the king in measures against France during the ensuing campaign. They met not until the approach of summer. End of section 16, chapter 66, part 1. Recording by Jim Dennison. J-I-M d-e-n-i-s-o-n voice dot com section seventeen of volume one f of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1F, Section 17, Chapter 66, Part 2. Every step taken by the commons discovered that ill humor and jealousy to which the late open measures of the king and his present secret attachments gave but too just foundation. They drew up a new bill against popery, and resolved to insert it in many severe clauses for the detection and prosecution of priests. They presented addresses a second time against Lauderdale, and when the king's answer was not satisfactory, they seemed still determined to persevere in their applications. An accusation was moved against Danby, but upon examining the several articles, it was not found to contain any just reasons of a prosecution, and was therefore dropped. They applied to the king for recalling his troops from the French service, and as he only promised that they should not be recruited, they appeared to be much dissatisfied with the answer. A bill was brought in, making it treason to levy money without authority of Parliament another vacating the seats of such members as accepted of offices, another to secure the personal liberty of the subject, and to prevent sending any person prisoner beyond sea. That the court party might not be idle during these attacks, a bill for a new test was introduced into the House of Peers by the Earl of Lindesey. All members of either house, and all who possessed any office, were by this bill required to swear that it was not lawful, upon any pretense whatsoever, to take arms against the king, that they abhorred the traitorous position of taking arms by his authority against his person, or against those who were commissioned by him, and that they will not at any time endeavor the alteration of the Protestant religion, or of the established government either in church or state great opposition was made to this bill, as might be expected from the present disposition of the nation. During seventeen days the debates were carried on with much zeal, and all the reason and learning of both parties were displayed on the occasion. The question, indeed, with regard to resistance, was a point which entered into the controversies of the old parties, Cavalier and Roundhead as it made an essential part of the present disputes between court and country. Few neuters were found in the nation, but among such as could maintain a calm indifference, there prevailed sentiments wide of those who were adopted by either party. Such persons thought that all general speculative declarations of the legislature 
either for or against resistance, were equally impolitic, and could serve to no other purpose than to signalize in their turn the triumph of one faction over another. That the simplicity retained in the ancient laws of England, as well as in the laws of every other country, ought still to be preserved, and was best calculated to prevent the extremes on either side that the absolute exclusion of resistance in all possible cases was founded on false principles its express admission might be attended with dangerous consequences and there was no necessity for exposing the public to either inconvenience that if a choice must necessarily be made in the case the preference of utility to truth in public institutions was apparent nor could the supposition of resistance, beforehand and in general terms, be safely admitted in any government. That even in mixed monarchies, where that supposition seemed most requisite, it was yet entirely superfluous, since no man, on the approach of extraordinary necessity, could be at a loss, though not directed by legal declarations, to find the proper remedy that even those who might at a distance, and by scholastic reasoning, exclude all resistance, would yet hearken to the voice of nature, when evident ruin, both to themselves and to the public, must attend a strict adherence to their pretended principles, that the question, as it ought thus to be entirely excluded from all determinations of the legislature, was, even among private reasoners, somewhat frivolous and little better than a dispute of words that the one party could not pretend that resistance ought ever to become a familiar practice the other would surely have recourse to it in great extremities and thus the difference could only turn on the degrees of danger or oppression which would warrant this irregular remedy a difference which in a general question it was impossible by any language precisely to fix or determine there were many other absurdities in this test particularly that of binding men by oath not to alter the government either in church or state since all human institutions are liable to abuse and require continual amendments which are in reality so many alterations it is not indeed possible to make a law which does not innovate more or less in the government these difficulties produced such obstructions to the bill that it was carried only by two voices in the house of peers all the popish lords headed by the earl of bristol voted against it it was sent down to the house of commons where it was likely to undergo a scrutiny still more severe but a quarrel which ensued between the two houses prevented the passing of every bill projected during the present session one dr shirley being cast in a lawsuit before chancery against sir john fagg a member of the house of commons preferred a petition of appeal to the house of peers the lords received it and summoned fagg to appear before them he complained to the lower house who espoused his cause they not only maintained that no member of their house could be summoned before the peers, they also asserted that the upper house could receive no appeals from any court of equity, a pretension which extremely retrenched the jurisdiction of the peers, and which was contrary to the practice that had prevailed during this whole century. The commons send surely to prison. The lords assert their powers. Conferences are tried but no accommodation ensues. Four lawyers are sent to the tower by the commons for transgressing the orders of the house and pleading in this cause before the peers. The peers denominate this arbitrary commitment a breach of the great charter and order the lieutenant of the tower to release the prisoners. He declines obedience. They apply to the king and desire him to punish the lieutenant for his contempt. The king summons both houses exhorts them to unanimity and informs them that the present quarrel had arisen from the contrivance of his and their enemies who expected by that means to force a dissolution of the parliament his advice has no effect the commons continue as violent as ever and the king finding that no business could be finished at last prorogued the parliament when the parliament was again assembled 
there appeared not in any respect a change in the dispositions of either house the king desired supplies as well for the building of ships as for taking off anticipations which lay upon his revenue he even confessed that he had not been altogether so frugal as he might have been and as he resolved to be for the future though he asserted that to his great satisfaction he had found his expenses by no means so exorbitant as some had represented them the commons took into consideration the subject of supply they voted three hundred thousand pounds for the building of ships but they appropriated the sum by very strict clauses they passed a resolution not to grant any supply for taking off the anticipations of the revenue this vote was carried in a full house by a majority of four only so nearly were the parties balanced the quarrel was revived to which dr shirley's cause had given occasion the proceedings of the commons discovered the same violence as during the last session a motion was made in the house of peers but rejected for addressing the king to dissolve the present parliament the king contented himself with proroguing them to a very long term whether these quarrels between the houses arose from contrivance or accident was not certainly known each party might according to their different views esteem themselves either gainers or losers by them the court might desire to obstruct all attacks from the commons by giving them other employment the country party might desire the dissolution of a parliament which notwithstanding all disgust still contained too many royalists ever to serve all the purposes of the malcontents soon after the prorogation there passed an incident which in itself is trivial but tends strongly to mark the genius of the english government and of charles's administration during this period the liberty of the constitution and the variety as well as violence of the parties had begotten a propensity for political conversation and as the coffee-houses in particular were the scenes where the conduct of the king and the ministry was canvassed with great freedom a proclamation was issued to suppress these places of rendezvous such an act of power during former reigns would have been grounded entirely on the prerogative and before the accession of the house of stuart no scruple would have been entertained with regard to that exercise of authority but charles finding doubts to arise upon his proclamation had recourse to the judges who supplied him with a chicane and that to a frivolous one by which he might justify his proceedings the law which settled the excise enacted that licenses for retailing liquors might be refused to such as could not find security for payment of the duties but coffee was not a liquor subjected to excise and even this power of refusing licenses was very limited and could not reasonably be extended beyond the intention of the act the king therefore observing the people to be much dissatisfied yielded to a petition of the coffee men who promised for the future to restrain all seditious discourse in their houses and the proclamation was recalled this campaign proved more fortunate to the confederates than any other during the whole war the french took the field in flanders with a numerous army and lewis himself served as a volunteer under the prince of conde but notwithstanding his great preparations he could gain no advantages but the taking of Huy and limburg places of small consequence the prince of orange with a considerable army opposed him in all his motions and neither side was willing without a visible advantage to hazard a general action which might be attended either with the loss of flanders on the one hand or the invasion of france on the other lewis tired of so inactive a campaign returned to versailles and the whole summer passed in the low countries without any memorable event turin commanded on the upper rhine in opposition to his great rival montecuculi general of the imperialists the object of the latter was to pass the rhine to penetrate into alsace lorraine or burgundy and to fix his quarters in these provinces the aim of the former was to guard the french frontiers and to disappoint all the schemes of his enemy 
The most consummate skill was displayed on both sides, and if any superiority appeared in Turenne's conduct, it was chiefly ascribed to his greater vigor of body, by which he was enabled to inspect all the posts in person, and could on the spot take the justest measures for the execution of his designs. By posting himself on the German side of the Rhine, he not only kept Montacuculi from passing that river, he had also laid his plan in so masterly a manner, that in a few days he must have obliged the Germans to decamp and have gained a considerable advantage over them. When a period was put to his life by a random shot, which struck him on the breast as he was taking a view of the enemy. The consternation of his army was inexpressible. The French troops, who a moment before were assured of victory, now considered themselves as entirely vanquished. And the Germans, who would have been glad to compound for a retreat, expected no less than the total destruction of their enemy. But Deloge, nephew to Turenne, succeeded him in the command, and possessed a great share of the genius and capacity of his predecessor. By his skilful operations, the French were enabled to repass the Rhine, without considerable loss, and this retreat was deemed equally glorious with the greatest victory. The valor of the English troops, who were placed in the rear, greatly contributed to save the French army. They had been seized with the same passion as the native troops of France for their brave general, and fought with ardor to revenge his death on the Germans. The Duke of Marlborough, then Captain Churchill, here learned the rudiments of that art which he afterwards practiced with such fatal success against France. The Prince of Kund left the army in Flanders under the command of Luxembourg, and carrying with him a considerable reinforcement, succeeded to Turenne's command. He defended Alsace from the Germans, who had passed the Rhine, and invaded that province. He obliged them first to raise the siege at Hagenau, then that of Sabern. He eluded all their attempts to bring him to a battle, and having dexterously prevented them from establishing themselves in Alsace, he forced them, notwithstanding their superiority of numbers, to repass the Rhine, and to take up winter quarters in their own country. After the death of Turin, a detachment of the German army was sent to the siege of Treves, an enterprise in which the imperialists, the Spaniards, the Palatine, the Duke of Lorraine, and many other princes passionately concurred. The project was well concerted and executed with vigor. Mariscal Quecri, on the other hand, collected an army, and advanced with the view of forcing the Germans to raise the siege. They left a detachment to guard their lines, and under the command of the Dukes of Zell and Osnaburg, marched in quest of the enemy. At Consarbric they fell unexpectedly, and with superior numbers, on Crequi, and put him to rout. He escaped with four attendants only, and throwing himself into Treves, resolved, by a vigorous defense, to make atonement for his former error or misfortune. The garrison was brave, but not abandoned to that total despair by which their governor was actuated. They mutinied against his obstinacy, capitulated for themselves, and because he refused to sign the capitulation, they delivered him a prisoner into the hands of the enemy. It is remarkable that this defeat given to Crequi is almost the only one which the French received at land, from Rocroy to Blenheim, during the course of above sixty years, and these two, full of bloody wars against potent and martial enemies, their victories almost equal the number of years during that period. Such was the vigor and good conduct of that monarchy, and such, too, were the resources and refined policy of the other European nations by which they were enabled to repair their losses, and still to confine that mighty power nearly within its ancient limits. A fifth part of these victories would have sufficed in another period to have given to France the empire of Europe. The Swedes had been engaged, by the payment of large subsidies, to take part with Louis, and invade the territories of the elector of Brandenburg in Pomerania. That elector, joined by some imperialists from Silesia, 
fell upon them with bravery and success. He soon obliged them to evacuate his part of that country, and he pursued them into their own. He had an interview with the king of Denmark, who had now joined the Confederates, and resolved to declare war against Sweden. These princes concerted measures for pushing the victory. To all these misfortunes against foreign enemies were added some domestic insurrections of the common people in Guienne and Brittany. Though soon suppressed, they divided the force and attention of Louis. The only advantage gained by the French was at sea. Messina in Sicily had revolted, and a fleet under the Duke of de Vivon was dispatched to support the rebels. The Dutch had sent a squadron to assist the Spaniards. A battle ensued, where de Ruyter was killed. This event alone was thought equivalent to a victory. The French, who twelve years before had scarcely a ship of war in any of their harbors, had raised themselves, by means of perseverance and policy, to be, in their present force, though not in their resources, the first maritime power in Europe. The Dutch, while in alliance with them against England, had supplied them with several vessels, and had taught them the rudiments of the difficult art of shipbuilding. The English next, when in alliance with them against Holland, instructed them in the method of fighting their ships, and of preserving order in naval engagements. Lewis availed himself of every opportunity to aggrandize his people, while Charles, sunk in indolence and pleasure, neglected all the noble arts of government, or if at any time he aroused himself from his lethargy, that industry, by reason of the unhappy projects which he embraced, was more often pernicious to the public than his inactivity itself. He was as anxious to promote the naval power of France as if the safety of his crown had depended on it, and many of the plans executed in that kingdom were first, it is said, digested and corrected by him. The successes of the Allies had been considerable the last campaign, but the Spaniards and imperialists well knew that France was not yet sufficiently broken, nor willing to submit to the terms which they resolved to impose upon her. Though they could not refuse the king's mediation, and Nimeguen, after many difficulties, was at last fixed on as the place of Congress, yet under one pretense or another they still delayed sending their ambassadors, and no progress was made in the negotiation. Lord Berkeley, Sir William Temple, and Sir Lionel Jenkins were the English ministers at Nimeguen. The Dutch, who were impatient for peace, soon appeared. Lewis, who hoped to divide the Allies, and who knew that he himself could neither be seduced nor forced into a disadvantageous peace, sent ambassadors. The Swedes, who hoped to recover by treaty what they had lost by arms, were also forward to negotiate. But as these powers could not proceed of themselves to settle terms, the Congress, hitherto, served merely as an amusement to the public. End of Section 17, Chapter 66, Part 2 Recording by Jim Dennison J-I-M-D-E-N-I-S-O-N Voice.com Section 18 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. HISTORY OF ENGLAND FROM THE INVASION OF JULIUS CAESAR TO THE REVOLUTION OF 1688 BY DAVID HUME, VOLUME 1 F, SECTION 18, CHAPTER 66, PART 3 It was by the events of the campaign, not the conferences among the negotiators, that the articles of peace were to be determined. The Spanish towns, ill-fortified and worse defended, made but a feeble resistance to Lewis who, by laying up magazines during the winter, was able to take the field early in the spring, before the forage could be found in the open country. In the month of April he laid siege to Kund, 
and took it by storm in four days. Having sent the Duke of Orleans to besiege Bouquin, a small but important fortress, he posted himself so advantageously with his main army as to render the Confederates from relieving it or fighting without disadvantage. The Prince of Orange, in spite of the difficulties of the season and the want of provisions, came in sight of the French army, but his industry served to no other purpose than to render him spectator of the surrender of Bouquin. Both armies stood in awe of each other, and were unwilling to hazard an action which might be attended with the most important consequences. Lewis, though he wanted not personal courage, was little enterprising in the field, and being resolved this campaign to rest contented with the advantages which he had so early obtained, he thought proper to entrust his army to Mariscal Schomburg, and retired himself to Versailles. After his departure, the Prince of Orange laid siege to Maestricht, but meeting with an obstinate resistance, he was obliged, on the approach of Schomburg, who in the meantime had taken air, to raise the siege. He was incapable of yielding to adversity, or bending under misfortunes but he began to foresee that, by the negligence and errors of his allies, the war in Flanders must necessarily have a very unfortunate issue. On the Upper Rhine, Philipsburg was taken by the imperialist. In Pomerania, the Swedes were so unsuccessful against the Danes and Brandenburgers that they seemed to be losing apace all those possessions which, with so much valor and good fortune, they had acquired in Germany. About the beginning of winter, the Congress of Nemeguen was pretty full, and the plenipotentiaries of the Emperor and Spain, two powers strictly conjoined by blood and alliance, at last appeared. The Dutch had threatened, if they absented themselves any longer, to proceed to a separate treaty with France. In the conferences and negotiations, the dispositions of the parties became every day more apparent. The Hollanders, loaded with debts and harassed with taxes, were desirous of putting an end to a war, in which, besides the disadvantages attending all leagues, the weakness of the Spaniards, the divisions and delays of the Germans, prognosticated nothing but disgrace and misfortune. Their commerce languished, and, what gave them still greater anxiety, the commerce of England, by reason of her neutrality, flourished extremely and they were apprehensive, lest advantages, once lost, would never thoroughly be regained. They had themselves no further motive for continuing the war, than to secure the frontier to Flanders. But gratitude to their allies still engaged them to try, whether another campaign might procure a peace which would give general satisfaction. The Prince of Orange, urged by motives of honor, of ambition, and of animosity against France, endeavored to keep them steady to this resolution. The Spaniards, not to mention the other incurable weaknesses into which their monarchy was fallen, were distracted with domestic dissensions between the parties of the Queen Regent and Don John, natural brother to their young sovereign. Though unable of themselves to defend Flanders, they were resolute not to conclude a peace which would leave it exposed to every assault or inroad, and while they made the most magnificent promises to the states, their real trust was in the protection of England. They saw that, if that small but important territory were once subdued by France, the Hollanders, exposed to so terrible a power, would fall into dependence, and would endeavor, by submissions, to ward off that destruction to which a war in the heart of their state must necessarily expose them. They believed that Lewis, sensible how much greater advantages he might reap from the alliance than from the subjection of the Republic, which must scatter its people and depress its commerce, would be satisfied with very moderate conditions, and would turn his enterprises against his other neighbors. They thought it impossible, but the people and Parliament of England, foreseeing these obvious consequences, must at last force the King to take part in the affairs of the continent, in which their interests were so deeply concerned, 
and they trusted that even the king himself on the approach of so great a danger must open his eyes and sacrifice his prejudices in favor of france to the safety of his own dominions but charles here found himself entangled in such opposite motives and engagements as he had not resolution enough to break or patience to unravel on the one hand he always regarded his alliance with france as a sure resource in case of any commotions among his own subjects and whatever schemes he might still retain for enlarging his authority or altering the established religion it was from that quarter alone he could expect assistance he had actually in secret sold his neutrality to france and he received remittances of a million of livres a year which was afterwards increased to two millions a considerable supply in the present embarrassed state of his revenue and he dreaded lest the parliament should treat him as they had formerly done his father and after they had engaged him in a war on the continent should take advantage of his necessities and make him purchase supplies by sacrificing his prerogative and abandoning his ministers on the other hand the cries of his people and parliament seconded by danby arlington and most of his ministers incited him to take part with the allies and to correct the unequal balance of power in europe he might apprehend danger from opposing such earnest desires he might hope for large supplies if he concurred with them and however inglorious and indolent his disposition the renown of acting as arbiter of europe would probably at intervals rouse him from his lethargy and move him to support the high character with which he stood invested it is worthy of observation that during this period the king was by every one abroad and at home by france and by the allies allowed to be the undisputed arbiter of europe and no terms of peace which he would have prescribed could have been refused by either party though france afterwards found means to resist the same alliance joined with england yet was she then obliged to make such violent efforts as quite exhausted her and it was the utmost necessity which pushed her to find resources far surpassing her own expectations charles was sensible that so long as the war continued abroad he should never enjoy ease at home from the impatience and importunity of his subjects yet could he not resolve to impose a peace by openly joining himself with either party terms advantageous to the allies must lose him the friendship of france the contrary would enrage his parliament between these views he perpetually fluctuated and his conduct it is observable that a careless remiss disposition agitated by opposite motives is capable of as great inconsistencies as are incident even to the greatest imbecility and folly the parliament was assembled and the king made them a plausible speech in which he warned them against all differences among themselves expressed a resolution to do his part for bringing their consultations to a happy issue and offered his consent to any laws for further security of their religion liberty and property he then told them of the decayed condition of the navy and asked money for repairing it he informed them that part of his revenue the additional excise was soon to expire and he added these words you may at any time see the yearly established expense of the government by which it will appear that the constant and unavoidable charge being paid there will remain no overplus towards answering those contingencies which may happen in all kingdoms and which have been a considerable burden on me this last year before the parliament entered upon business they were stopped by a doubt concerning the legality of their meeting it had been enacted by an old law of edward the third that parliament should be held once every year or oftener if need be the last prorogation had been longer than a year and being supposed on that account illegal it was pretended to be equivalent to a dissolution the consequence seems by no means just and besides a later act that which repealed the triennial law 
had determined that it was necessary to hold parliaments only once in three years such weight however was put on this cavil that buckingham shaftesbury salisbury and wharton insisted strenuously in the house of peers on the invalidity of the parliament and the nullity of all its future acts for such dangerous positions they were sent to the tower there to remain during the pleasure of his majesty and the house buckingham salisbury and wharton made submissions and were soon after released but shaftesbury more obstinate in his temper and desirous of distinguishing himself by his adherence to liberty sought the remedy of law and being rejected by the judges he was at last after a twelve months imprisonment obliged to make the same submissions upon which he was also released the commons at first seemed to proceed with temper they granted the sum of five hundred and eighty six thousand pounds for building thirty ships though they strictly appropriated the money to that service estimates were given in of the expense but it was afterwards found that they fell short near one hundred thousand pounds they also voted agreeably to the king's request the continuance of the additional excise for three years this excise had been granted for nine years in sixteen sixty eight everything seemed to promise a peaceable and an easy session but the parliament was roused from this tranquillity by the news received from abroad the french king had taken the field in the middle of february and laid siege to valun chien which he carried in a few days by storm he next invested both cambray and st omers the prince of orange alarmed with his progress hastily assembled an army and marched to the relief of st omers he was encountered by the french under the duke of orleans and mariscal luxembourg the prince possessed great talents for war courage activity vigilance patience but still he was inferior in genius to those consummate generals opposed to him by lewis and though he always found means to repair his losses and to make head in a little time against the victors he was during his whole life unsuccessful by a masterly movement of luxembourg he was here defeated and obliged to retreat to ypres cambry and st omers were soon after surrendered to lewis this success derived from such great power and such wise conduct infused a just terror into the english parliament they addressed the king representing the danger to which the kingdom was exposed from the greatness of france and praying that his majesty by such alliances as he should think fit would both secure his own dominions and the spanish netherlands and thereby quiet the fears of his people the king desirous of eluding this application which he considered as a kind of attack on his measures replied in general terms that he would use all means for the preservation of flanders consistent with the peace and safety of his kingdoms this answer was an evasion or rather a denial the commons therefore thought proper to be more explicit they entreated him not to defer the entering into such alliances as might attain that great end and in case war with the french king should be the result of his measures they promised to grant him all the aids and supplies which would enable him to support the honor and interest of the nation the king was also more explicit in his reply he told them that the only way to prevent danger was to put him in a condition to make preparations for their security this message was understood to be a demand of money the parliament accordingly empowered the king to borrow on the additional excise two hundred thousand pounds at seven per cent a very small sum indeed but which they deemed sufficient with the ordinary revenue to equip a good squadron and thereby put the nation in security till further resolutions should be taken but this concession fell far short of the king's expectations he therefore informed them that unless they granted him the sum of six hundred thousand pounds upon new funds it would not be possible for him without exposing the nation to manifest danger to speak or act those things which would answer the end of their several addresses 
the house took this message into consideration but before they came to any resolution the king sent for them to whitehall where he told them upon the word of a king that they should not repent any trust which they would repose in him for the safety of his kingdom that he would not for any consideration break credit with them or employ their money to other uses than those for which they intended it but that he would not hazard either his own safety or theirs by taking any vigorous measures or forming new alliances till he were in a better condition both to defend his subjects and offend his enemies this speech brought affairs to a short issue the king required them to trust him with a large sum he pawned his royal word for their security they must either run the risk of losing their money or fail of those alliances which they had projected and at the same time declare to all the world the highest distrust of their sovereign but there were many reasons which determined the house of commons to put no trust in the king they considered that the pretence of danger was obviously groundless while the french were opposed by such powerful alliances on the continent while the king was master of a good fleet at sea and while all his subjects were so heartily united in opposition to foreign enemies that the only justifiable reason therefore of charles's backwardness was not the apprehension of danger from abroad but a diffidence which he might perhaps have entertained of his parliament lest after engaging him in foreign alliances for carrying on war they should take advantage of his necessities and extort from him concessions dangerous to his royal dignity that this parliament by their past conduct had given no foundation for such suspicions and were so far from pursuing any sinister ends that they had granted supplies for the first dutch war for maintaining the triple league though concluded without their advice even for carrying on the second dutch war which was entered into contrary to their opinion and contrary to the manifest interest of the nation that on the other hand the king had by former measures excited very reasonable jealousies in his people and did with a bad grace require at present their trust and confidence that he had not scrupled to demand supplies for maintaining the triple league at the very moment he was concerting measures for breaking it and had accordingly employed to that purpose the supplies which he had obtained by those delusive pretenses that his union with france during the war against holland must have been founded on projects the most dangerous to his people and as the same union was still secretly maintained it might justly be feared that the same projects were not yet entirely abandoned that he could not seriously intend to prosecute vigorous measures against france since he had so long remained entirely unconcerned during such obvious dangers and till prompted by his parliament whose proper business it was not to take the lead in those parts of administration had suspended all his activity that if he really meant to enter into a cordial union with his people he would have taken the first step and have endeavoured by putting trust in them to restore that confidence which he himself by his rash conduct had first violated that it was in vain to ask so small a sum as six hundred thousand pounds in order to secure him against the future attempts of the parliament since that sum must soon be exhausted by a war with france and he must again fall into that dependence which was become in some degree essential to the constitution that if he would form the necessary alliances that sum or a greater would be instantly voted nor could there be any reason to dread that the parliament would immediately desert measures in which they were engaged by their honour their inclination and the public interest that the real ground therefore of the king's refusal was neither apprehension of danger from foreign enemies nor jealousy of parliamentary encroachments but a desire of obtaining the money which he intended notwithstanding his royal word to employ to other purposes and that by using such dishonourable means to so ignoble an end he rendered himself still more unworthy the confidence of his people 
End of section 18, chapter 66, part 3. Recording by Jim Dennison. J I M D E N I S O N voice.com. Section 19 of Volume 1F of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Dennison. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1F, Section 19, Chapter 66, Part 4. The House of Commons was now regularly divided into two parties, the court and the country. Some were enlisted in the court party by offices, nay, a few by bribes secretly given them, a practice first begun by Clifford, a dangerous minister. But great numbers were attached merely by inclination, so far as they esteemed the measures of the court agreeable to the interest of the nation. Private views and faction had likewise drawn several into the country party, but there were also many of that party who had no other object than the public good. These disinterested members on both sides fluctuated between the factions, and gave the superiority sometimes to the court sometimes to the opposition. In the present emergence, a general distrust of the king prevailed, and the Parliament resolved not to hazard their money in expectation of alliances which they believed were never intended to be formed. Instead of granting the supply, they voted an address, wherein they besought His Majesty to enter into a league, offensive and defensive, with the States General of the United Provinces, against the growth and power of the French King, and for the preservation of the Spanish Netherlands, and to make such other alliances with the Confederates as should appear fit and useful to that end. They supported their advice with reasons, and promised speedy and effectual supplies, for preserving His Majesty's honor and ensuring the public safety. The king pretended the highest anger at this address, which he represented as a dangerous encroachment upon his prerogative. He reproved the commons in severe terms, and ordered them immediately to be adjourned. It is certain that this was the critical moment when the king both might with ease have preserved the balance of power in Europe, which it had since cost this island a great expense of blood and treasure to restore and might by perseverance have at last regained, in some tolerable measure, after all past errors, the confidence of his people. This opportunity being neglected, the wound became incurable, and notwithstanding his momentary appearances of vigor against France and Popery, and their momentary inclinations to rely on his faith, he was still believed to be, at bottom, engaged in the same interest, and they soon relapsed into distrust and jealousy. The secret memoirs of this reign, which have since been published, prove beyond a doubt that the king had at this time concerted measures with France, and had no intention to enter into a war in favor of the Allies. He had entertained no view, therefore, even when he pawned his royal word to his people, than to procure a grant of money and he trusted that, while he eluded their expectations, he could not afterwards want pretenses for palliating his conduct. Negotiations, meanwhile, were carried on between France and Holland, and an eventual treaty was concluded, that is, all their differences were adjusted, provided they could afterwards satisfy their allies on both sides. This work, though in appearance difficult, seemed to be extremely forwarded by further bad successes on the part of the Confederates, and by the great impatience of the Hollanders, when a new event happened, which promised a more prosperous issue to quarrel with France, and revived the hopes of all the English who understood the interest of their country. The king saw with regret the violent discontents which prevailed in the nation, and which seemed every day to augment upon him. 
desirous by his natural temper to be easy himself and to make everybody else easy he sought expedients to appease those murmurs which as they were very disagreeable for the present might in their consequences prove extremely dangerous he knew that during the late war with holland the malcontents at home had made applications to the prince of orange and if he continued still to neglect the prince's interest and to thwart the inclinations of his own people he apprehended lest their common complaints should cement a lasting union between them he saw that the religion of the duke inspired the nation with dismal apprehensions and though he had obliged his brother to allow the young princesses to be educated in the protestant faith something further he thought was necessary in order to satisfy the nation he entertained therefore proposals for marrying the prince of orange to the lady mary the elder princess and heir apparent to the crown for the duke had no male issue and he hoped by so tempting an offer to engage him entirely in his interests a peace he purposed to make such as would satisfy france and still preserve his connections with that crown and he intended to sanctify it by the approbation of the prince whom he found to be extremely revered in england and respected throughout europe all the reasons for this alliance were seconded by the solicitations of danby and also of temple who was at that time in england and charles at last granted permission to the prince when the campaign should be over to pay him a visit the king very graciously received his nephew at newmarket he would have entered immediately upon business but the prince desired first to be acquainted with the lady mary and he declared that contrary to the usual sentiments of persons of his rank he placed a great part of happiness in domestic satisfaction and would not upon any consideration of interest or politics match himself with a person disagreeable to him he was introduced to the princess whom he found in the bloom of youth and extremely amiable both in her person and her behavior the king now thought that he had a double tie upon him and might safely expect his compliance with every proposal he was surprised to find the prince decline all discourse of business and refuse to concert any terms for the general peace till his marriage should be finished he foresaw he said from the situation of affairs that his allies were likely to have hard terms and he never would expose himself to the reproach of having sacrificed their interest to promote his own purposes charles still believed notwithstanding the cold severe manner of the prince that he would abate of this rigid punctilio of honour and he protracted the time hoping by his own insinuation and address as well as by the allurements of love and ambition to win him to compliance one day temple found the prince in very bad humour repenting that he had ever come to england and resolute in a few days to leave it but before he went the king he said must choose the terms on which they should hereafter live together he was sure it must be like the greatest friends or the greatest enemies and he desired temple to inform his master next morning of these intentions charles was struck with this menace and foresaw how the prince's departure would be interpreted by the people he resolved therefore immediately to yield with a good grace and having paid a compliment to his nephew's honesty he told temple that the marriage was concluded and desired him to inform the duke of it as of an affair already resolved on the duke seemed surprised but yielded a prompt obedience which he said was his constant maxim to whatever he found to be the king's pleasure no measure during this reign gave such general satisfaction all parties strove who should most applaud it and even arlington who had been kept out of the secret told the prince that some things good in themselves were spoiled by the manner of doing them as some things bad were mended by it but he would confess that this was a thing so good in itself that the manner of doing it could not spoil it 
The marriage was a great surprise to Lewis, who, accustomed to govern everything in the English court, now found so important a step taken not only without his consent, but without his knowledge or participation. A conjunction of England with the Allies, and a vigorous war in opposition to French ambition, were the consequences immediately expected, both abroad and at home. But to check these sanguine hopes, the king, a few days after the marriage, prolonged the adjournment of the Parliament from the 3rd of December to the 4th of April. This term was too late for granting supplies, or making preparations for war, and could be chosen by the king for no other reason than as an atonement to France for his consent to the marriage. It appears also that Charles secretly received from Louis the sum of two millions of livres on account of this important service. The king, however, entered into consultations with the prince, together with Danby and Temple concerning the terms which it would be proper to require of France. After some debate, it was agreed that France should restore Lorraine to the duke, with Tournay, Valunchienne, Conde, Ath, Chaleroy, Courtray, Oudenard, and Bunch to Spain, in order to form a good frontier for the Low Countries. The prince insisted that France Comte should likewise be restored, and Charles thought that, because he had patrimonial estates of great value in that province, and deemed his property more secure in the hands of Spain, he was engaged by such views to be obstinate in that point. But the prince declared that to procure but one good town to the Spaniards in Flanders, he would willingly relinquish all those possessions. As the king still insisted on the impossibility of wresting Franz Comte from Louis, the prince was obliged to acquiesce. Notwithstanding this concession to France, the projected peace was favorable to the Allies, and it was a sufficient indication of vigor in the king that he had given his assent to it. He further agreed to send over a minister instantly to Paris in order to propose these terms. This minister was to enter into no treaty. He was to allow but two days for the acceptance or refusal of the terms. Upon the expiration of these, he was presently to return, and in case of refusal, the king promised to enter immediately into the confederacy. To carry so imperious a message, and so little expected from the English court, Temple was the person pitched on, whose declared aversion to the French interest was not likely to make him fail of vigor and promptitude in the execution of his commission. But Charles next day felt a relenting in this assumed vigor. Instead of Temple, he dispatched the Earl of Feversham, a creature of the Duke's, and a Frenchman by birth. And he said that the message being harsh in itself, it was needless to aggravate it by a disagreeable messenger. The prince left London, and the king at his departure assured him that he never would abate in the least point of the scheme concerted and would enter into war with Lewis if he rejected it. Lewis received the message with seeming gentleness and complacency. He told Feversham that the King of England well knew that he might always be master of the peace. But some of the towns in Flanders it seemed very hard to demand, especially Tournay, upon whose fortifications such immense sums had been expended. He would therefore take some short time to consider of an answer. Feversham said that he was limited to two days' stay, but when that time was elapsed, he was prevailed on to remain some few days longer, and he came away at last without any positive answer. Lewis said that he hoped his brother would not break with him for one or two towns, and with regard to them too, he would send orders to his ambassador at London to treat with the king himself. Charles was softened by the softness of France, and the blow was thus artfully eluded. The French ambassador, Barillon, owned at last that he had orders to yield all except Tournay, and even to treat about some equivalent for that fortress, if the king absolutely insisted upon it. The prince was gone who had given spirit to the English court, and the negotiation began to draw out into messages and returns from Paris. By intervals, however, the king could rouse himself 
and show still some firmness and resolution. Finding that affairs were not likely to come to any conclusion with France, he summoned, notwithstanding the long adjournment, the Parliament on the 15th of January, an unusual measure, and capable of giving alarm to the French court. Temple was sent for to the council, and the king told him that he intended he should go to Holland in order to form a treaty of alliance with the states, and that the purpose of it should be, like the Triple League, to force both France and Spain to accept of the terms proposed. Temple was sorry to find this act of vigor qualified by such a regard to France, and by such an appearance of indifference and neutrality between the parties. He told the king that the resolution agreed on was to begin the war in conjunction with all the Confederates, in case of no direct and immediate answer from France that this measure would satisfy the prince, the allies, and the people of England, advantages which could not be expected from such an alliance with Holland alone, that France would be disobliged, and Spain likewise, nor would the Dutch be satisfied with such a faint imitation of the Triple League, a measure concerted when they were equally at peace with both parties. For these reasons Temple declined the employment, and Lawrence Hyde, second son of Chancellor Clarendon, was sent in his place. The Prince of Orange could not regard without contempt such symptoms of weakness and vigor conjoined in the English councils. He was resolved, however, to make the best of a measure which he did not approve. And as Spain secretly consented that her ally should form a league, which was seemingly directed against her as well as France, but which was to fall only on the latter, the states concluded the treaty in the terms proposed by the king. Meanwhile the English Parliament met, after some new adjournments, and the king was astonished that, notwithstanding the resolute measures which he thought he had taken, great distrust and jealousy and discontent were apt, at intervals, still to prevail among the members. Though in his speech he had allowed that a good peace could no longer be expected from negotiation, and assured them that he was resolved to enter into a war for that purpose, the commons did not forbear to insert in their reply several harsh and even unreasonable clauses. Upon his reproving them, they seemed penitent, and voted that they would assist his majesty in the prosecution of the war. A fleet of ninety sail, an army of thirty thousand men, and a million of money were also voted. Great difficulties were made by the commons with regard to the army, which the House, judging by past measures, believed to be intended more against the liberties of England than against the progress of the French monarch. To this perilous situation had the king reduced both himself and the nation. In all debates, severe speeches were made, and were received with seeming approbation. The Duke and the Treasurer began to be apprehensive of impeachments. Many motions against the King's ministers were lost by a small majority. The Commons appointed a day to consider the state of the kingdom with regard to popery, and they even went so far as to vote that, how urgent soever the occasion, they would lay no further charge on the people till secured against the prevalence of the Catholic party. In short, the Parliament was impatient for war whenever the king seemed averse to it, but grew suspicious of some sinister design as soon as he complied with their request, and seemed to enter into their measures. The king was enraged at this last vote. He reproached Temple with his popular notions, as he termed them, and asked him how he thought the House of Commons could be trusted for carrying on the war should it be entered on when in the very commencement they made such declarations. The uncertainties, indeed, of Charles's conduct were so multiplied, and the jealousies on both sides so incurable, that even those who approached nearest the scene of action could not determine whether the king ever seriously meant to enter into a war, or whether, if he did, the House of Commons would not have taken advantage of his necessities and made him purchase supplies by a great sacrifice of his authority. The King of France knew how to avail himself of all the advantages which these distractions afforded him. By his emissaries, 
he presented to the Dutch the imprudence of their depending on England, where an indolent king, averse to all war, especially with France, and irresolute in his measures, was actuated only by the uncertain breath of a factious parliament. To the aristocratical party he remarked the danger of the prince's alliance with the royal family of England, and revived their apprehensions, lest, in imitation of his father, who had been honored with the same alliance, he should violently attempt to enlarge his authority and enslave his native country. In order to enforce these motives with further terrors, he himself took the field very early in the spring and after threatening Luxembourg, Mons, and Namur, he suddenly sat down before Ghent and Ypres, and in a few weeks made himself master of both places. This success gave great alarm to the Hollanders, who were no wise satisfied with the conduct of England, or with the ambiguous treaty lately concluded, and it quickened all their advances towards an accommodation. Immediately after the Parliament had voted the supply, the king began to enlist forces, and such was the ardor of the English for a war with France, that an army above twenty thousand men, to the astonishment of Europe, was completed in a few weeks. Three thousand men, under the Duke of Monmouth, were sent over to secure Austin. Some regiments were recalled from the French service. A fleet was fitted out with great diligence and a quadruple alliance was projected between England, Holland, Spain, and the Emperor. End of section 19, chapter 66, part 4. Recording by Jim Dennison, J-I-M-D-E-N-I-S-O-N, voice.com.